There is no emotion. There is peace. There is no ignorance. There is knowledge. There is no passion. There is serenity. There is no chaos. There is harmony. There is no death. There is a force. Force. Up here, that's so hard. No, no. Revan's story is legend across the galaxy. His choices and actions would even influence future events thousands of years later. To begin this tale, we start in the years following 3994 BBY. This is when Revan was born. He was a human male who showed great potential in the use of the Force. As usual with Jedi recruitment, Revan was taken from a very young age to be trained as a Jedi. We don't know who Revan's parents were, and it's likely he doesn't remember them either. Revan became a prodigy within the Jedi Order. He flourished under the training of many Jedi Masters rather than just one. Seeking out new knowledge and learning the secrets of the Force was something he was naturally motivated to do. Eventually, he would catch the eye of even the Jedi Council with notoriety. Even Jedi such as Kreia were quite fond of Revan and what his future might hold. While training as a Padawan, Revan became friends with another like-minded student. His name was Malak. They quickly bonded as friends and would go on to be known as an inseparable pair. In the time Revan and Malak spend becoming Jedi Knights, a dark force was plotting something sinister. In the year of 3965 BBY, when Revan was 29 years old, the Mandalorian Wars made its way into conflict with the Republic. The war that had reached them was something the Jedi Council refused to be a part of. They were unwilling to join and defend the Republic. At the time, this caused a rift between many of the Jedi as so many wanted to join the fight, but the Council would see such an act to be the start of your path down the dark side. They foresaw many innocents would die. However, Revan had other ideas. He disagreed with the Council's decision, so he and Malak together recruited many Jedi from the Order and joined the Republic War effort. Mitra Surik, also known as the Exile later, also joined Revan's Jedi army. After Malak approached her and informed her of the rally, the Republic had welcomed the Jedi with open arms to help defend the galaxy. Revan had proved himself to the Republic military time and time again by winning battle after battle. He was quickly becoming famous as the Jedi hero Revan, who would never lose a battle the Jedi who answered the call when the Council would not. In the year of 3960, Revan and his companions built and used a superweapon named the Mass Shadow Generator. They did this to force the Mandalorians into submission and bring an end to the war. Revan split his forces with Mitra in a plan to bait them into a trap they had set on Malachor V. The Mass Shadow Generator, a super weapon with the capability of creating a massive gravity vortex at the core of the planet. Mitra led Mandalorian forces into the trap and gave the command to activate the super weapon. The chaos and destruction at the behest of the Mass Shadow Generator completely shattered the planet. It would also be the event that gave birth to Darth Nihilus. At the same time, it forced the Mandalorians into a corner, as they just lost the majority of their ships and army. While the superweapon took out the army, Revan and his half of the fleet assaulted Mandalore's personal flagship. After the devastating blow of the superweapon, Mandalore the Ultimate, the current reigning leader of the Mandalorian people, challenged Revan to one versus one combat, in an effort to win and end the war. Mandalore the Ultimate had fought valiantly, but he was no match for the Jedi hero Revan. Revan defeated Mandalore, but he didn't stop there. After defeating Mandalore the Ultimate, Revan claims his mask, so no other Mandalorian may claim the title Mandalore. 
This was a time before the Darksaber existed. Mandalore's mask was the sacred icon of the clans. Whoever wore the mask would be destined to rule over all Mandalorian clans. To stop another rising and waging war again, Revan takes the mask and later hides it. Before Mandalore dies, Revan asks him why he decided to attack the Republic. It's over, Mandalore. You lay dying. I... <coughs> I understand that now. Give me answers. Why did you attack the Republic? Thousands... Thousands of innocents are dead! <coughs> it wasn't supposed to end like this. They... promised me victory. Only now do I see how I was betrayed. What are you talking about? They tricked me. You were never meant to win this war. They used me. Used... my people... to test the Republic's strength. Who used you? The Sith. Revan had discovered from Mandalore that a red-skinned being had approached him and asked for his aid. This red-skinned being, who he would later find out to be a Sith, wanted help searching for an ancient temple that was said to hold someone of stature from the past. The person buried within was none other than the exiled son of an ancient Sith Lord, Lord Dramoth, named after his father, Lord Dramoth, the former ruler of Medrias. The Sith Emperor, Darth Vitiate, who was unknown to Revan and the greater part of the galaxy. This Emperor had been in hiding for a thousand years, ever since the Great Hyperspace War. An agent of the Emperor was sent to contact Mandalore and instigate a war with the Republic. When Mandalore helped this agent find the Temple of Lord Dramoth, they gave Mandalore information from a vision which said they would win a war against the Republic. Mandalore, Oblivious at the time, had fallen victim to the powerful force persuasion of the Emperor. Mandalore was now to be used as a furious weapon against the Republic to test the Republic's strength. The Emperor wanted to know if he could return and conquer the galaxy. This was part one of a very, very long plan. Revan and Malak were able to somehow discover Nathema and leave coordinates to its location back at the temple on Rekiad, stored within a holocron. After investigating Nathema, the homeworld of the Sith Emperor, they both eventually discover Dromund Kars and the undenying presence of the Sith. The Jedi had thought the Sith to be extinct, but that simply wasn't the case. An ancient Dark Lord by the name of Vitiate had kept the Sith in hiding for a thousand years. Revan and Malak dropped down on the planet and posed as mercenaries to the locals. They spent much time gathering information on the Sith Empire and their Emperor. Investigating Dromund Kars led Revan to some insightful information on the Emperor. He had discovered the Emperor was once known as Tenebrae and he ruled a world named Nathema. But most terrifying of all, Revan learned that Tenebrae had tricked the Legion of Sith a thousand years ago into a powerful dark side ritual that allowed Tenebrae to consume the force energy of every living thing on the planet. Tenebrae consumed a world. This was 1000 years ago, there was no telling how powerful he might be now. After seeing what the Emperor was capable of, Revan and Malak knew they had to stop him. Eventually they were both able to uncover that the Emperor was motivated to attack the Republic which was very bad news considering the state that they are in after the Mandalorian Wars. They both take action. Revan had made allies within the Sith Citadel who said they also wanted to defeat the Emperor. They were able to sneak Revan and Malak through the Royal Guard and into the Emperor's throne room. However, they had been deceived. The allies they thought they made were in fact loyal to the Emperor. The servants of the Emperor had no choice in whether or not to obey. They lacked the attribute to betray their own master. Now within the presence of the Emperor, the Jedi Revan and Malak were outmatched. You... 
You monster. You arranged chaos and war. Millions are dead. Naive Jedi. You came all all this way way. just Just to fail. fail. No. We will resist you. He is too strong. My mind. No. 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 (laughs) Revan and Malak had their minds dominated by the Emperor. They had been corrupted and pushed into the dark side. Unable to resist, the former Jedi, now Dark Lords, were sent back to the Republic as the vanguard of the Emperor's invasion. The Sith Emperor had given Revan information on old Rakatan technology, which led Revan and Malak to the Starforge, which they would use to build an army against the Republican Jedi. You may remember this from the Knights of the Old Republic games, where we see Revan and Malak searching for the star maps. This was immediately after their return from being corrupted by the Emperor. Once Revan contacted the Emperor to let him know he had immobilized the Republic's defenses, the Emperor would sweep in. However, the Emperor had completely underestimated Revan and Malak. They had adopted so much new power that they were able to twist and bend the Emperor's instructions until they thought they were acting on their own free will. Because of this action, they both had all of the memories of the Emperor and the Sith on Droman cars pushed so far down that they had forgotten all about them. Because of this, Revan never contacted the Emperor to signal his arrival. If that had been the case, the Republic would have been overwhelmed and likely defeated. With all memory of the Emperor and his plans gone away, Revan and Malak still went to war with the Republican Jedi, believing they were acting on their own accord. This time was known as the Jedi Civil War, but things were not as they seemed. The Dark Lord Revan was no fool. Despite breaking free of the mind control and losing memory of the Emperor, Revan knew that something had happened. He knew that somehow, somewhere, something was manipulating this entire show. Embracing the dark side, Revan swore to master the dark and use it against his enemies. He had always had a craving for learning more. He sacrificed his own beliefs and ideals to venture into the dark side and learn its secrets. For this was the only way to win. Darth Revan and Malak together had retaken the Sith homeworld of Korriban and re-established the Sith Academy with an influx of new students, which would often be Jedi veterans of the Mandalorian Wars. Revan had also visited the ancient world known as Lehon, or Rakata Prime. This is where he left his Sith holocron, as to pass on his newfound knowledge of the dark side. It was actually Darth Bane, who 3000 years later discovered the Sith holocron of Revan, and was inspired to create the Rule of Two. Check out our video covering that topic, The Revelation. For nearly a thousand years, the teachings of the Dark Side were thought to be gone, and now in the Jedi Civil War, its presence had returned in Legion. Revan was using his newfound strength to conquer the Republic and eventually defend the galaxy from a mysterious looming threat somewhere else. You could say his intentions were right, but the act itself was horror made manifest. We don't know exactly when Darth Malak suffered his injury to the jaw, or lack thereof, but what we do know is that Revan was the one to do it. You see, at this time in the galaxy, the rule of two is not present. However, Revan directly inspired this tradition. With his newfound teachings in the dark side of the Force, Revan began to perfect it, even correct it or improve it. Revan would contemplate that the Sith should have a single leader, a being who embodied the dark side in its entirety, and that each master should only have one student. What I assume happened with Malak's injury is that Darth Revan had established this hierarchy within his new Sith order, meaning Revan would claim himself to be the one true Dark Lord, and would designate Darth Malak, his former friend and confidant, to be the apprentice. Naturally, Malak would have refuted this because of his ego and a battle would have ensued. This is more than likely how the injury occurred, and Malak was put in his place of apprentice. There is a great visual representation you can find on YouTube. Darth Revan was simply ahead of his time. Becoming a Dark Lord made him immensely more powerful and unlocked new abilities he had never before thought possible. 
even discovering and scribing many Sith rituals, including the profoundly lethal Fortlon ritual. But alas, the Force seeks balance, and events start to change. As the Jedi Civil War continues, Revan is betrayed by Darth Malak and then captured by a Jedi strike team. We know the ins and outs of this story from the original Kurtar game, but we'll summarise here. Revan was captured by a strike team led by the Jedi Bastila Shan, who was a prodigy in battle meditation. Once he was brought before the Jedi Council on Dantooine, the Council together performed a ritual that would force Revan to once again lose more memories, except this time he was made to forget everything he knew about being a Sith, a Jedi and the rest of Revan's identity. They had reforged his mind to believe he was a Republic soldier, who had been summoned to duty. You don't understand. I did this to protect you. Don't try to justify killing innocent people. <laughs> no one is innocent, especially the Jedi. You would bring about your own destruction. Enough of this. Together now, we can overwhelm him. Do not make the mistake of assuming this will be easy. The Jedi Council had used a powerful ritual to turn Revan against the enemy. They had intended to bring Revan back to their side by somehow reintroducing him to the light side under a new identity. They lead Revan along to training once again to becoming a Jedi. Revan had no knowledge of what had happened. He was simply a new man who seemed to be gifted in the Force. Revan and Bastila went on to discover that they had formed a force bond with one another, which was intriguing to the Jedi, but at the time held no real relevance to Revan, other than leaving him asking more questions. Eventually, the pair would fall for one another and engage in a relationship. However, the truth must eventually be set free. After tasking Revan and Bastila with finding the star maps, that new Revan would have dreams about. Truth was revealed by Darth Malak in a confrontation. Malak told Revan what had really happened and who he really was. After learning who he really was, Revan would go on to redeem his past actions by finding the Starforge and confronting his old friend, Darth Malak. Malak was defeated at the hands of Revan and the galaxy would believe itself to be at peace. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. The Force shall free me. After freeing the galaxy of the new Sith Order and establishing Republic control once again, Revan and his companions were celebrated as heroes. Bastila and Revan also married. Mission Veyer and Big Z the Wookiee had a small cargo business up and running on Coruscant. Over time, Revan once again began to sense a disturbance, a danger. He would have terrible nightmares that showed him a storm-covered planet. This was the memory of Drummond Cars returning to him. Though he didn't know what it meant just yet, motivated to find out the truth of his past, to unravel the mystery of everything that had occurred over the past few years, Revan spoke to Bastila in an attempt to convince her to go with him to find this world he had been dreaming about. However, Bastila revealed she was pregnant, so they had decided it was best she stayed behind. Bastila didn't want Revan to go at first, but she knew it had to be done. Revan knew he was going to need help since now Bastila couldn't go with him. He refused to ask Mission and Big Z as they went legit with their own business. The others, such as Jolie and Juhani, had gone back to the Order to help rebuild. Revan was able to reach out to Kandorus Order, the Mandalorian who he found in a bar on Coruscant. Kandorus admitted he'd been sitting around waiting for the next big adventure, so he was on board straight away with helping. Revan had asked Kandorus if he could find him some information, if he could find out any information as to why Mandalore the Ultimate started a war. While Kandorus made progress with his contacts in the clans, Revan had decided to do some research on where his old friend Mitra was. Mitra Surik, also known as the Exile, was a Jedi who rebelled against the Council's wishes and joined Revan to fight in the Mandalorian Wars. When Revan and Malak had disappeared after the war, Mitra returned to the Council for judgement. 
She was then exiled and stripped of her lightsaber. Revan discovered all of this from within the Jedi archives. Although he was a galactic hero just a few years ago now, the Jedi still detested Revan's teachings. Revan had become attuned to the light and the dark side of the Force now. He had seen beyond the arrogant teachings of the Order alone. Revan actually attempted to offer his own wisdom to the new Jedi Council, who shunned his offer and forced him to agree not to teach anyone his methods. Because of this, Revan had to be careful who he bumped into. It could be someone unfriendly towards his past. While studying the archives, Revan bumped into the Jedi archivist, Atris, who used to be a friend of Mitra Surik, until she rebelled against the Council's wishes. Atris and Revan had an intense conversation about Mitra and the fact that she had cut herself off from the Force. Revan didn't know the aftermath of what happened with the Mass Shadow Generator, so to discover his friend had been exiled and pushed out of the Order made Revan angry. He felt responsible. All of this would mean that Mitra could not join him in his journey to find the world from his dreams. When Kandarus returned word to Revan, he told him some of the clans were headed up to a planet called Rekiad in search of Mandalore's mask. Revan was convinced he could find some answers there. After all, it was him who hid Mandalore's mask in the first place. So Revan went undercover as a companion to Kandarus as they joined his clan, Clan Ordo, on the hunt for Mandalore's mask. Revan was able to deduce that Rekiad wasn't the planet from his dreams, Rekiad was covered in mountains and snow, with heavy blizzards around the globe. Revan did, however, have a vision, or more accurately, a memory. It's got to be around here somewhere. Have you found it yet? No! But I can sense its presence. You must be close. I found it! Over here! Revan remembered he had been here before with Malak. He saw two parallel mountains standing side by side. He asked T3M4 to do a search of the planet looking specifically for a structure, as Revan described. He believed they would find Mandalore's mask in the location of Division. After some trouble on the way, they both eventually make it to the two pillar looking mountains where they discovered an ancient temple. Upon venturing into the temple, the two of them discover a sarcophagus covered with a stone slab. It was easy to tell from the surface and the scratches that this resting place had been opened multiple times already and reclosed. Revan opened the sarcophagus and found a holocron and the mask of Mandalore inside. After touching the mask, Revan immediately remembered everything about his last visit there. This, this is the temple Mandalore told me about. So Mandalore was telling the truth, the Sith still exist. Look around, Malak. Presence of the dark side here is unmistakable. But what does this mean? What should we do? Yes, this is the proof we were looking for. Sith do still exist. We have to stop them. You make it sound so simple, Revan. We must discover the truth of all this. Shouldn't we return to the temple on Coruscant? The council surely ha- No, Malak! We do this alone. I've got a bad feeling about this. The memories and the information were a lot to take in, so it took him a moment to process it. There was also additional clarifying details, such as coordinates on the holocron that had been found alongside the mask. Shortly after, Revan and Kandarus were confronted by some members of Clan Order, who turned out to know who Revan was all along after a bad nickname from Kandarus. Vila, who was also Kandarus's wife, attacked both Revan and Kandarus and attempted to take the mask from them. The attempt was futile though, as Revan and Kandarus combined were able to overwhelm the few clan members involved. Unfortunately, the Mandalorians lost their lives in the conflict, but they were laid respectfully to rest within the tomb. After the conflict, Revan explained to Kandarus everything he remembered so far, which was still just bits and pieces, but now the context is coming together. Revan now knew the location of Nathema, which was a place he and Malak discovered, so he knew this was a good lead to follow up on. Well, you're heading to Nathema. Well, I didn't have any other plans anyway. <laughs> no, Ganderus. Your people need you. I saw how your clan reacted to you being here. The new Mandalore should be you. They respect you. What a compliment for some Harchuk Jedi who killed the last one. You need me, Revan. Won't turn my back on you after the, all the Ossic we've been through together. Your people were tricked into a war they couldn't win. They need you more than I do. They need you to show them the way. Uh, I am Mandalore the Preserver, and I will bring honor and order back to our people. 
Revan and the newly risen Mandalore go their separate ways. Revan continues on to Nathama so that he can finally get some larger questions answered. He now knew that the Sith still existed somewhere, it was now more important than ever before to find out the truth of his past. When Revan arrived in the Nathama system, he learned that the planet Nathama, and even around its orbit, was completely null of the Force. With all his efforts, he couldn't find the Force in reach. Before he had enough time to figure out what any of that meant, another ship in the system had locked on with heavy weapons and fired on the Ebonhawk. The starship came crashing down on the surface of Nathama and nose planted into a small city. Amazingly, Revan was still alive and T3M4 was still functioning. However, Revan was unconscious in the pilot's seat. T3M4 had witnessed and recorded a large red-skinned male enter the Ebonhawk and carry Revan away. This was Lord Scourge, who was accompanied by Darth Nyrus. To find out Lord Scourge's side of the story, check out our explained video on him. T3M4, the incredible astromech droid, was able to repair the Ebonhawk and fly it back to Republic space. The next time we see the ship, and the droid is in the beginning of Knights of the Old Republic 2. If you're wondering why T3M4 didn't reveal any of the things he knew to Mitra, then this is simply because before T3M4 left with Revan back on Coruscant, Bastila had programmed T3M4 to return to her and inform only her about Revan if anything was to go wrong. So T3M4 was literally unable to say anything about Revan until Bastila hears it first. T3M4 also knew it was more important to help Mitra defeat Darth Traya and her would-be new Sith Order. So if anything, T3M4 is the real hero. Back to Revan. Revan was captured and imprisoned by a member of the Dark Council, Darth Nyrus. Within her stronghold, Revan was being interrogated by Lord Scourge to discover why he had returned to them. You see, Darth Nyrus knew that Revan had been here before, However, the Emperor had told the Dark Council that he killed Darth Revan. This was because the Emperor wanted to invade the Republic without the Dark Council knowing. Despite all of the Emperor's power, his people and even chosen Dark Council members all opposed a direct war with the Republic. Many of them believed it would be suicide to assault the Jedi again, considering what had happened to the ancient Sith Lords past. They also knew they had to keep their own existence a secret. Because Darth Nyrus discovered the Emperor's true plans, she and others decided to secretly oppose the Emperor, so now that Revan was back and alive, and also somehow free of the Emperor's domination, they have questions. Revan was able to maintain himself over many years being imprisoned. He actually developed a kind of mutual relationship with Lord Scourge. They would often engage in conversation about the Force. However, Revan would use these small talks to drop subtle hints of persuasion towards Lord Scourge, as to convince him to somehow team up together and take on the Emperor. Scourge was never naive and didn't fall for these tricks, but when Revan bluffed and said he'd seen a vision of his own escape, and that Scourge would help him do it, this made him think. Eventually, the exile, known as Mitra Surik, came looking for Revan. After defeating Darth Traeus and the others, she was able to make contact with Bastila. Bastila told Mitra what Revan intended to do, find the world from his dreams, but that was years ago and he hasn't returned. They had a son now, she named him Nevar, which is an anagram of Revan. When T3M4 sees Bastila, the droid tells her everything. Bastila explains in that moment why T3M4 is only just now saying something, as we explained earlier. T3M4 showed Bastila and Mitra the footage of Lord Scourge taking Revan. The droid also had the coordinates ready to go for Nathema. Bastila had to stay behind once again. Her son was still very young, so Mitra and T3 went to Nathema in search of Revan. When they arrived, Mitra was led to Drummond Cars in likely a similar fashion to Malak and Revan before. Once on Drummond Cars, Mitra quickly conducted a plan and went in search of Revan. She was able to make contact with someone who could identify Lord Scourge in a hollow vid. From there, she was able to set up a meeting between them both. All of this was a testament to the Exile's skill. She was quickly able to discover Lord Scourge and even meet with him, although of course the meeting place was ambushed by Lord Scourge's men. 
Mitra was able to resist the pathetic attempts by the soldiers. So now she was face to face with the Sith who had taken Revan. They both have a conversation around some of the things that we know with Revan and the Emperor and they end up becoming fragile allies. While Lord Scourge and the Exile are figuring out their alliance, Lord Scourge had taken drastic action by deciding to sabotage Darth Nyrus and exposing her to the Emperor himself. Mitra and Scourge would use the oncoming battles at Nyrus's stronghold as a distraction to rescue Revan. Back at his cell, when the attack on Nyrus's stronghold began, Revan was able to free himself of the drugs they used to keep him docile, and was then able to convince the nearby guards to let him out of his cell. He had promised the guards that he would get them out the building alive. By the time Revan was out of his cell, Mitra and Lord Scourge had arrived to free him. After a fast and joyful reunion, Revan finally learned Scourge's name, as he never knew this entire time. He even laughed and said no wonder he never told him, it was an awful name. Bastila had given Revan's old mask to Mitra, so that she could give it to Revan. She handed him the mask, and when he held it, all of his memories, everything he lost deep within his mind, came rushing back in. The sudden overdrive of information sent Revan's mind into shock and he passed out on the floor. At the same time, Darth Nyrus confronted them in the hallways. She was almost able to defeat and kill Lord Scourge. However, Revan had reawakened and stepped in the way. Darth Nyrus was turned to ash by Revan's deadly counterattack. All three of them, Revan, Mitra and Scourge, escape the stronghold while the Emperor's guard finishes off their assault. The next day, Scourge was able to find out that the Emperor had put the planet in lockdown and martial law was in effect. A curfew was also in place. The Emperor had used the betrayal of Nyrus and others as an excuse to finally dissolve his Dark Council. The Emperor killed each seat holder regardless of their innocence in the matter. Revan confirmed that his memories had returned, but he was still piecing them together properly. He knew about the Emperor's origins and how he consumed all life on his homeworld. He knew that he and Malak came here before and was lured into a trap set by the Emperor. They thought they had an inside contact to one of the royal guards, but they were being betrayed and manipulated. After explaining everything that had happened, they all decided that defeating the Emperor was necessary. The next morning, they head to the Sith Citadel, and with the help of Lord Scourge, they're able to make it through the guard and all the way to the Emperor's throne room doors. It was there that they were stopped by a royal guard captain, who demanded that only Lord Scourge may enter the room, and not the two others with him, being Revan and Mitra. Unfortunately, this captain was the same guard who had betrayed Revan before, so when she saw his red and grey mask, she recognised him immediately and declared that they were assassins. They had to fight their way into the throne room while Scourge and Mitra fought off the guards. Revan used the force to blast the throne room doors open and rush in after the Emperor. The other two would backpedal into the room and close the doors. Even T3M4 was helping by sealing the door with a substance they use on starship hull repairs. Revan charges the Emperor and is met with a furious dark side energy blast. He endures and continues his charge. Revan was able to knock the Emperor back more than once, but it wouldn't prove to be worth much. The Emperor was able to overwhelm Revan with force lightning and engulf him with sparks. Revan's flesh was burning and his mask was melting into his face. The droid T3M4 charged the Emperor as to save Revan by hitting him with his droid flamethrower attachment. Although it caught the Emperor off guard, it didn't really do any harm. The Emperor reacted by completely obliterating T3M4. You can actually find his remains in the Swotar game when you also confront the Emperor. While Revan laid on the throne room floor, the Emperor walked up to him and picked up his own weapon. He then activated it and went in for the final blow. However, Mitra was able to intercept the blade and send it flying out of the Emperor's hand using a saber throw. This caught the Emperor off guard as well and made him step back to reevaluate the new enemy. Revan was able to get back on his feet. Scourge and Mitra were done with the guards and joined Revan against the Emperor. This time, I won't let you win. I'm, I'm surprised, surprised to see you alive. alive. It won't be the last surprise for you today, beautiful Jedi. Jedi. You, you cannot, cannot stand, stand against, against me. <clears throat> Together, we can end you. Remains, remains to be seen. seen. 
Before they could attack together, Lord Scourge had experienced a powerful vision that showed him a true hero that would defeat the Emperor. For good, Scourge knew he had to betray Revan, so that he could actually see the Emperor is defeated. A Jedi would defeat the Emperor, but that Jedi wasn't Revan. Scourge betrayed them and stabbed Mitra in the back. She fell to the floor and died before she hit the ground. Revan turned in shock of course, but the Emperor once again engulfed him with Force Lightning. Scourge spent some time convincing the Emperor he did this to protect him and that Revan was forcing him into this. The Emperor told Scourge to execute Revan as to prove his claims. Scourge knew he must comply, so he knelt down and ripped off Revan's mask to see the scarred and deformed tissue underneath. He then swung his blade, but the Emperor stopped him from following through. The Emperor says he has other plans for Revan. Revan was then imprisoned in a high security facility known as the Maelstrom Prison. The Emperor spent the next 300 years draining Revan of his power and knowledge. Mitra Surik became a force ghost that would watch over Revan from afar. She was never able to commune with him, as the dark side powers around his prison prevented her from getting inside. So she spent 300 years sending her own life force and energy so that he may find the will to live on, and the strength to fight. The two of them were truly the best of friends, but it was more than that. It went beyond simple relationships between friends. They had fought together, defended the galaxy together, and she loved him. This would not be the end to Revan's story. After being imprisoned for over 300 years, Revan is finally freed by a Republic strike team and the hero of Typhon. Once freed, Revan was finally able to commune with Mitra. He went on to reactivate the Starforge and intended to use it to amass a new army that could oppose the Emperor. After all, he was still the greatest threat in the galaxy. Despite that, in this point of time, the Emperor was being silenced. Revan also found and repaired HK-47, who was appointed a role within the Starforge, also known as the Foundry. However, an Imperial strike team was sent to intercept Revan on the Starforge and bring an end to his plans. The strike team is successful in defeating Revan, but something unusual happens as Revan is defeated. His dark side refuses to die and is able to somehow survive. Revan would secretly be under the care of the Revanites who were a secret cult of followers dedicated to Revan. After spending some time recuperating, Revan Reborn shows himself to the galaxy. This dark sided version of Revan is a shadow of the Revan that existed many years ago. This Revan knows that the Emperor is the true enemy and is willing to do horrible things to achieve his ultimate goal. This Revan Reborn became such a threat with his newfound arsenal that the Republic and Empire forged a temporary alliance to defeat the Revanites together. At this point in time, the Emperor was rumoured to be dead at the hands of the Hero of Typhon. However, Revan knows this isn't totally true. Revan refuses to die until the Emperor is also dead, so he fueled the current Revanite war in hopes of summoning the Emperor to fight. Revan is defeated by the mightiest in the galaxy, even his light-sided force ghost worked against him. His light-sided ghost aided the Empire and Republic to defeat him. After all the death and destruction, the Emperor announced himself but did not appear to fight anyone. He took his essence to Zyost, where he later once again consumed or corrupted all life on the planet, and in the end, they combined back to become whole. However, Revan was meant to be dead, so only his Force Ghost form remained, and not his physical form. Over the next many years, Revan's Ghost was in contact with Lord Scourge, and secretly helping from behind the scenes to defeat the Emperor, once and for all. Eventually, Lord Scourge brings the hero of Typhon up to date with Tenebrae's last gruesome weapon. In the past few years, many things had happened. The former Sith Emperor had revealed himself as Valkorion, the immortal ruler of Zakul. He had been raising an entirely different civilization and culture in wild space. However, Valkorion was defeated by the hero of Typhon, and his essence was forced into the void. The last gruesome weapon of Tenebrae the Sith Emperor was his original body and the ritual scribed into his flesh. Revan was able to locate his original body and lead Lord Scourge to it. Lord Scourge then destroyed the body, however in doing so, the ritual was activated. The powers that came seeping out would attempt to mind dominate anyone around. However, Scourge was able to resist the Emperor's control and so was his companion. However, Satil Shan and some of her students showed up and they fell victim to the ritual. 
We would later find out that Satil Shan intended to do this so that the strongest could gather and defeat the Emperor once and for all. So Lord Scourge gets to play a character in Star Wars The Old Republic and brings them to where this happened, one final confrontation. Revan's Force Ghost reveals himself to the player and asks that we finish this once and for all. Scourge's companion, Kira Carson, guides the group into a trance. Because the Emperor is attempting to take over the bodies of Satil and her students, so they use the Force to enter their minds and fight the Emperor. Finally, in his most vulnerable state, Revan and many other heroes from many points in time across the galaxy are able to overpower the Emperor. With his original body and essence destroyed, Revan would finally know peace and at last become one with the Force. Darth Malgus is a human male born with the name Veridin. His biological parents are unknown, however we do know that Veridin was adopted by a man who worked for Imperial Science. Veridin's attunement to the Force showed early in life as he lashed out in anger against one of his father's Twi'lek servants. Instead of being angry with Veridin for killing one of his servants, his father was ecstatic that his boy had a future with the Sith, so he sent Veridin to Korriban to be trained in the ways of the Dark Side. At some point during Veridin's training, he was sent to Geonosis to perform some task presumably set by an Academy Overseer. While on the planet, Veridin met a Twi'lek servant who was beaten in the slave pens. Veridin decided to free her and take her as his own personal servant. The girl's name was Alina. Daru. The relationship between them was more than just servitude. Alina saw Veridin as her saviour and they both fell in love. While in public, Veridin would be careful not to show Alina any affection, as to not show any weakness to the Sith around him. It also didn't help that the Sith Empire was not inclusive for the Twi'lek species, or almost any alien for that matter. After years of training and gaining recognition at the Academy, eventually Veridin was granted the title of Darth and bestowed with the name Malgus. Darth Malgus also became apprentice to Darth Vindican, a powerful Sith master and pure-blooded species. Despite what Darth Malgus had been taught over the years, he still personally believed there was an advantage to being more inclusive for the Sith, to allow more alliances with aliens and extend their reach across the galaxy. However, he was just one Sith Lord among many. What would his opinion matter? he would bide his time for now. After earning his place within the Empire and Sith, Darth Malgus and his master were appointed to the front lines of retaking Korriban from the Jedi and Republic. They were successful. During the surprise attack, Malgus had battled with Satil Shan and her master, Kao Chen Darak. The Jedi Master was able to defeat Vindican, but Malgus defeated the Jedi Master in one versus one combat. Malgus would later take part in the battle for Alderaan, where he meets Satil Shan again. As we know from the trailer, Malgus was severely wounded from a thermal detonator and also a barrage of force attacks from Satil Shan, a battle that left him needing a mask for most of the time. Darth Malgus was later appointed to lead the sacking of Coruscant. Underneath Darth Angrel still, however, who was a higher ranking Sith Lord. Malgus entered the Jedi Temple with his lover and servant Alina and laid waste to everything. During the battle, Malgus personally defeated the Jedi Master, Ven Zala. This Jedi in particular had a Padawan named Aaron Lanier. Be on the lookout for her explained video as she's also a part of the story. During the battle, this Jedi Master redirected blaster shots at Alina Daru, causing her serious injury. This fueled Malgus's rage. Before he managed a killing blow, the Jedi Master Venzala actually managed to dislodge one of Malgus's teeth. After he killed the Jedi Master, Malgus rushed over to Alina's side and comforted her. 
as if around him were murmuring. Alina looked up at Malgus and called him by his birth name, Theridon. In private, she was the only person allowed to call him this. After all, it's how she first met him, not as Darth Malgus, but as Veridin. Malgus was furious that she had called him by his birth name in public. However, he still helped her up and sought out medical aid for her. He told the doctors that Alina was to be taken care of, as though she was a Sith Lord herself. The doctors argued that the resources were not prioritised for aliens. However, Malgus insisted, and the doctors had no choice but to obey. After seizing Coruscant from the Jedi's grasp, Darth Malgus receives orders to return to Darth Angrel, but he chooses to delay them. Darth Malgus wanted to soak in his visual surroundings. The fall of Coruscant looked glorious in his view. Malgus ordered another Sith, who was also part of the initial attack, Lord Adras, to set charges in the temple to lay even more waste. Firstly, the Sith tried to delegate the order to some troopers, but Malgus insisted that a Sith should be the one to destroy the temple. Eventually, Malgus made his way to Darth Angrel, who was at the time housed in the Republic Chancellor's office. Before arriving, Malgus learned that everything was on hold while a peace treaty was being negotiated on Alderaan. The word peace struck a nerve with Malgus. Peace is a lie. Malgus arrived to Darth Angrel and expressed his concerns. Darth Angrel reminded Malgus of his place in the Empire and that these were the wishes of the Emperor. Unable to oppose the Emperor, Malgus had no option but to play along with the Empire's new and blind plan of peace. While at the meeting, Malgus was confronted about his servant Alina. Lord Adras, a rival Sith of Malgus, was also present in the room. Adras witnessed Malgus content for the Twi'lek after the attack and had reported it to Darth Angrel. Malgus had to insist to his superior that she was just a servant, to be used as a tool when the need arises. Malgus was able to convince his superior somewhat of this. However, he learned in the process that she had been denied the medical care he had demanded for her earlier. Lord Adras himself made the decision. He now openly mocked Malgus. Darth Malgus sprang out of his chair in the meeting room and lunged for Adras. Darth Angrel watched for a moment, but then ordered the two to stop. While Angrel didn't condone the violence in his presence, he implied with his words that they should fight elsewhere. Malgus was then dismissed. The furious Sith Juggernaut made his way to Alina, searching for her in the lost crowds of injured civilians and refugees from the attack. Malgus located a nearby hospital and laid waste to those who opposed his presence. A Sith walking among the refugees they just attacked wasn't a great decision, but Malgus was in no mood for games. He killed many that tried to stop him, many that wanted revenge, and failed because they were weak. Eventually, a nurse was able to direct Malgus to Alina. Malgus embraced her and was happy to know she was alive and safe. However, he quickly told her he would kill her if she ever named him in public again. The relationship between them was complicated. She loved him, he loved her, but he never said the words. He couldn't. To admit he was in love was to wrap a giant chain of weakness around him, a vulnerability. He wanted to love her, but despised what it cost. He made sure she was taken to his own personal medical team, where she would be restored to full health. Soon after, Darth Malgus was appointed to the Imperial blockade above Coruscant by Darth Angrel to oversee the operation. Malgus refuted and suggested that any officer would suffice for the task. However, Darth Angrel had recently seen weakness in Malgus. He had no reason to grant Malgus any special favours. Sending him to the blockade was a message, one that Malgus picked up loud and clear. Malgus was being looked down on. Lord Adras had undermined his reputation, and now the effects were taking place. Unable to resist the order, Darth Malgus accepted the command and took to the freighters in orbit. While aboard the freighter, Malgus came across a man named Raph Sizor, who wanted to tip the Empire off about another spice runner, and the Jedi coming to Coruscant. Malgus found the scenario unlikely, and told the informant they would stay aboard until the spice runner and Jedi arrive to see if he's telling the truth. Eventually, a suspicious shuttle was spotted underneath another cruiser. Darth Malgus could sense the light side presence. Like a needle in his side, Malgus ordered his crew to hail the shuttle via hollow. The shuttle answered the call and Malgus ordered them to shut down within five seconds. A man and a woman were visible on the hollow to Malgus, and he to them. Suddenly, the man in the shuttle said, To hell with you, Sith. 
and the hull are cut off. The shuttle then tried to get away using other large ships to prevent line of sight. While this was happening, Darth Angrel contacted Malgus's bridge to make him aware that an AWOL Jedi diplomat from Alderaan was possibly heading for Coruscant. Angrel instructed Malgus to treat this rogue Jedi like any spice runner he might meet. Angrel told him the Jedi was a woman named Aaron Lanier. Malgus wasn't taking any chances letting this shuttle get away. Malgus didn't tell Angrel about the current situation, instead he told Angrel he's dealing with a spice runner right now. He then cut off the hollow. Malgus's cruiser was able to grab the shuttle and its tractor beam, but it somehow escaped the hold and thrusted away from them. Malgus's cruiser was able to shoot down the shuttle before it landed. They saw the shuttle land in a fiery explosion after it twirled down in a plume of smoke. Despite the ongoing treaty for peace, Malgus decided to personally investigate this Jedi, as he knew she wasn't dead. He had felt her presence still. It was similar to a feeling he had when fighting the Jedi Master in the temple on Coruscant. Now that he had learned the Jedi's name, Malgus decided to go to his personal quarters, where Alina Daru was currently resting. There he used his personal equipment to research the Jedi Aaron Lanier. Malgus wanted to know why she went AWOL. After some digging, Malgus discovered that Aaron Lanier was the Padawan of a Jedi Master Ven Zalo, a Jedi he killed barely a day ago. He also discovered that Aaron Lanier was a Force Empath, meaning she could feel what others were also feeling. Malgus connected the dots. This Jedi, Aaron Lanier, had felt her master's death, and now she was here for revenge. Malgus thought to himself, she is looking for me. She definitely came here looking to find out who killed her master. So Malgus thought about where she would go first, the Jedi Temple. It was an obvious answer for him. The Jedi was essentially hunting Malgus, and he would not sit idly by and let it happen. No, he would also hunt her. Before Malgus embarks on his hunt, he instructs his lover and servant, Alina Daru, to retrieve prisoners and spoils of war. Confused as to why Malgus chose her for this task, he had to explain that he did not currently know who he could trust. He wanted things to progress further, before... before something. Darth Malgus took a shuttle back to the surface of Coruscant. He directed the pilot towards the Jedi Temple and told him to stay within 300 meters. They had the exterior and interior lights turned off. Malgus knew all he had to do was wait. Aaron Lanier would show eventually at the temple, seeking answers about her master's death, and Malgus was right. Hours later, when the darkness conquered the skies, Malgus sensed the Jedi's presence immediately below in the temple. She had also sensed him, but he was more than ready to fight. He told the shuttle pilot he could depart when he left. The pilot turned in confusion and saw Malgus jump out the shuttle that was high in the air. Malgus came crashing down in the temple with his lightsaber already activated, landing with a mighty boom on cold, deformed Permacrete in the temple. Barely the Jedi could defend herself. Malgus did not relent. He pushed forward immediately and lunged after the Jedi with an aggression she'd never seen before. He told the Jedi he knew why she had come. She responded with telling him she knows it was him that killed her master. Malgus stated, and now I will kill you, in the same place I killed him. Their battle continued. Malgus could sense that this Jedi was different from the others. She responded to her emotions and used them in the battle. The Jedi was able to outmaneuver many of Malgus's attacks, including ones of the Force. Eventually, the Jedi landed a harsh blow and knocked Malgus 20 meters away. The Jedi then summoned a second saber to her offhand and charged at Malgus. His response was to delve into his hatred and fury and unleash it with a storm of force lightning. As she came leaping, she parried the attack using her lightsabers in a cross guard stance. The exchange came to a standstill and both engaged again in lightsaber combat. After more taunts from each other and exchanging harsher blows, the Jedi decides to throw her master's green lightsaber at Malgus, guiding it with the force. Malgus was not oblivious to such techniques. He easily intercepted the blade in his own grasp and deactivated it. He then held it out in front of himself as a taunt to the Jedi. Malgus said, this weapon did not avail your master and it will not avail you. After speaking those words, a speeder piloted by the same man seen with the Jedi on the hollow earlier flew down into the scene. The Jedi escaped in the speeder, despite watching Malgus brandish the lightsaber in his hand. Before escaping, 
The Jedi had told Malgus she would make him hurt, a personal threat. The speeder flies off, but Malgus throws the saber back at the Jedi as she's escaping. However, the Jedi managed to take control back and retrieved the lightsaber for herself as she left. Malgus watched the speeder as it faded in the distance. Shortly after, Malgus was still within the ruins of the temple. He was attempting to piece together how exactly the Jedi figured out it was Malgus that personally killed her master. Malgus concluded that she must have seen some kind of security holler from the attack. The thought pleased him greatly, knowing that a Jedi had witnessed his greatest accomplishment, the sacking of Coruscant and the Jedi Temple. But then Malgus remembered the Jedi had threatened him before she left. She said she was going to hurt Malgus. But how? The realisation struck Malgus like emotional lightning. If the Jedi saw a security holler, that means she also saw Alina and how Malgus acted around her when she was wounded. This is how she could hurt him. This feeling Malgus experienced, it was fear. Fear for his lover. He quickly contacted his personal freighter to ask for a status report on Alina Daru. When Malgus learned she hadn't checked in even one time, he feared the worst. Immediately, he went looking for her. Malgus knew exactly which spaceport Alina was going to at the request of retrieving a list of things for Malgus. His personal shuttle pilot picked him up from the temple. While en route to the spaceport, Malgus's Imperial pilot informed him that an accord had possibly been reached with the Republic. A peace treaty could be signed today, so long as the Republic trades a few Outer Rim worlds in exchange for Coruscant back. Malgus was disgusted that the Empire had accepted backwater lands rather than the crown jewel of the Republic. Realistically, Holding the planet Coruscant was a great cost to the Empire. Defending it and funding it was a task they had never done before. Right now, the Empire was satisfied with what it had already done. Malgus did not approve, nonetheless. To accept a peace treaty is to deny the Sith Code. It was as though he was a monster, trapped in a poisoned cage of peace. He smashed his fist into the wall of the shuttle and served carnage to the rest of the area. He felt as though he was being domesticated, held back and told not to be Sith. The Empire would not turn Malgus. He did not have time right now to contemplate the machinations of war. He had recognised the fear he felt for Alina's possible danger. He knew it was a weakness, but he would not let her be harmed, especially by a Jedi. He would save her. Malgus arrived at the spaceport and was informed by the troops he assigned to Alina's squad that she had not been seen recently. The spaceport was currently being evacuated because of an alleged chemical spill. Malgus quickly figures out this was a ruse to get to Alina. Ignoring the sirens and evacuating workers, Malgus stormed towards Alina's last known location nearby. It didn't take long to get there. Malgus sees a ship leaving the spaceport in the hangar that Alina was meant to be last seen. Reaching out with the Force, Malgus latches onto the ship to not let it escape. The ship was able to break free, however, and thrust towards orbit. Infuriated that Alina was potentially kidnapped, he contacts the blockade to seize the escaping ship within the tractor beam. Little did Malgus realise that way across the landing pad, the Jedi Aaron Lanier was waiting, along with the unconscious body of Alina Daru. Malgus's attention was drawn to them immediately after his last order. The Jedi wanted to negotiate safe passage of the ship that left, or she would harm Alina, forced to comply. However much Malgus wanted to resist, he relayed to the blockade to ignore his last order. The Jedi told Malgus that she would now not harm Alina, that she knew Alina was already suffering under Malgus. His rage was fueled by the Jedi's attempt to read him. She knew nothing about him, but he did know that she wanted revenge. Malgus told the Jedi to make her attempt. He was ready to fight. While they both engaged, Malgus drew his eyes towards Alina's body more than once. Throughout, both were able to land significant blows to the other. Eventually, Malgus explained to the Jedi that she could not beat him using anger, that she was a child to anger. He would show her the true nature of the dark side. The Jedi attempts to make a leap towards Malgus, but he intercepts it once again using Force Lightning. But this time, it was Malgus's full power. The emotions that blazed around his turmoiled mind unleashed a devastating arc of Force Lightning. 
penetrating through the Jedi's defenses and holding her in mid-air while she was engulfed in sparks. The Jedi's flesh began to burn and her screams wailed across the landing pad until eventually Malgus let go and her limp body dropped to the floor. Shortly after, the Jedi awoke as Malgus stood over her. He did not kill her. Malgus told the Jedi that she should leave, take a shuttle nearby and she will be granted safe passage. Clearly the Jedi was confused about this. Malgus explained that her presence had shown him something he should have accepted a long time ago. She also did not kill Alina. Malgus said he owes a debt to the Jedi for this and once she leaves the planet, the debt is paid. Malgus was clear that this was not mercy, and had their positions been reversed, he would not have hesitated to kill someone she loved. Malgus gave the Jedi her lightsabers and assured her that if they met again, that he would kill her, just like he killed her master. Darth Malgus kept his word and allowed the Jedi's shuttle to leave Coruscant. Where she went, he does not know. Malgus brings his attention to Alina. He began to reflect on their history together, when Alina awoke in his arms, he told her she was safe. Alina responded with telling him she loved him. Malgus shedded a tear, the emotions within becoming manifest. The tear represented a chain. Alina asks Malgus what's wrong. He replies with, I love you. That is what is wrong. Darth Malgus ignites his lightsaber, lunges it into her chest and ran it through. Alina's face became a figure of shock unable to speak any words. Then, she was gone. Malgus had freed himself, broken his chains that bound him to love, to a conscience. He had to destroy that which he loved, so he could ultimately achieve what must be done. Not too long after Darth Malgus killed Alina Daru, he went to pay a visit to his rival, Lord Adras. With so much anger and fury to unleash, Malgus kills his rival while delivering a speech about how he has poisoned the Empire and how he was nothing but a mongrel to Darth Angrel. Over the next several years, Darth Malgus becomes a famous yet controversial Sith Lord. Malgus was an excellent strategist and even overseered missions served out to the player character in the Old Republic online game. But it wasn't until after the rumoured death of the Emperor at the hands of the Jedi Knight on Dromund Cars that Malgus decided to make his move in recreating the Empire. Over the years, he had bided his time until the moment was right, building up his own power base and allies with even the likes of aliens such as Trandersians. Malgus made many new and strong alliances. Around the time the rumours were spreading about the Emperor's death, the Dark Council sent Darth Malgus to Ilum to aid in the security of a Deegan Crystals. Whether Malgus set this up, or the Dark Council actually sent him, is unclear. Not too long after securing the planet Ilum and the Crystals, Malgus betrayed the Empire to take these assets for himself. This was part of his plan for a long time. Darth Malgus had already managed to seize the Starforge and make it operational. He even found HK-47 inside and had his ally Arcus Word repair him. Now Malgus had the Adegan Crystals, which he would use to build his Stealth Armada. On top of all this, after Malgus heard the rumour of the Emperor's death, he decided to steal the Emperor's personal Star Fortress and use it as his own. He even equips it with his new stealth technology. Despite the fact we don't hear of Malgus's adopted father again, it's likely that he used connections through him and the Empire to recruit the scientist Arcus Word to his side. With his help, the foundry became operational, along with an army of ships and droids, all with enhanced tech. He was even close to bringing the Voss to his side. Mandalorians even joined his cause. Darth Malgus's vision was to recreate the Empire in his own eyes. However, the player character of the online game is sent to stop Darth Malgus before he can begin. Darth Malgus was eventually defeated in the throne room of the stolen Emperor's Fortress. His body was thrown down into the depths of the ship. This would not be the end of Darth Malgus. Exactly how he survived his fall or who specifically recovered him is a little hazy. There was some leaked footage that showed Malgus to be frozen in carbonite and brought to Emperor Valkorion. However, the story director for the game has insisted this isn't canon. The footage was never released officially. Darth Malgus later returns to the story to aid the Empire in defeating the Republic on Ursus. The current Emperor of the Sith 
whether it's Valorant or Asuna, are the ones that kept Malgus alive and have somehow managed to brainwash him into being compliant with the Empire. They had tamed him and now wanted to use him as a weapon against the Jedi. Malgus had resisted joining the Empire again and had to be implanted with loyalty assurance modules. They had even used the Force to manipulate his mind. Under the manipulation of the Empire, Malgus helped defeat Jedi Master Nos Dural, among succeeding with plans on Osus and seeding fear in the Republic's heart with his return from the grave. When it was time for Malgus' next mission, he was summoned to be prepared, or more accurately, maintained. Malgus was able to damage one of his own internal modules the Empire had planted inside him, and the droid assigned to work on him mistakenly removed the module without realising the tampering. Before anyone could react, Malgus broke free and stole the droid along with a ship. While escaping, Malgus had the droid remove everything the Empire had implanted inside him. However, Malgus would later that night still be plagued with dreams of indoctrination. His mind was still conditioned to the Empire. He needed to repair his mind, and thinking back upon all the knowledge he's collected, he decides to head to Dantooine, search of a Jedi relic or some other mysterious item connected to the Force, which would help repair his damaged mind. He knew Jedi of the past there practiced such things. Malgus was able to successfully find what he was looking for on Dantooine. He was able to completely break his chains to the Empire. He left an imprint of himself behind which two people picked up on in the future. One was Darth Krovos, a potential ally for Malgus in the future. The other that saw the imprints was the Jedi Aaron Lanier. How and why she was there, Malgus did not know, but he did regret not being there in the flesh, so he could keep his word about killing her the next time they meet. Malgus implies he has big plans for the future of the galaxy, but what they are, we have yet to find out. Make sure you subscribe so you can come back and see how the story ends when it happens. Don't forget to be on the lookout for my Aaron Lanier Explained video. Our playlist of explained videos is growing, so don't miss out and subscribe now. Thank you very much for watching this video, and I'll catch you folks in the next one. He isn't my son. Who is his real father? Our king, Lord Dramoth. You bedded the king and bared his spawn? Please, he made me- You stupid, naive! Tenebra, you saved me? No, your torment has just begun. The long and epic tale of Tenebrae, the Sith who ruled for over a thousand years, has finally arrived. Tenebrae was born on an outer rim world named Medrias. This was in the year of 5113 BBY. The current reigning Dark Lord of the Sith was Mark Aragnus, who resided on Corriban. The world Tenebrae called home, Medrias, had its own king and ruler. This was Lord Dramoth. Dramoth was the biological father of Tenebrae, and when he was no older than ten, he had learned of his true father after hearing his parents argue over the deceit. Tenebrae's stepfather, who was married to his mother, learned the truth and this caused him to lash out violently towards her. Before he could do any serious damage, Tenebrae intervened and broke his father's neck using the Force. The reason they had started arguing was because the stepfather witnessed the boy with Force potential, so this raised suspicion as to who he really was. It seemed as though the boy had saved his mother's life, yet this was not the case. The child Tenebrae was disgusted at his mother's betrayal. He had been lied to all this time. The kid snapped. He realised he had power boiling inside of him. Feeling invincible, with his newfound power, Tenebrae began a rampage of takeovers across a large region of his planet. Eventually, a rumour had spread to the king, Lord Dramoth, who was made aware of the boy and what he had accomplished in such a short time. No more than three years passed since the child murdered his parents, and yet he had already claimed so much. Several major towns and trade routes were under his control. The king, Lord Dramoth, 
had no choice but to meet with the child. Huh. I'm impressed. What you have achieved here is quite extraordinary. Yet, I can't help but notice. The lands you conquered actually belong to me. And why is it that you came to me? To see if the rumors were true. They say you are my son, and all I see before me is a sniveling child. Kneel before your king. What was that? How dare you? Kneel. <laughs> Any fool who stands in my way will be crushed. As just a young teenager, Tenebrae forced his real father into submission and took control over the entire planet Medrias. The feats and achievements of this young Sith caught the attention of the current reigning Dark Lord, Mark Ragnus. Ragnus was able to see the potential within Tenebrae and invited him to Korriban, where he would be recognised for his power and be knighted a Darth of the Sith. The Darth title is only given to those who are powerful enough to defend it. The title itself was a statement of authority and ranked Tenebrae above many other Sith from the time. Along with his title, and as tradition to the Sith, Tenebrae was reborn with a new name, Darth Vitiate. Now that he had been recognised, Tenebrae decided to return to Medrias and with his newfound power in Sith politics, he renamed the planet to Nathema. Darth Vitiate was a Sith pureblood, this meant that he was naturally attuned to the Force biologically, specifically with the dark side, not that this would explain his incredible power level, it was simply a prodigy of his craft. After he returned to his homeworld, he spent his time outside the existence of the other Sith Lords in the galaxy. You could say he valued his privacy, and there was a reason for that. Darth Vitiate was studying and possibly even creating powerful dark side rituals and spells. He would also invest a lot of funds and time into force imbued technology that could enhance or even extend the life of someone. Such inventions would take him time to complete. Time. That's what Vitiate needed. For all his power and rank, none of it would matter if time could take it away from him. This developed a complex within the young Sith Lord, a complex that would haunt him for many years. Nearly 100 years later, the death of Mark Ragnus is made known, meaning that the Dark Lord's throne currently lays empty, yet Darth Vitiate had no intentions of heading to Korriban to take it for himself. No, instead, Darth Vitiate, now much older, decided that he will let the current Sith Dark Council, including the likes of Naga Sadao and Luda Kresh, fight between themselves for the throne. Vitiate stayed out of the affair altogether. Then, in the year 5000 BBY, the Great Hyperspace War began, but yet again, Vitiate stayed out of it. The Sith who did join were defeated and forced to retreat to Korriban, but the Republican Jedi even chased them there. This left the remaining Sith forces completely defeated and now scattered across the galaxy. Now, Darth Vitiate would act. Now, he was ready. Vitiate sent word to the remaining Sith in the galaxy that they may find refuge on Nathima and that Darth Vitiate will bring them their vengeance. Some Sith refused the call, they fled and found a new life, but the majority answered the call and they accepted the invitation. When all the Sith had arrived on Nathima, Darth Vitiate gave a glorious speech of how he had found a way to make them all stronger, so they could retaliate against the Jedi and Republic. All they would need to do is take part in a powerful ritual that Vitiate had prepared. It took many weeks of lessons and final preparation until they began. Oblivious to the real truth, the Legion of Sith had fallen into Darth Vitiate's trap. He cared not for the survival of the Sith, but only the survival of himself. The powerful dark side ritual began and the many who had helped chant the words were consumed and devoured. It didn't stop there, luscious fields of green were turned to desolate and repugnant plains. The normal people going about their lives had their force energy suddenly swallowed, leaving empty clothes and piles of ash scattered around the now completely soulless cities. 
Der Fischiot had succeeded in feasting on the force energy of everything on the planets. Everything. And now, only he remained. Vitiate was restored to his youthful appearance, his power had increased one thousand fold and he now believed himself to be immortal. After all, he could now restore himself through the same ritual at any time. He was even so powerful now that he wouldn't need the help of anybody else to make it happen. But the price of immortality was a heavy toll. Vitiate very likely suffered immense amounts of pain during his transition into the power from the ritual. His insides would have felt like boiling lava, the pain would never stop. He would simply grow numb instead, removing all sense of pain completely. His voice was also changed into that of merged voices, as if he were using the mouths of those he had consumed. Once he had gathered himself, Vitiate headed for Ziost and Dromond Cars, where he assumed leadership and the mantle of Emperor of the Sith. The actions on Nafima were known only to Vitiate, leaving the remaining Empire to speculate with wild rumours throughout the next thousand years. Darth Vitiate rebuilt the Sith Empire in darkness, claiming worlds such as Ziost and Dromon Cars for capital cities. The Emperor chose to reside in his dark throne room at the Citadel on Dromond Cars. He spends the next 1000 years building his power base, preparing to take on the Jedi and Republic once again. Yet his plans were more ambitious than this. Darth Vitiate knew that only his reign and rule mattered. He was all powerful and still afraid of time. Although now he was essentially immortal, that didn't make him invulnerable. He knew that the Force could offer a way to defeat him and this only made his paranoia worse. He concluded that his only option would be to consume every living thing in the galaxy and to do so, he would need even more power. He wouldn't be able to just go around consuming more planets. That would scare his allies away and likely also alert the larger galaxy to his presence. He planned carefully for the millennia, thought of every path and made a backup plan. He had also recently learned he could transition his own essence between different bodies. This gave him a unique idea, a failsafe for if anything goes wrong in the long term. Vitiate separated the majority of his essence from his original body. He then carved a ritual into the flesh of his original body that would activate as a failsafe if someone were to ever defeat him. Now that he was separated, he moved his original body to a secret location nobody except his chosen knew of. With his backup in place, he was ready to begin his plans. Vitiate was actually in search of his exiled half-brother. You see, his father Lord Dramoth already had a son of his own, who he also named Dramoth. However, this half-brother was disgraced and exiled after Tenebrae took control, and now the Emperor had a lead on where the remains and temple of his half-brother were. The Emperor had sent an emissary to Mandalore the Ultimate in roughly the year of 3976 BBY. This emissary was a Sith pureblood who told Mandalore of a vision that his master had had that he would win a war against the Republic. However, from far across the galaxy, the Emperor used his powers of Force Persuasion to convince Mandalore into going to war, believing he would win like it was his own idea. Mandalore had the remaining information that the Emperor needed on Dramoth's remains, which were located in a tomb on Rekiad. It's unclear what exactly the Emperor planned to do with these remains, however I think it's very plausible that he wanted to remove any evidence of Nefima's former state, including one of its former residents, Dramoth. It's possible he just disposed of the remains, or somehow integrated them into Sith alchemy. In the year of 3960 BBY, some 16 years later, the Jedi hero Revan and his allies, Alec, Mitra Surik and others, defeated the Mandalorians and saved the galaxy. But the heroes Revan and Alec found clues of the Sith's existence and came looking. Eventually, the Emperor had taken notice that someone was tracking him. Whether Revan found the Emperor or the Emperor simply guided him is hard to say. It's possible both, either way, their paths were fated to meet. After some time, 
the Jedi heroes were able to gain an inside ally that would help them make an attack on the Emperor. They had discovered that he was residing on Dromund Kars and they believed that they could stop him. Revan and Alec had successfully infiltrated the Emperor's throne room on Dromund Kars. They were snuck in past the guards by someone they believed who was helping them. However, it turned out that this ally was simply baiting Revan and Alec into a trap at the throne room. Now, Darth Revan and Darth Malak, I task you to use the Force to find the ancient Regarden Starforge and use it against the Republic to cripple them. Once you have done this, you will return to me, and only me." The Emperor was able to overpower Revan and Alec with great ease. He twisted and warped their minds into serving him and corrupting them to the dark side. However, after he deployed his new secret Sith, he lost all contact with them and was left to assume that they had been killed. The Emperor had intended to use Darth Revan and Darth Malak as the vanguard of his invasion. He would be able to use Revan and Malak without anybody knowing of his own existence, and the Emperor liked how convenient this was to him. If Revan and Malak were to fail, it would be no skin off his nose. But alas, Revan and Malak never returned. The Emperor wasn't able to tell anyone else about his plans to invade the Republic eventually. The notion of war for most Sith meant certain doom. The vast majority believed that going to war with the Jedi again would result in their final and true extinction, utter suicide. Even the current Dark Council was against such a thing. The Emperor had to be careful how he played his politics. If he was to go to war or even kill members of his own council for disagreeing, he'd need a good reason to tell the public. Keeping the public trust was important to maintaining his position as Emperor of the Sith. No one could learn his true, horrific intentions. A few years later, the Emperor would be informed by a low-ranking Sith named Lord Scourge that members of his own Dark Council were planning to betray him. In truth, there was in fact a secret cult of Sith within the Empire, including Dark Council members, that secretly opposed the Emperor. Some of them had learned the truth behind Nathima and the events that transpired 1000 years ago. However, the Emperor did not know they knew this. The Emperor had been looking for a reason to purge his Dark Council, and now he had one. He would continue by dissolving his council and killing each member. Nine of them were summoned to the throne room and they never left alive. The remaining members were attacked and killed within their strongholds. Using the situation as an opportunity, the Emperor considered proclaiming that the Republic had spies on the Dark Council, and he killed them for that reason. This would be enough to entice his people to want to wage war. However, before the Emperor was able to make any immediate plans, his throne room was entered by none other than Revan, Lord Scourge, and Mitra Surik, who had allied together to confront the Emperor. The Emperor was surprised to see Revan alive, and without too much hesitation, Revan charged the Emperor. He was able to defend himself by striking Revan with a blast of force energy, but he continued charging. The Emperor was then knocked back a few times by Revan. This act of being pushed back was new. The Emperor did not like being struck. The fact that Revan was able to penetrate the Emperor's Force Shield and connect was very troubling to the Emperor. However, for all his power, he was no match. The Emperor was able to suspend Revan midair with a huge web of Force Lightning, which melted Revan's flesh and scarred his helmet onto his face. The little astromech droid, T3M4, was able to distract the Emperor with his flamethrower attachment. A solid attempt, but no real damage was done the little droid was destroyed in retaliation. The Emperor then picked up Revan's lightsaber and used it to swing the finishing blow. However, Mitra Surik was able to intercept the swing with her lightsaber throw. Even this act caught the Emperor off guard. Had she aimed for his head, she might have succeeded. Revan and his allies stand and confront the Emperor together. But the situation turns as Lord Scourge, who has a powerful force vision in the moment, decided to betray and murder Mitra Surik, while the Emperor once again spread Revan with lightning. To find out Scourge's side of the story, check out our explained video on him. Lord Scourge told the Emperor that he had pretended to be on Revan's side, and that he was forced into bringing them there. After a small test of truth, 
the Emperor chose to believe Lord Scourge's words. As a reward, the Emperor gave Scourge the title of Emperor's Wrath, and he would answer only to him and no one else. In addition, he also gave Scourge the gift of immortality. The Emperor had over the years perfected many of his dark side imbued technologies, and was now able to make a single person immortal through a combination of the technology and his own divine power. Scourge would now serve at his side, as his wrath for all time. However, Scourge still secretly plotted against him. After the throne room situation, the Emperor had to rethink his plans. Revan was able to breach his defences. If the Republic had more Jedi like Revan, then challenging them now would be very risky. So he turned on the idea and decided to wait and build his power base up more. He also held Revan captive in the Maelstrom prison, rather than killing him. He used Revan as a link to the light side of the Force, learning and soaking in his powers. It would even help the Emperor have visions of the future. But the link went both ways, and the Emperor did not realise this. Revan was able to plant subtle seeds of persuasion that would convince the Emperor not to attack the Republic yet, buying them more time. Yet time is something the Emperor has had a lot of. We don't know exactly when, but at some point during his 1000 year reign, the Emperor also possessed another host on another world. This was a human male named Valkorion. On the world of Zakul, the Emperor had discovered an intriguing ancient history here. He discovered the technological planet of Ayakath and its machine gods, along with the almighty Eternal Fleet, which was used by civilizations long gone. Using these tools, he was able to establish a thriving new society on the planet Zakul, which he named the Eternal Empire. He ruled here as a benevolent leader, known as the immortal emperor who saved the people, generations past. The society here viewed him as a deity, a divine emperor. All of this was done in complete secrecy from the larger galaxy. While the emperor focused on Zakul, his silence would be noticed across the Sith Empire, leading many to believe the Dark Council is the leadership of the empire. The Emperor's original goal was for total consumption of the galaxy, but at some point, he became distracted by other goals. He spent much time as Valkorion, even having a family with Senya Tyrael and marrying her. Make sure you check out our explained video on his family. Although he had no real love for them, it was just another experiment to him. Valkorion had three children, two twin sons and one daughter, Arkan, Fexen and Valen. The boys struggled to impress their father growing up, while Valen showed terrible signs of being her father's daughter. His daughter Valen reminded him of himself when he was a young Sith named Tenebrae. Seeing how much power she wielded at a young age was enough to scare Valkorion into conditioning her power as to not end up the same way his own father did many years ago. So Valen was conditioned and her power was sealed. Had she been allowed to let it free, it was possible she could threaten Valkorion and even rival him. When Senya learned of this and tried to stop it, she failed and was instead seen as an outcast to the entire family. Valkorion had simply used her and now she was to be cast aside. Then, in the year 3681 BBY, the Emperor gave his command to make the Sith's presence known to the galaxy again. The entire Sith Empire had returned in Legion. The Republic had not expected such a large force to oppose them from what was basically out of nowhere. Small reports and rumours of the Sith's progress in the Outer Rim had made way to their ears. Yet they had taken light of the information and did not foresee what was coming. First, the Emperor had his empire retake Korriban. Then he spread his empire throughout the Outer Rim entire so they could hold it and other precious worlds such as Korriban more easily. The Emperor also had Legion of Sith he had hand selected and even groomed over the years. None would ever succeed him, but he still liked to have strong allies. Allies such as the Dreadmasters. The Dreadmasters were a group of human Sith Lords, each with their own Darth name, Calphias, Brontes, Bestia, Tyrants, Styrak, and Raptus. These individuals were some of the Emperor's most favourite Sith, 
if he was to have such a thing. They specialized in fear, madness, and depravity. The Emperor unleashed his Dreadmasters onto the Republic and Jedi. However, they were ultimately defeated and captured on Belsavis. After the loss of his Dreadmasters, the Emperor pointed his empire in the direction of Alderaan. You can see the events of this fight in the cinematic trailer. Oh. After the first couple of years of the Sith's return, the Emperor had many infants brought to him by his Sith agents. These infants and children would have a dark side seed planted within them, which worked like having a sleeper agent. He had corrupted them into servitude without them knowing, and then sent them back to their homes. He would then be able to activate them later down the line to assist him in his ambitions. The Sith Emperor called and titled these individuals as children of the Emperor. He also managed to plant a second personality within the Jedi, Sayo Bikan, who would hold the title of First Son. Sayo Bikan was unknowingly aiding the Emperor and helping to keep his dark siblings undiscovered, as many that were indoctrinated would later become Jedi. In the next few years, the Emperor and his empire completely secured Zyost, Korriban, Balmora, for the most part, and even Serena. At this point in time, the war was being fought to a stalemate, but winning wasn't the only goal. With his immense power, the Emperor was now able to simply feed off of death itself, consuming the carnage and chaos of war. Winning battles and losing them was making him more powerful individually. After roughly 28 years of war with the Republic, since they returned and made their presence known, the Emperor changed his tactic. He ordered that a peace treaty be made with the Republic to bring an end to the war. Some of his Sith, such as Darth Malgus, were completely stunned at the order. The word peace didn't go down well in Sith conversation. Forced to obey his empire and namely Lord Barris held negotiations for a peace treaty on Alderaan. At the same time, Darth Malgus performs the sacking of Coruscant, which he did before he knew about the order for peace. Technically, the victor of the war was the Empire, as they had basically forced the Republic into signing the treaty by attacking the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. Part of the treaty terms were to return Coruscant to the Republic. Again, some Sith, such as Darth Malgus, were stunned and against the idea of giving back the core world, but the Emperor knew that holding it wasn't the point, but merely letting them know what was possible and that it can happen at any time was the point. Also, Coruscant was probably the most expensive planet to fund, so they had no intention of doing that. The Jedi were shunned away from Coruscant, and Satil Shan found a new Jedi homeworld by rediscovering Typhon in the year 3651 BBY. After they signed the treaty, the Empire still had battles with the Jedi and Republic. The Emperor had assaulted Dantooine and even won. He also attacked the planet Vos, which was new to the galaxy at the time, but they were pushed back with the help of the Republic. Then, the Emperor would be silent. In this time, he had gone quiet with his own empire, almost essentially leaving them to it. In truth, the Emperor had fed and gorged all the death so far, resulting in yet another power boost. It's more than likely he focused his time on Zakul more than he did anywhere else. At this point in time, we can confirm that the Emperor has split into at least three different people. We have the Sith Emperor, Falcorion the Immortal Emperor, and we have Tenebrae, who is in stasis at the top secret location. It's hard to say how many others at this time he possessed, as he did have roles for things such as the Emperor's voice. Such a being was found during the Sith Warrior storyline, where we see a Voss who has been possessed by the Emperor. This voice was being forced to stay by an ancient entity the Dark Lord was curious about, known as Selma Kor. This dark deity was older than even the Emperor by nearly 2,000 years. It was the Emperor's wrath that saved this voice of the Emperor on Vos and freed its essence. Eventually, a Jedi strike team, including the hero of Typhon, were able to break into and assault the Emperor's roaming fortress. Whether inside was the voice or the real Sith Emperor is hard to say, 
However, the Emperor was able to overwhelm this strike team and even manages to corrupt the Jedi into darkness and servitude. Others were killed. Even the hero of Typhon had succumbed to the Emperor's will for a short time. A few weeks later, the captured hero of Typhon broke free of the Emperor's control and escaped the fortress, assisted by none other than Lord Scourge on the way. All that time ago, when Revan, Scourge and Mitra faced the Emperor, Scourge had a vision of a powerful Jedi who would defeat the Emperor for good. This hero of Typhon was that Jedi. Even though Scourge was working against the Emperor, he still held his cover and the Emperor suspected nothing so far. Scourge did, however, feed the Emperor small bits of information to keep him from being skeptical. So Scourge did inform the Emperor of the Jedi Knights who had risen to challenge him. The Emperor made no immediate plans to go after this Jedi, nor did he fear losing against them, for he knew that he had become too powerful to simply destroy in one single form. The Emperor would need to be defeated at the heart of his essence to be truly destroyed, yet the situation proved opportunity to him. The Jedi would inevitably challenge and confront the Emperor, and he planned to use this to his own advantage. The time finally came, and the Jedi hero of Typhon confronted the Emperor in his dark throne room on Dromund Kars. The circle closes. The end begins. If you kill everything in the galaxy, you'll be all alone. What's the point? You discern a fraction of reality. Beyond these stars exist other galaxies, other worlds, other beings. I will experience or ignore them as I wish. When the last living thing in the universe dies, I will enjoy peace and wait for the cycle to begin again. The fact the Emperor so casually uttered the word peace was the first sign of his loyalty to the Sith. He was truly beginning to believe he simply knew better. Despite the Jedi now believing they had beaten the Emperor, he had actually moved his essence from the Hurst and rested in solitude within a temple on Yavin 4. His encounter with the Jedi had left him weakened and resting was appropriate. The Emperor had intentionally led them to believe he was defeated, as this meant they would no longer see him as a threat or seek him out. It was the perfect cover while he continued developing the eternal society of Zakul. No one would be looking for him, except one. One who refused to truly leave this realm until the Emperor was defeated. Revan. Be sure to check out our explained video on Revan to get his side of the story. Before we get into that, did you know that while rumours of the Emperor's death began to surface, a Sith uprising began on Oricon. The Dreadmasters had been freed recently before now, and they heard that the Emperor was apparently killed by a Jedi. Because of this, the Dreadmasters assume control over the Sith and begin a rampaging war on Oricon. They also cause trouble on Dinerva and Darvanis. The actual Sith Empire rejected their madness and evil doctrine and fought against them. Ultimately, they were defeated by a special operation group and their attempt to assume the Emperor's reign was thwarted. Back to Revan. Revan was broken free from the Maelstrom prison by a Jedi strike team. However, an Imperial strike team was able to intercept him at the Foundry and defeat him. But when Revan was defeated, he did not truly die. His physical body had separated and embodied the dark side. Revan became obsessed with drawing out and defeating the Emperor, so he went into hiding after his defeat and built up his own army using a Sith cult known as the Revanites. In roughly 3637 BBY, after the Emperor was said to be defeated already, Revan reborn returned to the galaxy and waged war against anyone who opposed him. Revan Reborn fueled a treaty between the Republic and Empire who had teamed together to take on Revan. This version of Revan insisted that the Emperor wasn't truly gone and that he needed to draw him out on Yavin 4. Despite trying to hide his essence, his presence on Yavin 4 was undeniable to all the Force users who touched down on the planet, meaning Revan wasn't lying. 
Revan was defeated at the hands of the Empire and Republic, however, the Emperor had taken notice, and he felt now was the time to make his presence known again. <laughs> you wanted my return. You did not need to destroy whole fleets, or turn a living world barren for that. The scores of death have nourished me. I have awakened, and I bring with me... dead. After his announcement, this part of the Emperor's essence made its way to Zyost. Now that he was replenished in power from absorbing the dead of the previous Revenite War, he was ready to show the galaxy just how powerful he really was. He was able to possess hundreds, if not thousands of people at the same time on Zyost. He used them to cause chaos and havoc across the world. The Republic and Empire showed up to assault the Emperor, however the effort would be made in vain. Emperor waited for the most amount of people to arrive, and then he displayed his power by once again consuming a world. Ziost didn't stand a chance. Without the use of a ritual or a legion of Sith to help, the Emperor was able to devour and corrupt the entire planet. Anything that survived was tainted by the dark side. Similar to Nathema, Ziost's landscape completely changed. Even its colour was washed out to the naked eye. After the Emperor had consumed and powered up, his essence left Zyost and made its way to Valkorion, where they once again added together. Now, the immortal Emperor was vastly more powerful than before. In his time as Valkorion, the Emperor had rebuilt a facility on Nathima, which housed his most top secret technology and his personal vault. This is also the place where Valen was conditioned. In his reign, he had accumulated the largest amount of Sith history and artifacts. It's believed that the Emperor knew more than any other Sith in terms of raw knowledge. No other has ever amassed the same collection. He had even created a Sith holocron that he immortalised his father, Lord Dramoth, inside of by imprisoning his essence there, never to be allowed to leave. He enjoyed summoning and torturing his father over the years. His suffering was to never end. As mentioned before, Valkorion had three children. Valen had only recently returned from her conditioning, which took many years. When she returned, she kneeled and submitted to Valkorion. His two sons, Arkan and Fexen, were eager to prove themselves to their father as worthy sons and heirs. Arkin specifically had a harder time dealing with the rejection. Alcorion was a different host, but the personality remained the same. The Emperor was cruel at heart and offered no mercy or favours to his sons. In fact, it's more likely he awaited the time for one brother to exceed the other. As brothers, they shared a natural bond, and the Emperor saw this as only weakness. That needed to be cast aside. Eventually, the Emperor tasked his sons with raiding the Republic and Empire to test the strength of his eternal empire and his enemies. The two sons laid waste to every planet they touched down on and had an overwhelming victory on every occasion. The immortal Emperor had taught his knights and sons to tap into the Force from a different perspective. They were not indoctrinated by Sith Curd nor Jedi Curd. They were simply taught to wield power and use it. This method of forced learning had the sons break through many limitations one might find in other instructions. 
they were able to summon mighty force waves and large powerful golden beams of force judgement and lightning. When they returned to the immortal emperor to present him with their trophies of war, the emperor wasn't impressed and once again turned away. As we know, it was this moment where Arkin was blinded by his hatred for his father and accidentally deals a lethal blow to his own brother, Thexen, who then dies in his arms. Seeing that one son had now overcome the other, the Emperor had for the first time acknowledged his son Arkin. The relationship wouldn't last however, as Arkin was filled with jealousy, grief and naive ambition. The Emperor used his son's death as a martyr for the people of Zakul, claiming he lost his life in the raids against the galaxy, defending them. The remaining leaders of the Empire, such as Darth Ma and Darth Nox, went in search of the Emperor. They were able to stumble across a drone that led them right to the Eternal Fleet in wild space. The Eternal Fleet easily overpowered the Empires and Republic search teams. The hero of the game, Star Wars The Old Republic, and Darth Ma are taken captive and brought before the Immortal Emperor in his throne room on Zakul. The Emperor of course did not tell anyone about who he truly was, so his own people only knew him as the Emperor of Zakul. Yet when Darth Maar arrived, he was able to clearly identify him as the Sith Emperor. A new name, a new face, these are not enough to hide from us. Alcorian played along and in the end offered to share his power with the hero of the game, who we will now refer to as the Outlander. One of two things can happen here, either the Outlander stabs Valkorion in the back, or Arkhan does. Either way, at this meeting, Valkorion's body is destroyed. However, we know that this alone would not defeat him. When his body burst, his essence lashed on to the Outlander. The Emperor, whether it was planned or not for this moment, had intended to take over the Outlander's mind. He could have simply overwhelmed his son's mind instead or anyone else in the room, but the Emperor became blind to his own defeat, so he wanted to keep playing along until he was ready to strike again. The Outlander was frozen in carbonite for five years, so essentially, so was Valkorion. When the Outlander is rescued, the Emperor makes his presence known to the Outlander, and the two begin to form a force bond. Valkorion lies and says he is trying to help the Outlander defeat his son Arkin. Valkorion is presenting himself as a master and is grooming the Outlander for succession. The depths of the Emperor's true plans was to once again be able to cause war and chaos while staying out of the affair. While living inside of the Outlander's mind, the Emperor was essentially in a safe place, where no one would be currently hunting him, so he was now once again in a position to just sit and wait it out. He had more than enough power at this point to simply move on to someone else, however, he decided to stick with the Outlander and to continue grooming them for succession of the Eternal Throne. Valkorion knew that his son Arkin or his daughter Valen would assume control of the Eternal Empire and wreak havoc across the galaxy, and he was right. After his body was destroyed, his son Arkin proclaimed to the people that the Outlander had killed their Emperor. This caused the people of Zakul to hate and despise the Outlander along with their Sith Empire or Galactic Republic. Arkin then proceeded to force the Empire and Republic into submission. Arkin and the Eternal Empire were recognised as the superior authority in the galaxy and each faction was to pay tribute to them. The death and destruction that was caused along the way had once again made the Emperor more powerful as it always does, so fueling these engagements yielded a high reward for the Emperor. Did you know that there was a deleted Darth Malgus cinematic that never made it to the game? Darth Malgus was seen frozen in carbonite and brought before Valkorion before his body was destroyed. This was at some point either during or after the Eternal Raids. At this point in time, the Emperor had become so sure of his own victory in the end that he even allowed the Outlander to borrow his power in some situations, which would be an incredible display every time. So what exactly was the Emperor's plans here? Well, 
He intended to bide his time within the Outlander's mind. Eventually, the Outlander would defeat Arkin and even Valen and claim the throne. This is what Valkorion was waiting for. The Emperor wanted a host that was more powerful than any he had before, so he groomed the Outlander to be this powerful so in the end he could take it for himself. Yet the Emperor's willingness to wait was ultimately his downfall. The Outlander was able to retrieve the Holocron that held Lord Dramoth from the vaults of Nathima. Dramoth told the Outlander that they could use the Holocron to contain and destroy his son, Tenebrae. He is immortal, but not invulnerable. This Holocron is the instrument of his destruction. With help from their allies and using the Holocron, the Outlander was able to finally defeat Valkorion once and for all from within the Holocron. The Emperor's essence was defeated and his presence in the galaxy was no more. However, Tenebrae had one final failsafe. In the years that passed during the defeat of Valkorion, Lord Scourge had received information from Revan's Force Ghost about the location of the Emperor's original body. We can only assume that Revan knew of this failsafe from living inside the Emperor's mind for so long during his 300 year imprisonment. The ritual that Tenebrae carved into his own flesh all those years ago had not activated automatically after Valkorion's defeat. Whether this was the original design or not, we do not know. But when Scourge and his allies found the body in stasis, they were successfully able to destroy it, and this is when the ritual activated. The Failsafe had a wave of dark side energy that would allow Tenebrae to latch onto any living host around. Fortunately, Scourge and his ally were able to resist these powers as they previously encountered them and have since learned. However, Satil Shan and some of her students had also made their way to the location of the body. We can only guess that either Revan communicated with Satil too, or she saw these events in her own force vision. But Satil planned a trap for the Emperor. Instead of allowing this failsafe to roam and spread across the galaxy, she used herself as bait so that the Emperor would focus his efforts on trying to possess her or her students, who were strong with the Force. While she entered a battle of will against the Emperor for control, all those who had challenged him in the past and rose to confront him were able to collectively come together in this one final moment. And that was the trap. To force the Emperor into a corner while 100 heroes from across the eras, Sith and Jedi alike, come together to overwhelm Tenebrae's return. Satil's plan worked and the revived version of Tenebrae saw and targeted her for a new host. Tenebrae was able to roam within and manipulate the environment of Satil's mind. However, this version of him that was stored within the failsafe had no memory of anything that had happened since after he was in stasis. Tenebrae was, however, able to read the minds of Satil and her students, which gave him quite enough insight as to what had been happening. This is how he was once again able to take his other forms, such as Valkorion. It was Darth Ma who said, What he said is very true. This Tenebrae is the much earlier and essentially weaker version, forgetting the fundamental nature of the Sith, to be surpassed. On this day, so many had risen against him that the Force itself took action and abandoned the Emperor. Cut off from the Force, he was brought down to nothing but dust. In the end, you are nothing. Tenebrae was born a true Sith prodigy. 
Yet time proved him arrogant, and not acting quickly cost him his final victory. His knowledge and teachings would be lost, as no apprentice was taken, and the legend of the Sith Emperor who had consumed worlds would be lost in time. Dessel, a Cortosis miner from Apotros, is working his shift during the day. He was an intimidating figure to behold, a two-meter-tall, well-built young man whose muscular frame was earned while working the mines. To retrieve Cortosis alloy, workers had to use a hydraulic jack that would slowly chip away at the metal. The more Cortosis workers brought back to Aura, the Outer Rim ore works, the more they would get paid. However, Aura was a cheap company that didn't like to buy new equipment or maintain any current equipment. They relied solely on used hardware that wouldn't be reliable at all. Eventually, they would chirk and stall. While working his shift, Dez's hydraulic jack did just that. Move aside, kid. I'm not done here. Jack died, that's all. Hand me yours and I'll keep at it for a while. You know the rules, kid. You stop working, and someone else is allowed to move in. What Gerd was saying is true. If a miner leaves their spot, someone else is absolutely allowed to jump in and take your place. But to do so was to start trouble. Everyone in the mines was there to earn their keep and pay their debts to Aura, so taking someone's spot was the same as taking someone's credits. It never goes down well. Des could tell that Gerd had been drinking. He was here to likely pick a fight, which is something he hasn't tried in recent years, as Des is now a grown man, a man capable of breaking your skull with just one blow. Gerd had been an old friend of Des's father, a man who used to beat and abuse Des his entire life. He held no love or empathy in his heart for his father. He had almost forgotten he had existed until Gerd came up to him today. Des wasn't about to give up his spot. He stands his ground. I don't see any of your friends down here with you, old man. So back off my claim and nobody gets hurt. You don't even know what day it is, do you, boy? Criffing disgrace is what you are. Five years ago today, your own father died. You don't even remember? Can't say I miss Hurst the same way you do, Gerd. <sighs> he raised you by himself after your mama died, and you don't even have the respect to call him Dad? You ungrateful son of a calf hound. Should have expected this from a mudcrutch whelp like you. Hurst always said you were no good. He knew there was something wrong with you, Ain. I don't have time for this. Got work to do. <clears throat> Looks like your daddy's been gone too long, boy. You need someone to beat the sense back into you. The name Bane was something Dez's father used to call him. He would say Dez was the bane of his existence. This word alone had hurt Dez more than any of the thrashings his father gave him. Dez had pushed Gerd back and snatched his own jack out of his hand, resulting in Gerd stumbling backwards and falling down. This was enough to make the two men start fighting. Des had been working for at least six hours already. Right now, he wasn't in the best condition to be fighting. Not long after blows began being exchanged, Des experienced a muscle spasm in his back, something that would happen often to workers of the mine. Despite this, Des was still able to defend himself, not because of his physical strength or brawling experience, but because the force was with him. It was something he didn't know yet, the Force was a thing that wasn't taught to your average person in the Outer Rim, but Des knew he had a hidden gift. A gift that allowed him to see glimpses into the future. It could let him see which cards to play at the cantina, or it could help let him know when an opponent is about to throw a punch. When Gerd throws his punch, Des sees it clearly through the power of the Force, allowing him to anticipate the blow and react with near-perfect precision. As Gerd's fist came flying, Des moves his head and managed to catch Gerd's thumb with his mouth and rip the appendage off using his teeth. Des spits the thumb out of his mouth and simply watches Gerd writhe in pain around the cave and floors. He had beaten his opponent and now he could do anything he wanted to them. Des reported to the foreman of the mines and was then instructed to go home. 
The foreman had told Des that they needed to make an example of him. Workers can't be fighting in the mines. As a consequence, Des was not allowed to work the mines until Gerd came back to work himself. This basically meant Des would have no income. However, the mines were not the only way to make credits on Apotros. Des rides the shuttle home across the plains of Apotros, gets changed out of his workwear and makes his way to the local cantina. He knew that Republic soldiers were at the cantina today, which meant he could go there and win some credits playing cards. Once the Republic troops had a few drinks, it wasn't too difficult to take their credits while playing Pezak or Sabak. Des enters the cantina and approaches the bar. The owner of the cantina is a Nymoidian named Groshik. He and Des had known each other since Des was a small child. They both had an arrangement. Des didn't need to pay for any drink he didn't ask for. So as he approaches the bar and Groshik prepares him a drink without request, he politely accepts the courtesy and downs the full thing in one gulp. You're here early, hmm? Yeah, ran into some trouble down in the mines. I bit Gerd's thumb off, so they let me go home early. Ha ha ha, seems like a fair trade. I see you've noticed our recruiters tonight. I don't suppose you started trouble with Gerd, just so you could go home early for cards with these Republic soldiers. Nah, I wouldn't do that. Just a happy coincidence this time. What are they spewing out tonight? More battles of glory? Trying to warn is about the horrors of the Brotherhood of Darkness. It doesn't seem to be going well. Usually when Republic troopers came to Apotros, they would attempt to recruit workers of the mines. They suspected they received some sort of bonus for every new initiate they sign up. The Republic would offer them a new life, free from the mines and promise of stability and health. However, with the current war going on, the Republic versus the Brotherhood of Darkness, Des knew better. He wouldn't be spending his free time dodging blaster fire on the front lines for a faction that has never once considered his own well-being. The Republic buy Cortosis from Aura, who don't share the profits with the miners. Instead, the workers are trapped in debt and barely affording to live, all while risking their lives mining Cortosis in sometimes lethal conditions, not to mention the side effects such as hair loss. Des himself had experienced hair loss and could not grow a head of hair. But most of these things were just facts of life for Des. He knew the Jedi wouldn't be coming to save him from any small injustices. So why should he put his life on the line? He wouldn't be. He knew one day he would pay off his debt to Aura and get off this blasted world. Winning in a game of cards could help nudge that on the way. Des inspected the cantina and saw many Republic troops playing different games at the tables. He was going to be waiting a while for a free seat to become available. As soon as one came up on the Sabak table, Des jumped right in. Whoa, they grow you fellas big out here on the rim. How tall are you? Two meters, even. Are you sure you're not really a Wookiee someone shaved for a joke? Come on now, son. It's just a joke. You can take a joke, can't you? Yeah, I can take a joke, but I'd rather take your credits. <laughs> well, all right, let's play some cards. Des didn't mind letting the Republic troopers talk. So long as he could win their credits, he would just ignore them and make it clear that he was not interested in ever joining them. Of course, these topics came up in conversation as per usual anyways. Des had tried his hardest to make it absolute, that he chose no sides when it came to the war, and if anything, he respected the Brotherhood of Darkness more than he could the Republic. If the Sith valued strength, then that was basically how Des knew the world to be in reality anyways. In time, the other players knew it would be futile to keep talking. After more and more drinks went down the hatch for the Republic Ensign and his friends, things would get more heated. The Republic troopers had learned that the people of Apotros don't really hold much love for them. They arrive, they take Cortosis, they leave. In the current hand being played, Des and the Ensign had both been tied. Des had been using his precognitive sight all evening in hopes of winning the Sabak pot which was at 10,000 credits. With all the animosity building between the players, it almost became a match of making each other lose rather than caring about winning anymore. Des let his emotions take over and they began to guide his card play. Both Des and the Ensign land on the hands named 
the idiots a rear, which seemed almost impossible to everyone watching. It was the rarest hand possible, and they both had it. Would you look at that? Idiots array on the switch? Wait. You stupid mud crutch. Now none of us are gonna get that support pot. We have two players at equal value. That will be decided by sudden demise. Sabak. Cheater! No one gets a sabak in a sudden demise. Not unless he cheats. You're in on it, droid. You're all in on it. You all haters. We know you do. Our brothers die on the battlefield protecting you. You don't deserve us. You're nothing but a bunch of lazy, illiterate. And everybody, get out of my cantina. We're closed. Not you dares. You stay put. I figured it was safer to keep you here with me for a bit. Those soldiers were pretty mad. They might be waiting for you on the walk home. I figured you weren't mad at me. Oh. I'm mad at you. That's why you're going to help me clean up this mess. You saw what happened, Groshik. I was just an innocent bystander. Just start picking up the chairs. Kotik brandy. Dialect from Kashyyyk. Not the hard stuff the Wookiees drink. Smoother. Milder. More tame. <clears throat> this is tame. I had to see what the Wookiees drink. What do you expect? They are Wookiees. This is good, Groshik. And expensive, I bet. What's the occasion? You had quite the day. I thought you could use it. I am worried about you. Worried about the fight with Gerd. They didn't give me much choice. I know, I know. Still, you bit off his thumb, and tonight, you nearly started a riot in my bar. Hey, I just wanted to play cards. It's not my fault things got out of hand. Maybe, maybe not. I saw you tonight. You were goading that soldier. Like everyone that sits against you. You push them, twist them, make them dance like puppets on a string. But this time, you never let up. Even when you had the advantage, you kept pushing. You wanted him to go off like that. Are you saying I planned this whole thing? Come on, Grashik. It was the cards that set him off. You know I wasn't cheating. It's not possible. How could I control what cards were dealt? It was more than the cards, Des. You were angry. More angry than I've ever seen you before. I could feel it from all the way across the room, like something in the air. We could all feel it. The cloud turned ugly in a hurry, Des. It was like they was feeding off your rage and your hate. You were projecting waves of emotion, a storm of anger and fury. Everyone else just kind of got swept up in it. The cloud, that soldier, everybody, even me. It was all I could do to aim that first shot from my blaster at the ceiling. Every instinct in my body was telling me to fire it into the cloud. I wanted to take them all down, see them writhe in pain. Listen to what you're saying, Groshik. <laughs> it's crazy. You know I wouldn't do that. I couldn't do that. Nobody could. I know you would never do it on purpose, Dell. And I know how crazy it sounds. But there was something different about you tonight. You gave in to your emotions, and it unleashed something. Strange. Something. Dangerous. Just watch yourself, Des. Please. I've got a bad feeling. <laughs> you be careful, Groshik. Nemoidians aren't known for relying on their feelings. It's not good for business. True. Maybe I'm just tired. I should get some sleep. And so should you. After leaving the cantina in the darkness, Des finds himself being ambushed on his walk home. The Republic Ensign and two of his friends had followed Des from the bar. However, they underestimated their opponent. Des had sensed them in the darkness and prepared for an assault. He swung his own fists around in the black of night and was rewarded by the sound of crushed cartilage and breaking burn. Moments later, Des saw one of the assailants draw a weapon. It was a vibrosword that appeared to be glowing. He could see it clearly. 
Des avoided the Vibra Blade attack, then grabbed the weapon himself and reversed it into his opponent. The blade ran through the ensign's chest, and then his lifeless body thumped against the permacrete of Apotros' residential areas. The other assailant saw their dead friend and decided to flee. Des wanted to inspect the weapon he saw glowing, except it wasn't glowing now. It was almost as if his eyes were warning him about a dangerous threat. Little did he know that this was the power of the Force and the manifestation of his dormant dark side power. Des knew he couldn't go home now. Soon the authorities would be searching for him. Regardless of whether or not it was self-defense, the Aura Company wouldn't see it that way. They would probably send Des to a prison colony for the crime of murder. Des decides to return to the cantina. Perhaps Groshik would know what to do. When he arrives, Groshik brings him inside and questions him as to why there is blood on him. Des explains the situation, and Groshik pours them another round of Kartik brandy. As it would turn out, Groshik had contacts all around. He knew anyone he knows from the Republic wouldn't be much help right now. So Groshik confesses to Des that he has contacts within the Sith. Should he want to escape Apotros and be a fugitive of the Republic, then Groshik could help Des join the Sith and find a new life for himself. Without hesitation, Des was ready to leave Apotros and begin a new life. Even if it meant enlisting with the Sith and joining their army, he couldn't fight for the Republic, but he could certainly fight against them. Groshik sets Des up at the local spaceport with a Rodian captain, who will take him off world. Des hides in a side panel of the ship's interior and awaits for his new life to begin. Des now served in the Sith military. He held the rank of sergeant and was highly respected by his fellow troopers. Des's hidden force ability had evolved from helping him win at cards and trivial brawls in the minds of Apotros, to now helping him win his battles in the ongoing war against the Republican Jedi. Des had been able to save his comrades countless times, along with completing near impossible missions with outrageous odds of survival. For that reason, most of the other troopers were loyal to Des, loyal enough to follow him wherever he leads. The squad Des served in was named the Gloom Walkers, a very prestigious military unit that would usually be selected for high priority objectives. The current objective for the squad was on the planet of Fasira. The Sith Lords had ordered the Lieutenant and Commanding Officer, Lieutenant Ulubor, to send the Gloom Walkers into an enemy stronghold during the daytime. Knowing that attacking in broad daylight would be nothing but suicide, Des challenged his commander. However, Ulabor would not let up. He was too afraid to refuse the Sith Lord's orders. Des recognized the cowardice and decides to take action into his own hands. He knocks out his superior with a clean haymaker. He then announces to the squad that what he has done is mutiny. However, they must attack during the night instead, or else the mission will fail and everyone will likely die. Without hesitation, and as expected, the entire unit remained loyal to Des and followed his lead. They waited for nightfall, then headed out for the stronghold. While taking advantage points, Des asked one of his comrades, a sniper named Lucia, whether or not they could take out the nine targets on the roof of the stronghold before they can get to the turrets. See those soldiers to the rear of the gunship? The ones working those flash cannons? If we don't get rid of them somehow, they're going to turn our squads into turret fodder in about 10 seconds after this battle begins. I want you to think about this very carefully now, Trooper. How quickly do you think you could take them out from here? I... I don't even know if I could, Sarge. Not all of them. Not from this angle. I could get a line on the first one, but as he goes down, I doubt the others will stay long enough for me to take aim. They'll probably duck down in the flatbed for cover. And even if I take the gunners out, there's still half a dozen soldiers on that roof who would jump in to take their place. I can't drop land targets by myself that fast, Sarge. Nobody can. Without really thinking, Des grabs the sniper rifle from Lucia and looks down the scope to get a better visual of the enemy. In that moment, the force flowed through him and guided his decisions. Without thinking further, Des fires the sniper and takes out all the targets on the roof. 
with 100% accuracy and superhuman-like reflexes. A flash grenade had gone off and blinded Des through the scope. However, he still completed the shots as the force guided him through his task. He hands the sniper back to Lucia, and she just stands there in amazement at what she saw. Des yells at her to snap out of it, and the battle commences. The Gloomwalkers were victorious. They had completed the missions and cleared the way for the main forces to push through. However, when they returned to camp, their commanding officer and security were waiting to arrest Des. He had disobeyed a direct order that came down from a Sith Lord. This was punishable by death. Des had to signal to his squad not to interfere with his arrest. He knew there was nothing they could do to help him now. He had to accept his fate and hope that he may get the opportunity to explain his side of events. He was taken to a holding cell, which more resembled a pit in the ground. He was left there for what felt like days before someone eventually came to stand over his cell. A heavyset male wearing a dark robe. The man told the guards to bring the prisoner to Corriban so he could deal with him personally. Des wasn't sure what awaited him on Corriban, but he was swiftly moved and finding himself being led down into a temple that resided on the surface of Corriban, not too far from the Valley of the Dark Lords. Des had been taken directly to the Sith Academy. He followed the woman leading him until she directs him to walk on alone, down a dark yet warm stone corridor. When he reaches the end, he finds the same heavyset male, a Twi'lek. Um, forward. I am Lord Kopej of the Sith. I am to be your Inquisitor. I alone will determine your fate. Rest assured, my judgment will be final. You are no friend of the Jedi or the Republic. What have they ever done for me? Exactly. I understand you have fought many battles against the Republic forces. Your fellow troopers speak highly of you. The Sith have need of men like you if we are to win this war. You were a model soldier until you disobeyed a direct order. The order was a mistake. Why did you refuse to attack the outpost during the day? Are you a coward? A coward wouldn't have completed the mission. Attacking in the daylight was a tactical mistake. Our commanding officer should have relayed that back to command, but he was too afraid. He was the coward, not me. He would rather risk death at the hands of the Republic than face the Brotherhood of Darkness. I prefer not to throw my life away so needlessly. I can see that from your service record. Sheik, Chalandoja, Basira. If these reports are accurate, you have performed incredible feats during your time with the Gloom Walkers. Feats some would claim to be impossible. The reports are accurate. We have no doubt that they are. Do you know why I have brought you to Coliban? I feel I'm being chosen for something. Good. Your mind works quickly. What do you know of the Force? Not much. Something the Jedi believe in. Some great power that's supposed to be just floating out there in the universe somewhere. And what do you know of the Jedi? They believe they are the Guardians of the Republic. I know they wield great influence in the Senate. I know many believe they have mystical powers. And the Brotherhood of Darkness? You are the leaders of our army. And a sworn enemy of the Jedi. Many believe that you, like them, have unnatural abilities. But you do not? I believe most of the stories are greatly exaggerated. A common enough belief. Those who do not understand the ways of the Force regard such tales as myth or legend. But the Force is real. Those who wield it have power you can't even imagine. But you have not experienced the real war. 
while troops vie for control of worlds and moons. The Jedi and Sith Masters seek to destroy each other. We are being driven toward an inevitable and final confrontation. The faction that survives, Sith or Jedi, will determine the fate of the galaxy for the next thousand years. True victory in this war will not come through armies, but through the Brotherhood of Darkness. Our greatest weapon is the Force, and those individuals who have the power to command it. Individuals like you. You are special, Des. You have many remarkable talents. These talents are manifestations of the Force. They have served you well as a soldier. You have only scratched the surface of your gift. The Force is real. It exists all around us. You can feel the power of it in this room. Can you sense it? I... I do feel it. Hot. Like a fire waiting to... explode. The power of the dark sand. The heat of passion and emotion. We can feel it in you as well. Burning beneath the surface. Burning like your anger. It makes you strong. But you have touched the force in the past. But your abilities are an insignificant speck beside the power of a true Sith Master. There is great potential in you. If you stay here on Kaliban, we can teach you to unleash it. You would no longer be a troop on the front lines. If you accept my offer, that part of your life is over. You will be trained in the ways of the dark side. You will become one of the Brotherhood of Darkness, and you will not return to the Gloom Walkers. I am honored, Master Korbesh, and I gratefully accept. The way of the Sith is not for the weak. Those who falter will be left behind. I will not be left behind. That remains to be seen. This is a new beginning for you, Des. A new life. Many of the students who come here take a new name for themselves. They leave their old life behind. Do you wish to choose a new name for yourself, Des? Do you wish to be reborn? Yes. And by what name should we call you now? My name is Bane. Bane of the Sith. Dessel took the name that once used to make him feel weak. He would now use it to make himself strong. He would draw upon the anger it caused within him and use it as fuel for his new journey of darkness. Bane was now reborn. A destiny was taking place. This student you have brought me, this Bane, has never trained in the ways of the Force. I told you before, Cordis. He grew up on a Patros, a world controlled by the Oro Mining Company. Yet you find this young man and bring him here to this academy. It seems almost too convenient. This is not a plot against you, Cordis. That is no longer our way. We are a brotherhood now. You are too suspicious. <laughs> not suspicious. Cautious. It has helped me to maintain my position here among so many powerful and ambitious Sith. He is as powerful as any of them. But he is also older. We prefer to find our students when they are younger and more malleable. Now you sound like a Jedi. They seek younger and younger pupils, hoping to find them pure and innocent. In time, they will refuse any who are not infants. We must be quick to pluck those who they leave behind. Besides, Bane is too strong to simply pass over. Even for the Jedi, we are lucky we found him before they did. Yes, lucky. His arrival here seems to be an incredible turn of many fortuitous events. Quite lucky indeed. 
Some might see it that way. Others might see it as something more. Destiny. The other acolytes have been training for many years. He will be far behind. He will catch up, given the chance. And I wonder, will the others give him that chance? Not if they're smart. I'm afraid we may be throwing away one of Lord Khan's best troopers. We both know the Jedi won't be defeated by soldiers. I'll gladly trade a thousand of our best troopers for even one Sith Master. He is that strong, is he? This Bane. I think he might be the one we've been searching for. He could be the Sith Ali. Before he can claim that title, he'll have to survive his training. Bane's life had completely changed once again. He spent the last few years being a fugitive of the Republic while serving in the Sith military. Now, he finds himself chosen to be trained in the wits of the dark side. The Force was still a foreign concept for him, but once he spoke with Lord Kerpej, his eyes were opened. The feats he performed in the past were indeed manifestations of the Force, and now, Bane was determined to nurture and strengthen that power, for he could one day sit among the masters of the Brotherhood as an equal. Bane's lesson begins the next day, after Lord Kerpej leaves the world and returns to Lord Khan, who is the leader of the Brotherhood of Darkness, and also a Sith Master. Bane's first lesson is in attendance with the Academy's overseer, Lord Cordis, a tall and skinny man who had talon-like nails and ash the skin. Cordis is teaching Bane the tenants of the dark side. The tenants of the Sith are more than just words to be memorized. Learn them, understand them, and they will lead you to the true power of the dark side. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Kopej tells me you come to us as a raw apprentice. He says you have never been trained in the ways of the Force. I'm a quick learner. Yes, and strong in the power of the dark side. But the same can be said of all who come here. What do you know of this academy? The students here are taught to use the Force. They are taught the secrets of the dark side by you and the other Sith Lords. I know there are many other academies like this one. No, not like this one. It is true we have other training facilities spread across our ever-growing empire. Places where individuals with promise are taught to control and use their power. But each facility is unique. And where individual students are sent depends on how much potential we see in them. Those with notable yet limited ability are sent to Honaker, Gentis, or Kamal to become Sith warriors or marauders. They are taught to channel their emotions into mindless rage and intensify their battle fury. The tower of the dark side transforms them into ravaging beasts of death and destruction to be unleashed against our enemies. Root strength alone is not enough to bring down the Republic. True. Those with greater ability are sent to worlds have allied themselves with our cause to destroy the Republic. Ryloth, Umbara, Nashada. These students become creatures of shadow, learning to use the dark side for secrecy, deception, and manipulation. Those who survive the training become unstoppable assassins, capable of drawing on the dark side to kill a target without moving a muscle. Yet even they are no match for the Jedi. Precisely. The academies on Dathomir, Eridonia, are most similar to one here. Their apprentices study under Sith Masters. Those who survive their training become adepts and acolytes who swell the ranks of our armies. They are the counterparts to the Jedi Knights, who stand in the way of our ultimate conquest. But even as the Jedi Knights must answer to the Jedi Masters, so must the adepts and acolytes answer to the Sith Lords. And those with potential to become Sith Lords, and only with such potential are trained here, on Korriban. Korriban is the ancestral home of the Sith. This planet is a place of great power. The dark side lives and breathes in the very core of this world. This temple we stand in 
was built many thousands of years ago to collect and focus that power. Here you feel the dark side at its strongest. You have been chosen because you have great potential. Great things are expected of apprentices here on Korriban. The training is difficult, but the rewards are great for those who succeed. You have the potential to become one of us, one of the Brotherhood of Darkness. Together we can cast off the shackles of the Republic. But even those with potential can fail. I trust you will not disappoint us. Bane spends his first few weeks at the Academy separate from the other apprentices mostly. Since Bane joined the Order as an adult, his knowledge of the Sith was very far behind the other students. For this reason, the Sith Masters are instructed to spend extra time with Bane, carefully teaching him the ways of the dark side. It did not take long for Bane to discover his hidden potential. After only a few days of training, he found himself able to leap vertically to heights you couldn't possibly imagine. He could sprint at full speed for many laps around the Academy's perimeters without needing to stop for air. He was now capable of moving larger and larger objects through the power of the Force. Bane had experienced a transformation from mere mortal to an apprentice of the Sith. He had been reborn with the power that boiled over. Less than a week into his training, he felt the power of the dark side commune within him. It joined with his mind like a tidal wave of clarity and perception. His dark side power began as a small spark deep inside his being. Now it was a raging inferno, white hot and prepared to channel his emotions and fury into power, power he could use to defeat an opponent in the dueling ring. Bane had been attending morning drill routines on the academy's rooftop for some time now. Here, the students would gather together for a group session with the Sith Master, Lord Kasim. Kasim was in fact the Blade Master of the academy. He personally knew all seven styles of lightsaber combat and had spent his entire life perfecting them. Kasim was for all intents and purposes the greatest swordsman in the galaxy. For this reason, Kasim was at the academy specifically to train the students in the art of lightsaber combat. When Bane had first joined these lessons, he had proven to the other students that his experience was far behind. Bane himself was aware of this, that's why for the first few sessions, he would refuse to participate in the dueling ring. After each session, students were allowed to challenge one another in the dueling ring. Bane had been refusing every offer to fight, except against one student named Furhag. This student had beaten Bane in the dueling ring before now, and Bane wanted revenge. Today, he would initiate a challenge against Furhag to test the progress of his training. I challenge Furhag. I accept. Defeat is bitter, human. I have bested you. You have lost. You trained for weeks to challenge me. You have failed. Victory is mine again. Then come. Finish me. This ends when I choose. You are weak. You are predictable. The masters courted you. They give you more attention than the others, more than me. Despite this, you are still my inferior, Bane of the Sith. That name is mine. No one uses it against me. Bane, worthless, an insignificant nothing. You are well named, for you truly are this Academy's Bane. No. That's enough. No, it's enough. Victorious in the dueling ring, Bane had killed his opponent, Furhag. He used the power of the dark side to squeeze his throat and crush his airways. Furhag foamed at the mouth while he gagged and spat. 
The Blade Master Kasim simply watched and allowed Bane to leave once the fight was over. In the dueling ring, students would use training sabers that were covered in Pelco bug venom. The venom would paralyze the contacted limb and cause severe pain in the victim. The pain and sensation was meant to mirror the effects of a real lightsaber. But when a student was hit, they would feel the consequences without losing a limb for real. As Bane had left the ring and descended the academy's stairs, one of the other students approaches him, Sirak, said to be the top student of the academy, an Iridonian Zabrak who wielded a double-bladed weapon. Sirak had seen that Bane was now very powerful. He wanted to let him know that he was now being watched. Bane had realized that Sirak was attempting to lure Bane into challenging him in the dueling ring before he was ready. Sirak leaves Bane at the stairs, and Bane leaves for his own room. The next morning, Bane was summoned to Lord Cordis' quarters to answer for the death of Furhag. On the walk there, Bane was contemplating how he would explain Furhag's death. Killing other students was not permitted at the academy. The Sith were meant to be all equals now in the Brotherhood. Killing each other is the way of the past. Sith infighting has ended. In its place, the Brotherhood of Darkness and its equal Sith Lords rule over the Sith now, heralded by Lord Khan himself. Bane arrives at Lord Cordis's quarters and knocks on the door. Enter. Kasim told me what happened yesterday morning. He tells me you are responsible for... Fohag's death? I'm not responsible for his death. Fohag was the one that let his guard down. He left himself vulnerable in the ring. He would have shown weakness not to have taken advantage of it. Kasim says Fohag did not lower his guard. He says you simply ripped through it. His defenses could not stand before your power. Master, are you saying I should hold back if my opponent is weak? It is one thing to defeat an opponent in the ring, even once he is down. You continued to attack him. He was beaten long before you killed him. What you did was no different from striking a blade against a fallen unconscious foe. Something that is not permitted in the training ring. Kasim knew what was happening. He could see what I was doing. Why didn't he stop me? Why not indeed? Lord Kasim wanted to see what would happen. He wanted to see how you would act in that situation. He wanted to see if you would be... Merciful. Or if you would be strong. I don't understand. I thought it was forbidden to murder another apprentice. We cannot have students attacking each other in the halls. We want your hatred directed against the Jedi, not one another. Despite this, Fohag's death might turn out to be a minor loss if it helps you achieve your full potential. Exceptions can be made for those who are strong in the dark side. Like Shirak. Sirak understands the power of the dark side. Passion fuels the dark side. This is a lie. There is only passion. Through passion, I gain strength. Exactly. Through strength, I gain power. Through power, I gain victory. Through victory, my chains are broken. Understand this. Truly understand this. And your potential will be limitless. What is the Sithari? Where did you hear that word? I had some of the other students say that word. About Sirak. They say he could be the Sithari. Some of the old texts speak of the Sithari. They say the Sith will one day be led to a perfect being. One that embodies the dark side. Sirak is this perfect being? Sirak is the strongest student at the academy. For now. Perhaps in time, he will surpass Kasim and me and the other Sith Lords. Perhaps not. Many of the Masters do not believe in the legend of the Sidari. Lord Khan discounts it for one. It goes against the philosophy underlying the Brotherhood of Darkness. What about you, Master? Do you believe in the legend? These are dangerous questions to ask. But if the Sidari is more than legend, he will not simply be born as the exemplar of all our teachings. He or she must be forged in the crucible and trials of battle to attain such perfection. Some might argue such training is the purpose of this academy, but I would counter by insisting we train our apprentices to join the ranks of the Sith Lords. 
so they may stand alongside Ka and the rest of the brother. According to Master Cordis, the death of Furhag is acceptable so long as it helps Ben to realize his full potential. Ben had been able to draw upon his anger to kill Furhag in the ring. His emotions fueled the power of the dark side, and in return, the dark side fueled his emotions. This line of thought led Ben to a dead end. How could he learn to control his power if ultimately his power would control him? There was nothing in his current training about this flaw, so Ben decided to brush off this sentiment and trust in the wisdom of his masters. As Ben lay in his bed later that night, attempting to sleep after a miserable day training with Kasim, his mind can't help but think about Furhag's death again. He struggled to believe it was okay that he had killed him in cold blood. He wasn't sure whether or not the power of the dark side was truly worth it, considering the cost that came to his morality. He tried his best to shrug this off, and eventually, he falls into a deep sleep. You make me sick. Look how much you eat. You're worse than a Criffin Zucker pig. Do you hear me, boy? You think that food in front of you is free? I gotta pay for that food, you know. I worked every day this week and still owe more now than I did at the beginning of the blasted month. You want me to start working double shifts to support you, boy? I work just as many shifts as you do. What? What'd you say? I said I work as many shifts as you do, and I'm only 18. 18, and still too dumb to know when to keep your mouth shut. Bloody bane of my existence, you are. You gonna beat me now? Teach me a lesson? What the bricks is wrong with you, boy? I'm sick of this. You blame all your problems on me, but you're the one who's drinking away all our credits. Maybe if you sell it up a bit, we can get off this stinking world. You smart mouth mud crutch whelp. If you're going to beat me tonight, remember, it might be your last, old man. Better make it a good one. I hope you die. 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 Ben awakens from his sleep, aspirating and fatigued. He had dreamed about his father and the circumstances around his death. According to the official reports, his father had died of a sudden heart attack. The same night, he nearly beat his own son half to death. The authorities never suspected the real truth, and neither did Ben. Not until now. He had killed his own father that night through the power of the dark side meaning Furhag wasn't the first person he murdered with the Force, and he likely wouldn't be the last. The revelation affected Ben, and this reflected in how he connected with the dark side. Knowing that he was responsible for his father's death meant that he could somehow no longer draw upon the anger he used to feel, almost as if he was feeling guilty. Ultimately, he knew that the weak would fall to the strong, determined to continue his training, he reports to the Blade Master Kasim for a private lesson. No, wrong. You are too slow on the first transition. You are leaving your left side open for a quick counter. <sighs> I'm sorry, Master. I'll go and practice the routines again. <laughs> routines? What good will that do? I must learn to sequence better. Become faster. <laughs> if you truly believe that, then you are a fool. For Hog was better trained than you. He knew more sequences. He knew more forms, but they couldn't save him. The sequences are just tools. They help you free your mind so you can draw upon the Force. That is where you will find the key to victory. Not in the muscles of your arms or the quickness of your blade. You must call upon the dark side to destroy your enemies. You're holding back. You aren't using the Force. Without it, your moves are slow and predictable. I'll try harder, Master. Try? You've lost your will to fight. This lesson is over. Return when you are ready to embrace the dark side, instead of pulling away from it. In the few weeks since Furhag's death, Ben's training seems to have taken to a decline. His ability to draw on the dark side was now obstructed by his internal conflicts. 
The Blade Master had recognised this flaw in Bane to some degree. Kasim knew that Bane was holding back for some reason. This was a barrier he needed to overcome if he was to ever become an equal in the Brotherhood. While Bane trains at the Academy on Korriban, a war is still ongoing far away in the stars. Lord Khan, the leader of the Brotherhood, had received news that the Jedi have formed an army to oppose them, and they have appeared on the world of Rusan, calling themselves the Army of Lights. Khan couldn't help but find the name of the opposing force quite humorous. In retaliation, Lord Khan unites the Sith Lords and gathers his own army to assault the Jedi on Rusan. Already the Brotherhood had taken many worlds, but Khan was now willing to risk losing them all for the sake of attacking the Jedi and their infamous leader, General Hoth. Hoth was a Jedi Master. He and Lord Khan had a clear rivalry between each other in all the conflict. What the Brotherhood of Darkness did not know is that Lord Khan himself was adept in the ways of Force Inspiration an ability that allowed him to cast subtle ways of persuasion and loyalty amongst his brothers. Lord Khan used this ability to unite the Sith of this era and bring a stop to the infighting. The task of keeping all the Sith Lords in check was very stressful. It required Khan's constant attention and slight manipulations. News of the change in the war reaches the surface of Korriban. Lord Cordis summons the Blade Master to his quarters so he may share the news. Kasim also offers an update on Bane's progress at the Academy. You wanted to see me? Used from the front. The Jedi have amassed together under a single banner on the Rusa. General Hoth is leading them. Lord Khan has gathered his own arm. Now they are heading to engage the Jedi. Are we going to join them? None of us. None of the masters and none of the students, unless you feel one of the apprentices is ready. No. Sirak, perhaps. He is strong enough, but his pride is too great, and he still has much to learn. What about Bane? He showed great promise in disposing of Fohag. That was a month ago. Since then, he has made no progress. Something is holding him back. Fear, I think. Fear? Of the other students? Of Zirak? No, nothing like that. He's finally seen what he is truly capable of. He's seen the full power of the dark side. I think he's afraid to face it. Then he is of no further use to us. Focus on the other students. Do not waste your time on him. I think he just needs more time. Most of our apprentices have been studying the ways of the Sith for many years, ever since they were children. Bane didn't begin his training with us until he was full grown. Well aware of the circumstances surrounding his arrival at this academy, the next time Bane approaches you, turn him away. Make sure all of the Masters understand he is no longer worthy of our teachings. Considering Bane's lack of progress recently, Ordis thinks it best to cast him out and no longer give him attentions from the Academy's masters. This meant Bane had to find his own way back to power, a task that was proving to be quite difficult for him. Lord Kasim had turned Bane away in a very public manner, making it clear to all of the students that he is no longer to be respected or even seen as a threat. All he could do was attend the group sessions, but his presence would be discarded no advice or wisdom would be given to him. The message was clear. Before long, other apprentices would notice his vast decline in power and likely challenge Bane in the dueling ring. He had to make sure he got there first. In the next group session with Kasim, after finishing the routines and drills, Bane challenges Sirak, the current top student of the academy, in the ring. At first, it seemed as though Bane was able to defend himself against Sirak, despite his lack in progress. However, Bane eventually realised that Sirak was actually toying with him. Now, he was showing Bane his true talent. It became clear very quickly that Bane was overmatched. Sirak had crushed Bane's fingers, shattered a kneecap, broken his jaw and even smashed out some of his teeth. Sirak then picks up Bane's body and throws him using the power of the force to the other side of the rooftop. 
the resulting crash landing broke many of Byrne's ribs. Then, he passed out. Byrne spends three weeks in the Bacta tank. The average length of stay in the tank was usually just one day, but Byrne had severely lost against Sirak. With this loss, Byrne knew that his life was essentially over. If he didn't find a way to find his will to fight again, he would forever be seen as an outcast. Weak, all he could do was give himself up to his studies. With his newfound spare time, Byrne decides to revisit the Academy's archives. Much like the Jedi Order have their library, the Sith also have their own archive, although its contents were certainly lacking. Byrne had visited the library when he first arrived on Korriban. The dusty books and scrolls had helped teach him the ways of the Sith and their history. However, that was when he didn't have much time to browse the catalogues. Now, he had as much time as he needed to finish any research of reading of any ancient text. Bane discovered many unique things in the text that were not being taught by the masters of the academy. He discovered the Darth title and pondered why it was currently not being used by any of the Sith a question he may get answers to another time. As he studies in the archive, a newly arrived acolyte stands by the doorway and watches him. Other acolytes saw no use in visiting the library. They preferred to be in the presence of the living masters and learn from them, which meant Bane would usually find himself alone to nurture his studies. So when Githany, a former Jedi, now Sith acolyte, approaches him in the library, he was slightly surprised. She was a female human with striking beauty. Bane couldn't help but stare as she approached him, but she was used to men staring at her. She often used it to her advantage. Bane, I've been looking for you. Looking for me? Why? I need you. I need your help against Sirak. I can't help you with Sirak. Please, Bane, just listen to what I have to say. Take a seat. I know what happened to you in the dueling ring. I know everyone believes Sirak destroyed you. That somehow the defeat robbed you of your power. I can see you believe it too. They're wrong, Bane. You can't just lose your ability to command the Force. None of us can. The Force is part of us. It's part of our being. I heard accounts of what you did to that Forharg. That showed what you were capable of. It revealed your true potential. It proved you are blessed with a mighty gift. You may believe you've squandered that gift or lost it, but I know better. I can sense the power inside you. I can feel it. It's still there. The power may be there, but my ability to control it is gone. I'm not what I used to be. That's not possible. How can you believe that? All my life, I've been driven by my anger. My anger, it made me strong. It was my connection to the Force and the dark side. When Farag died, when I killed him, I realized I was responsible for my father's death. I killed him through the power of the dark side. And you felt guilty? No. Maybe. All I know is that the realization changed me. The anger that fueled me was gone. All that was left behind was, uh, well, nothing. Give me your hand. Close your eyes. Come with me, Bane. Using her own connection to the Force, Giffany takes Bane's hand and connects with him. Delving into the depth of his being, Giffany helped Bane to find his relationship to the dark side. It still existed. She assured Bane that it was possible to seize this power for himself once again. The dark side is emotion, Bane. Anger, hate, love. Lust, these are what make us strong. Peace is a lie. There is only passion. Your passion is still there, Bane. Seek it out. Reclaim it. How... how did you do that? My former Jedi Master taught me when I was studying in the Order. I lost touch with the Force once, just as you have. I was still a young girl when it happened. My mind simply couldn't cope with something so vast and infinite. It created a wall to protect itself. Your anger is still there, as is the Force. Now, you must break through the walls you built around it. 
You have to go back to the beginning and learn how to connect with the Force once more. How, how do I do that? Training. How else does one learn to use the Force? The Masters won't train me anymore. Cordis has uh, forbidden it. I could train you. I will share with you everything I learned from the Jedi about the Force. And whatever I learn about the dark side from the Masters, I can teach to you as well. Why are you doing this? <laughs> Still don't trust me? Good. You shouldn't. I'm only in this for myself. I can't defeat Cyrek on my own. He's too strong. They say he's the Sithari. I don't believe in prophecies, but he has powerful allies. And the other Zabrak apprentices here are all completely loyal to him. If I'm ever going to challenge him, I need somebody on my side. Somebody strong in the Force. Somebody like you. Lord Cordis and the other Masters won't approve of this. You're taking an awful risk. Risks are the only way to claim the rewards. Besides, I don't care what the Masters think. In the end, those who survive are the ones who look after themselves. You help me regain the Force, and I'll help you against Sivak. Why did you leave the Jedi? I don't think I'm quite ready to share that with you. With Giffany's help, Ben could be able to return to the path of victory. Ben accepts Giffany's offer of training, however he knows full well she is attempting to manipulate him. He seeked out Ben simply because he already lost to Sirak. She thought Ben would be an easy target, but that didn't mean they couldn't be allies, for now. However, ultimately Ben would serve his own goals. With his newly awakened passion and determination to succeed, Ben decides to try his luck with asking the Blade Master for training again. But after curfew, Ben ventures through the halls of the temple and knocks once, quietly, on the Blade Master's door. What are you doing here? I want you to train me again. I want you to teach me all you know about the art of lightsaber combat. Cordus will never allow it. He made it very clear that none of the Masters ought to waste any more time with you. I don't think you answered to Cordus. Aren't all the Masters equal in the Brotherhood of Darkness? True enough. But here on Korriban, the other lords defer to Cordus. It avoids... complications. Cordus doesn't have to know. Train me in secret. We can meet at night on the temple roof. Why should I do this? You ask for teachings of a Sith Lord, but what are you offering me in return? You know my potential. Cordus has cast me aside. If I succeed now, he cannot take the credit. I become an expert warrior for the Brotherhood. Lord Khan will know you were the one who trained me. If I fail, no one will ever suspect your part in this. You have nothing to lose. Nothing but my time. You've lost your will to fight. You proved that against Sirak. My will to fight is back. I'm ready to embrace the power of the dark side. Why are you doing this? I want revenge. I want to destroy Sirak. I want to crush him like an insect beneath the heel of my boot. Hmm. We will begin tomorrow. Ben had been successful in convincing the Blade Master to train him again. He had perked at the Twi'lek's sense of pride and lured him into training him as if it benefits all parties. Over the next many weeks, Ben excels in his training with Giffany in secret. He had realized that if he couldn't draw upon the anger for his father anymore, then he would need to utilize other tools to get the connection started. Ben began to seethe on his hatred for the Masters for abandoning him his hatred for the other students who ostracize him, but most of all, his hatred for Sirak and his need, his lust for revenge. Rediscovering these tools of connecting to the dark side, Bain was able to once again tap into his potential. His training began to rapidly progress and he easily surpassed his former peak level. His private sessions with the Blade Master Kasim were also going well. He kept this a secret from Giffany as to not give her a heads up about his true power level. Bane liked this advantage. Even the other students didn't suspect Bane's progress. They merely continued to ignore him as if he didn't exist. Eventually, Bane masters his saber style 
the Gem Sir. He was instructed to use this style by Kasim as it suited his intimidating size and brutal, heavy swings. Excellent. Very good, Bane. I thought you might be caught off guard by that move, but you were able to anticipate and defend against it with near perfect form. Do you have anything you want me to work on for tomorrow? A new sequence? A new form? Anything? You've moved far beyond sequences and forms. In that last pass, you broke off your attack from one sequence and came at me from a completely different and unexpected angle. I, I did? I didn't really mean to. That's what made it such a potentially devastating move. You are letting the Force guide your blade now. You act without thought or reason. You're driven by passion, fury, anger, even hate. Your saber has become an extension of the dark side. I still couldn't get past your defenses. Does the double-bladed lightsaber give you an advantage? It does, but not in the way you believe. As you already know, the Force is the real key to victory in any confrontation. However, the equation is not so simple. Someone well-trained in lightsaber combat can defeat an opponent who is strong in the Force. The Force allows you to anticipate your opponent's moves and counter them with your own. But... The more options your foe has available, the more difficult it is to predict which will be chosen. So the double-bladed lightsaber simply gives you more options? No, but you think it does, so the effect is the same. I still don't quite understand, Master. You know the single-bladed lightsaber well. You use it yourself, and you've seen most of the other apprentices use it as well. My double-bladed weapon seems strange to you, unfamiliar. You don't fully understand what it can and cannot do. In combat, your mind tries to keep track of each blade separately, effectively doubling the number of possibilities. But the two blades are connected. By knowing the location of one, you are automatically aware of the location of the other. In actual practice, the double-bladed lightsaber is more limited than the traditional lightsaber. It can do more damage, but it is less precise. It requires longer sweeping movements that don't transition well into quick stabs and thrusts. Because the weapon is difficult to master, however, few among the Jedi or even the Sith understand it. They don't know how to attack or defend effectively against it. That gives those of us who use it an advantage over most of our opponents. Like Githani's whip. Exactly. The energy whip is far less efficient than any of the lightsaber blades. However, nobody ever practices against a whip. Githani knows that their enemy's confusion, being confronted with the whip, gives her an edge. By telling me the secrets, you've given up your advantage. Only to a small degree. You now understand why an exotic weapon or unfamiliar style will be more difficult to defend against. But until you become an expert in a particular style, in the heat of combat, your mind will still struggle to grasp its limitations. So by studying different styles, I could negate the advantage? In theory, but time spent studying other styles is time spent away from mastering your own form. Your best progress will come from focusing more on yourself and less on your opponent. Then why even bother telling me all this? Knowledge is power, Bane. My purpose is to give you that knowledge. It is up to you to figure out how best to use it. Bane's progress was clear to Lord Kasim. His turn implied he was impressed. However, Bane was still struggling to understand many of the basic concepts that the masters were teaching. With all his newfound knowledge, and from everything he had learned in the library so far, they knew that the weak must serve the strong. But this contradicted Khan and his brotherhood. He claims that they are all equals and are all worthy of the rank of Dark Lord. Ben continued to struggle with how Khan's brotherhood was indirectly a mockery to the original Sith traditions. Equality is a lie. A myth to appease the masses. It's a chain that needed to be broken. If all are equal, then none can be strong, he thought to himself. Regardless, 
Ben reports to the Sith library so he may study with Giffany in private. Very good, Bane. That's enough for today. <sighs> I've never felt anything like that before. It's a remarkable sensation, but you must be careful not to lose yourself in it. You must maintain control, or you could find yourself swept up in the storm along with your enemies. We better clean this up before somebody sees this and wonders what happened in here. <sighs> I'm exhausted. That feels nice. Where did you learn this? Working in the Cartosis mind teaches you a lot about aches and pains. You asked me once why I left the Jedi. I never told you, did I? We all have things in our past we'd rather not visit. I figured you'd tell me when you were ready. My master was a Cathar, Master Handa. I studied under him for almost as long as I can remember. My parents gave me over to the Order when I was just a toddler. I've heard the Jedi care little for the bonds that hold families together. They only care about the Force. Worldly attachments, friends, family, lovers. They cloud the mind with emotion and passion. <laughs> passion leads to the dark side. Oh, so I've heard. It wasn't a joke to the Jedi, especially to Master Handa. The Cathar are known as a hot-blooded species. He was always warning me and Kiel about giving in to our emotions. Kiel? Kiel Chani, another of Handa's Padawans. We often trained together. He was only a year older than me. Another Katha? No. Kiel was human. Over the years, we became close. Very close. Kiel and I were lovers. The Jedi are forbidden from forming such attachments. Masters fear it will cloud the mind with dangerous emotions. Were you really attracted to him, or just the idea of disobeying your master? A bit of both, perhaps. He was handsome enough, strong in the Force. There was an undeniable attraction. Once we became lovers, it didn't take long for Master Handa to find out. Despite all his teaching about controlling emotion, I could tell he was furious. He commanded us to set our feelings aside and forbade us from continuing our relationship. Did he really think it would be that simple? The Jedi see emotion as part of our bestial nature. They believe we must transcend our baser instincts. But I know passion is what makes us strong. The Jedi only fear it because it makes their Padawans unpredictable and difficult to control. Master Handa's reaction made me realize the truth. Everything the Jedi believed about the Force was a perversion of reality. A lie. I finally understood I would never reach my full potential under Master Handa. That was the moment I turned my back on the Order and began planning my defection to the Sith. What about Kyochani? I asked him to come with me. I told him we had a choice to make. The Jedi or each other. He chose the Jedi. Is he dead? <laughs> Did I kill him, do you mean? No. He was still alive the last I heard. He may have died battling the Sith on Rusan since then, but I didn't feel the urge to kill him myself. Then I guess your feelings for him weren't as strong as you thought. When you finally betray me, I hope you care enough to try to kill me yourself. I'm sorry, Githani. It was just a joke. I didn't mean to upset you. I opened up a painful part of my past, Bane. It's not something I want to make light of. You're right, I... I'll go. In his most recent lesson with Giffany, Bane had learned how to use and channel the power of Force Lightning. In just his first attempt, he had been able to summon a grand vortex of electricity that messed up the library assemblance. After putting things back together, Bane unintentionally offends Giffany with a mild jerk. However, she was in no mood for humor. The next day, during early hours of the morning, Bane and Kasim were once again sparring atop the academy's roof. Bane was able to keep up with the Blade Master now. Kasim used a double bladed weapon, just like Sirak. Now that he had spent so much time sparring against Kasim, Bane was more than sure he could defeat Sirak in the ring now. During their session, 
Ben had realized the fight was over and yielded to his opponents. He saw no point in continuing the fight any longer. The Blade Master was surprised by this decision, but he still respected it. Kasim thought Ben would continue fighting in the name of honor and glory. However, Ben countered with a quote from a book written by Darth Revan. Honor is a fool's prize. Glory is of no use to the dead. Kasim did not recognize the quote, but still commended his apprentice for speaking words of wisdom. An ironic twist, Ben had subtly taught his mentor something new, yet his mentor, for some reason, did not have the capacity to recognize it and absorb it. After the session is over, Ben takes the opportunity to ask his mentor about why the Sith no longer use the Darth title. Master, why don't the Sith use the Darth title anymore? It was Lord Carden's decision. The Darth title is a relic of the past. It represents what the Sith once were, not what we are now. There has to be more to it than that. Lord Khan wouldn't throw out the ancient traditions without justification. I see you won't be satisfied with the easy answer. <sighs> Very well. To understand why the title is no longer used, you must understand what it truly represents. The Darth title was more than a symbol of power. It was a claim of supremacy. It was used by those Dark Lords who looked to enforce their will on the other masters. It was a challenge, a warning to bow down or be destroyed. Of course, few of the Dark Lords would ever submit to another's will for very long. Wherever one of our order took up the Darth title, deception and betrayal were always close at hand to snatch it away. There can be no peace for a master who dares use the Darth name. Peace is a lie. It is only passion. Peace was a poor choice of words. What I meant was stability. Those masters who used the Darth title spent as much time guarding against their supposed allies as they did battling the Jedi. Khan wanted to put an end to such wastefulness. Khan wants us to focus all our resources on our true enemy instead of one another. That is why we are all equals in the Brotherhood of Darkness. Equality is a myth to protect the weak. Some of us are strong in the Force. Others are not. Only a fool believes otherwise. There are... Other reasons the Darth title was abandoned. It attracted the attention of the Jedi for one. It revealed our leaders to the enemy. It gave them easy targets to eliminate. Forgive me, Lord Kasim. I meant no offense. I only sought to draw upon your wisdom to explain that, which I could not explain myself. So now, do you see the wisdom behind Lord Khan's decision to end the tradition? Of course. Ben had lied to the Blade Master. He still didn't understand, nor could he accept why Lord Khan no longer allowed the use of the Darth title. It didn't matter if any of the Dark Lords used the title, the Jedi would still know who their leaders are. So that didn't make sense. From Ben's perspective, it was almost as if Kasim was trying to convince himself, as much as he was Bain. Slowly, Bain began to realize that what the Sith are today is not what the Sith used to be in years past. Previous Dark Lords had ruled over their minions with an iron fist. Power and authority was not just merely granted to those who did not deserve it. Power must be seized by those worthy enough to take it. In time, Bane would realize that the lessons the Masters teach directly contradict what the ancient texts speak of. Later in the day, Bane meets with Giffany in the archives once again. She attempts to manipulate Bane into challenging Sirak in the dueling ring, but Bane has his own plan. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to challenge him in the dueling ring. What? Don't be stupid, Githani. He'll destroy you. I have no choice, Bane. 
I already told you, I don't believe in the legend of the Sith Ari. Sirak may be the top student in the school, but he's not invincible. He may not be the Sith Ari, but he's still too strong for you. You can't face him in the dueling ring, Gitani. I've studied him. I know how good he is. You can't beat him. What other choice is there? We have to destroy him. And the only way is by facing him in the dueling ring. You can't face Shirak in the ring. But I can. What? He beat you nearly half to death last time. He'll kill you for sure this time. This time I intend to win. What's going on, Bane? I've been training with Lord Kasim. In secret. I don't like being played for a fool, Bane. Neither do I. I'm not stupid, Githani. I know what you wanted from me. I know what you expected me to say. I will get my revenge on Sirak, but I'm taking my own path. When? Tomorrow morning. Just as you said you were going to. <laughs> but you knew I wasn't serious. And you know I am. You don't have to worry, nobody will know you were involved. That's not what I'm worried about. Good luck, Bane. Be careful. I will. During the next group lesson atop the temple's roof, Githany avoids speaking with Bane. Throughout the entire lesson, Bane focuses on channeling his dark side energy, seething and lusting for revenge against Sirak for what he did to him. By the time the lesson ended, Bane's anger had become white, hot, rage. The rain pours down over the students, drenching everyone's long robes. Bane removes his robe, revealing his hulking physique and muscles. Then, he steps into the ring. Sirak, I challenge you! Bane was victorious. He had allowed Sirak to believe he wasn't a threat. He toyed with him and lulled him into a false sense of security. More than once, Bane saw an opportunity to strike Sirak and win the duel. After all, to win, he only needed to hit him once. The Pelka Venom would do the rest. He allowed the fight to go on for many minutes. Bane eventually noticed that Sirak had no real experience in long, drawn out fights. No one was ever able to test him like Bane was right now. Time and time again, Bane had to pull back from landing a critical blow, until his rage peaked and his power boiled over. In the very last minute, Bane embraces the dark side and uses it to enhance his speed and power. Like a blur, he moved towards Sirak and disarmed him. He then crushed his forearm with the training saber and spun around to deliver a second blow to his leg. His shin burn protruded through his flesh, and Sirak writhed in pain. Bane slowly feasts on the moment, forging and bloating his power, hesitating enough to give Kasim time to intervene. That's enough! It's over, Bane. You have witnessed an amazing victory. Bane's triumph was as much a result of his brilliant strategy as his superior skill. He was patient and careful. He did not just want to defeat his opponent, he wanted to destroy him. He achieved Dune Mok, not because he was better than Sirak, but because he was smarter. Let this be a lesson to you all, that secrecy can be your greatest weapon. Keep your true strength hidden until you are ready to unleash the killing blow. Ben picked up his soaking wet robe and began descending the temple steps. However, Githany was not amused by Bane's mercy. She runs after him down the halls. What happened up there? Why didn't you kill him? He sent me to the back to tank back in our first duel. I've done the same to him. That's vengeance. That's foolish. You think Cyrex just going to forget about this? He'll come after you again, Bane. Just like you came after him, that's the way this works. You missed your chance to put a permanent end to this rivalry, and I want to know why. My blade was raised with a killing blow. Lord Kasim stepped in before I could finish Shirak off. The masters don't want one of their top students to end up dead. No, your blade was raised because Kasim didn't stop you. You hesitated. Something held you back. I have already killed one foe in the ring. Cordis chastised me for Farag's death. He warned me not to let it happen again. I suppose I was... 
Worried about what the masters would do to me if I killed another apprentice. I thought we finally stopped lying to each other, Bane. You couldn't do it. You felt the dark side swallowing you up, and you pulled back. You're wrong. I retreated from the dark side after I killed Vorhark. I know how that felt. This is different. You still aren't willing to give yourself fully to the dark side. Cyrax showed weakness, and you showed him mercy. That's not the way of the Sith. What do you know of the ways of the Sith? I'm the one who's read the ancient texts. Not you. You are stuck learning from masters who have forgotten their past. Where in the ancient texts does it say to show compassion to a fallen enemy? Or just angry because your plan fell apart. For the rest of the day, Bane struggled to come to terms with why he hesitated during the fight. He had the opportunity to kill Sirak, but he knew that the masters would not approve of it. He knew that the Brotherhood were equals and killing each other was no longer the way of the Sith, except the weak must serve the strong. It was a fundamental creed of the Sith. If killing Sirak was what Bane desired, then why should he allow others to make him think that killing is wrong? He wondered whether or not Githany was right. Sirak would likely look for vengeance now. It was the way of the dark side. This meant that Sirak would forever be a threat unless Bane destroyed him. In the late hours of the night, Bane was awoken by a knock at the door. The Blademaster Kasim had come to visit him. He entered Bane's room and reveals a lightsaber in his hand. At first, Bane thought it was Kasim's weapon. However, the handle was too short to be a double-bladed weapon. It also had a slight curve in the hilt. I have something for you. <laughs> This was the weapon of my master. As a young child, I would watch for hours as my master performed his drills. My earliest memories are of dancing ruby lights moving through the sequences of battle. You don't remember your parents? My parents were sold in the slave markets of Nalhutta. That's where Master Nadars found me. He noticed my family on the auction blocks. Perhaps he was drawn to us because we were Twi'leks like himself. Even though I was barely old enough to stand, Master Nadars could sense the force in me. He purchased me and took me back to Ryloth to raise me as his apprentice among our own people. What happened to your parents? I don't know. They had no special connection to the force, so my master saw no reason to purchase them. They were weak, and so they were left behind. My master was a great Sith Lord. He was particularly adept in the arts of lightsaber combat, a skill he passed on to me. He taught me how to use the double-bladed lightsaber, although, as you can see, he preferred a more traditional design for himself. Except for the handle, of course. Hmm. It feels strange. It requires a minor variation in your grip. Hold it more in the palm, further away from the fingertips. Some moves are more difficult with this particular weapon, but many others are far more effective. In the end, I think you'll find this lightsaber will suit your... personal style quite well. You're giving this to me? Today you proved you were worthy of it. Does Cordis approve? The decision is mine, not his. I haven't held onto this blade for ten years just so Cordis can decide who I can give it to. Your master gave you this when he died? I took it when I killed him. I had learned everything I could from Master Nadars. As strong as he was in the dark side, I was stronger. As skilled as he was with the lightsaber, I became better. But why kill him? A test. To see if I was as strong as I believed. This was before Lord Khan rose to power. We were still trapped in the old ways. Sith versus Sith. Master versus Apprentice. Foolishly pitting ourselves against one another to prove our dominance. Fortunately, the Brotherhood of Darkness put an end to all that. Not completely. The weak still fall to the strong. It's inevitable. Don't allow yourself to be blinded by this honor. 
You are not ready to challenge me, young apprentice. I have taught you everything you know, but I have not taught you everything I know. I will keep that in mind, Master. Lord Cordis wants to see you first thing in the morning. Go to his quarters before the morning drills. Lord Kasim had gifted Ben a weapon of his former master, a carved hilt lightsaber with a ruby red blade. This was Ben's reward for defeating the top students of the academy and proving to Kasim that he was worthy of wielding such a devastating weapon. The very next morning, Ben reports to Lord Cordis as he was instructed. He wasn't sure why Cordis had asked to see him, but he wasn't afraid of the overseer, so he makes his way there and knocks on the door a single time. Enter. Master. I see you have a lightsaber on your belt. Lord Cassim gave it to me. He thought I earned it due to my latest victory in the ring. I have no wish to contradict the Blade Master. However, now you carry a lightsaber, do not forget that you are still an apprentice. You still owe your obedience and allegiance to the Masters of this Academy. Of course, Lord Goddess. The way you have defeated Sirak has left quite an impression on the other students. They will look to emulate you now. You must set an example for them. I will do my best, Master. That means your private sessions with Githany must end. You know? I am a Sith Lord and Master of this Academy. I am no fool, I am not blind to what happens within the walls of this temple. I tolerate such behavior when you are an outcast because it did no harm to the other apprentices. Now, however, many of these students will be watching. I do not want them following your path and trying to train one another in a misguided attempt to duplicate your success. What will happen to Githani? Will she be punished? I will speak with her. Just as I am speaking with you, it must be made clear to the other apprentices that the two of you are not training in private. That means you cannot see her anymore. You must avoid all contact except in group sessions. If you both obey this, there will be no further consequences. That is not all. You must also put an end to your study in the archives. Why? The manuscripts contain the wisdom of the ancient Sith. I've learned much about the dark side from them. The archives are relics of the past. They are from a time that has long since vanished. The order has changed. We have evolved beyond what you have learned from those musty scrolls and tomes. You would understand this if you had been studying with the masters instead of rushing off on your own path. The Sith may have changed, but we can still build on the knowledge of those that came before us, Master. Y you must understand that. Why else would you build this academy on Korriban? The dark side is strong of this world. That is the only reason we choose to come here. But what about the Valley of the Dark Lords? What about the tombs of all the Dark Masters buried on Korriban? And the secrets hidden inside them? <laughs> is that what you seek? The secrets of the dead? The Jedi pillaged the tombs when Korriban fell to them 3,000 years ago. Nothing of value remains. The Jedi are the servants of the light. The dark side has secrets they will never understand. There may be something they missed. Are you really so naive? The spirits of powerful Sith Masters are said to linger in their tombs. They appear only to those who are worthy. They would not have revealed themselves to the Jedi. Do you really believe ghosts and spirits still linger in their graves, waiting to pass on the great mysteries of the dark side to those who seek them out? Yes. I believe I can learn more from the ghosts in the Valley of the Dark Lords than the living masters here at the Academy. You are an impudent fool. You worship those that are dead and gone. You think they hold some great power, but they are nothing but dust and bones. You're wrong. Get out. If you value the wisdom of the dead so much, then go. Leave the temple. Go to the Valley of the Sith Lords. Find your answers in their tombs. What in blazes did you do, Cordis? I assume you are referring to Apprentice Bane. Of course I triving mean Bane. No more games, Cordis. What did you do to him? To him? Nothing. Not in the way you're thinking. I merely tried to reason with him. I tried to make him understand the necessity of working in the structure of this institution. 
You manipulated him. You twisted his mind somehow. You forced him down a path you wanted him to take. The path of ruin. Why, Cordis? Bane brought this on himself. He was willful, obsessed with the past. He is of no use to us until he accepts the teachings of this academy. Tell me what happened, Cordis. Where is Bane now? He's gone into the wastelands. He's heading for the Valley of the Dark Lords. What? Why would he do that? I told you. He is obsessed with the past. He believes there is secrets out there that will be revealed to him. Secrets of the dark side. Did you warn him of the dangers? The Pelko swarms, the Dukata? He never gave me the chance. He wouldn't have listened anyway. He's going to survive. He's stronger than you know. If he survives, he will learn the truth. There are no secrets in the valley. Not anymore. Everything of value has been taken, stripped away first by the Sith to preserve our order, later by the Jedi seeking to wipe it out. There is nothing left in the tombs but hollow chambers and mounds of dust. Once he sees that for himself, he will give up his foolish idealization of the ancient Sith. Only then will he be ready to join the Brotherhood of Darkness. Bane could no longer listen to the wisdom of the Masters at the Academy. He knew deep down that the Sith had become a mockery of what it used to be. He was determined to find answers within the Valley of the Dark Lords, so he ventures there in isolation. When he finally arrived at the valley, he walks over to what is clearly the entrance of an ancient tomb. The carvings and doorwork were tarnished by time, Ben certainly wasn't the first person to come here. He enters the tomb and finds the core deep within. An empty sarcophagus lay in the middle of the room. The tomb was barren, deserted. It looked too empty, in Bane's opinion. He looked around the room, hoping to at least find the remains of the Dark Lord laid to rest here, but there was nothing. He called out and his voice echoed across the stone walls. No voice returned his calls. No dark side masters appeared in ghostly forms to offer advice or knowledge. The past was dead. However, this revelation did not encourage the new teachings of the Sith for him. It only bolstered his belief that the current Sith have so lost their way that not even the Dark Lords of the past wish to linger in their tombs anymore. Oriban was no longer a place of grand power. The Dark Side no longer flowed through its core as it once did. The Brotherhood and their pathetic new code of equality have tainted the Sith Order and weakened them as a whole. This made Lord Khan and all the other masters traitors to the true Sith. Bane would not be fooled. He would not bow down to the will of Lord Khan and his brotherhood. It had been weeks since he left the academy. He survived without food or water due to his immense power in the force. However, he was now beginning to feel the effects of dehydration and hunger. Bane returns to the Sith Academy and immediately visits the kitchen area to eat his fill of food and quench his hunger. Then, the veil of fatigue falls over him. So he travels to his room and throws himself on the bed and falls into a deep slumber. Welcome back, Bane. I trust your journey was educational. I hope you understand now why I let you go. This was the final phase of your training. You have to understand why we have abandoned the old ways. This is a new age, and you could understand that only once you recognize the old age is truly gone. Now that you have learned that final lesson, the academy has nothing left to teach you. You are no longer an apprentice, Bane. You are now fit to join the ranks of the masters. You are now a dark lord of the Sith. I know Lord Kasim has already gifted you a lightsaber. I too have a gift for you. Take it, Lord Bane. This synthetic crystal is stronger than the one powering your lightsaber now and it is much stronger than the natural crystals the Jedi use to power their own weapons. The timing of your return from the wastes couldn't have been better. We are making preparations to leave Korriban. Lord Khan has need for us on Rusan. All of the Sith must be united in the Brotherhood of Darkness if we are to defeat the Jedi. The Brotherhood will fall. Khan does not understand the dark side. He is leading you down the path of ruin. 
Some might consider that talk to be treason, Lord Bane. You would do well to keep such ideas to yourself in the future. You may be a Dark Lord now, Bane, but there is still much about the Dark Side you do not understand. Join the Brotherhood, and we can teach you what we know. Reject us and you will never find what you seek. Cordis had visited Bane to inform him that the students of Corriban have now all been granted the rank of Dark Lord. They were now fit to join the Masters in the Brotherhood. Lord Khan was requesting that all the Masters and new Sith Lords should join them on the world of Rusan. He claimed victory over the Jedi was imminent. However, Bane did not desire to follow the Brotherhood, and for now, he still needed to sleep. Before long, another knock at the door had awoken Bane, except this time, it was a face he could appreciate. Can I come in? Why are you here? Why did you leave? It's, uh... It's hard to explain. You are right about what happened with Shirek. I should have finished him, but I didn't. I was foolish and weak. I didn't want to admit that to you. You left the academy so you wouldn't have to face me? No. I didn't leave because of you. I left because you were the only one who recognized my failing. Everyone else congratulated me for my great victory because Cassim, Cordis, everyone, they were blind to the true nature of the dark side. They were as blind as I had been, till you opened my eyes. I left because the academy has nothing more to offer me. I went to the Valley of the Dark Lords, hoping to find the answers I couldn't find here. And you never thought to come tell me all this? I should have come to you. I acted irrationally. I let my anger of Cordis drive me away. I answered your question. Now you answer mine. Why are you here? Not here. I have something to show you in the archives. Yathane, what's going on? Why did you follow me, Bane? How could you be so stupid? Didn't you realize you were walking right into a trap? Is this what you want, Githani? She wants what all Sith want. Power. Victory. She knows to side with the strong. I'm stronger than he is. I proved that in the dueling ring. There is more to power than physical prowess. Strength means more than just the ability to use the Force. It means intelligence, cunning, ruthlessness. You know how easily I defeated you in the ring? Are you so certain you can defeat me now? Four against one, Bane. And you left your lightsaber back for chambers. I like those odds. <laughs> this fool actually believes you brought me here for his sake. We both know why you brought me here, Kathani. You don't want to side with Sirak. You've been plotting ways to get me to kill him ever since you first arrived. Enough! Githany had Lord Bane to the library, so Sirak and his friends could ambush him. However, every single one of them underestimated Bane. As it would turn out, Githany had actually picked up Bane's lightsaber back in his room and brought it with her. As Sirak lunges in after Bane, she throws him his weapon so he can defend himself. In the moment, Githany chose Bane to be her ally. She ignites her energy whip and assists Bane in the battle. After Sirak's friends were defeated first, Bane approaches the helpless Sabrak, listens to him beg for his life. Please, Bane, I yield. End it now, Bane. Listen to me. I'll serve you. I'll do anything you command. You can use me. I can help you. Please, Bane, have mercy. Those who ask for mercy are too weak to deserve it. I, of all people, should have known better than to underestimate you. You saw me take the lightsaber, that's why you followed me. No, I didn't see anything. I was just guessing. <laughs> you never cease to amaze me, Lord Bane. Don't call me that. Why not? Quartus has given all the students the rank of Dark Lord. Bane, we are going to fight the Jedi. We are going to join Lord Khan's Brotherhood of Darkness. Khan is a fool, Gathani. You've never even met Lord Khan. I have. He's a great man. A man of vision. He's as blind as an Orkelian cave slug. The Brotherhood of Darkness, this academy, 
Everything the Sith have become is a monument to his ignorance. Come with me. There is nothing left for us on Korriban, and only death on Rusan. But I know somewhere else we can go. A place where the dark side is still strong. Lord Khan has united the Sith in a single glorious cause. We can join them on Rusan. Then go. Join the others on Rusan. Be united with them in their demise. Wait! Bane, wait! <laughs> what is the meaning of this? Did you send Sirak to kill me? What? Why, did something happen to Sirak? I killed him. Ivra and Loke too. Their bodies are in the archives. You did this on the eve of our departure of Rusan? You can go to Rusan. I will have nothing to do with the Brotherhood of Darkness. You are a student of this academy. You will do as you are told. I am a Dark Lord of the Sith. I serve none but myself. We leave for Rusan tomorrow, Lord Bane. You will be coming with us. This is not a matter for discussion. I'm leaving tonight, and none of you here is strong enough to stop me. Someone here told me that we no longer use the Darth title because it promoted rivalry among the Sith. Gave the Jedi an easy target. It was easier to just abandon the custom, to have all the Sith Masters use the title of Dark Lord. But I know the truth, Cordis. I know why none of you claim that title for yourself. Fear. You're cowards. None of the Brotherhood is worthy of the Darth title. Least of all you. Don't go. Let's talk about this. If you just meet with Khan, you'll understand. That's all I ask, Bane. It's Darth Bane. Enough was enough. Tiresome of the blasphemy the Masters preach, Bane declares himself a Darth of the Sith, a declaration of his immense power and will over others. He refused to bend the knee to Lord Khan and follow along like some useless puppets. Giffany had refused to join Bane, she was adamant on joining the other Sith Lords on Rusan. Bane knew Khan's brotherhood would fail. Already many worlds they had captured had been retaken by the Republic, while Khan is distracted with the Army of Light. During his studies of the Sith archives, Ben had heard mention of the world Lehon, also known as Rakata Prime, the homeworld of the ancient Rakatan species that once ruled over the galaxy. This was the destination Bane would go next. After announcing himself as Darth Bane to the others, he leaves the academy and steals the personal starship of Cordis, the Valsen, a T-class long-range cruiser. It had been gifted to Cordis the day before, a present from Lord Khan. Now it belonged to Bane. He boarded the starship and used the basic flight training he learned back in the military to navigate to the world of Lehon. When Darth Bane arrives, he could feel the imprint of the past. Visibly, the world was a graveyard for what could be called the greatest defeat of the Sith. Remnants of freighters and the Starforge still orbited the planets. Bane landed on the surface safely. When he leaves his ship, a rancor appears from the tree line. It had heard Bane's ship touch down and was prepared to fight on its territory. As the giant beast charged toward the Sith Lord, he simply stood his ground. He reaches out a hand and using the force he touches the Rancor's mind, dominating it, bending its will to serve him. Not only that, Bane seeked the source of the dark side presence on this world. He knew the creature had likely seen it before, so he delved into its memories, forcing it to recall the ancient Rakatan Temple. Without a doubt, Bane knew this would be the location of the planet's source of power. He could feel the dark side pulsing through the veins of the world. Its presence was far superior than what Korriban had to offer. Bane mounts the Rancor and uses it to transport him to the ancient temple. When they arrived, he didn't kill the beast. There was no purpose in its death. He allowed the Rancor to retreat into the forest. The ancient Rakatan temple stood tall and withered. The forest around it had created an empty circular perimeter, almost as if the trees were too afraid to grow close to the temple. There was no one else around, any sign of intelligent life died long ago. Without any resistance, Darth Bane enters the ancient temple and searches high and low for anything of value to him. He didn't seek treasures or riches, his goal was simple, knowledge. He knew the current Sith Order was a failure. He needed to seek enlightenment about the situation. A rigorous search came up with nothing. 
but as Ben explored the upper levels, he felt the presence of the dark side grow stronger. His eyes were drawn to the far stern wall, not too far from a damaged computer terminal. As he approaches the wall, he sees a faint purple glow. Reaching out with the force, Ben connects with the glowing light and it reveals a treasure behind the stern block. This was no ordinary treasure. When he pulls his reward out from the hole, he sees a small pyramid shaped device in his hand. It was a holocron. Ben was familiar with a holocron and what they were used for. However, the one he held now was one of far more significance than what he'd seen on Korriban. This device was smooth and had no text or symbols etched into its surface. Usually, a holocron would have some kind of Sith facade. Ben wondered whether or not this holocron he found perhaps predated even the ancient Sith. He sits on the cold ground and begins to eagerly channel his energy into the holocron. The device came to life with a flicker of lights. A small hollow projection appeared before Ben. It was a man wearing a dark hooded robe. When he spoke, his voice was crisp and clear. I am Darth Revan, Dark Lord of the Sith. The halls below and above reverberated with Ben's booming victorious laughter. <laughs> Those who use the dark side are also bound to serve it. To understand this is to understand the underlying philosophy of the Sith. The dark side offers power for power's sake. You must crave it, covet it. You must seek power above all else. With no reservation or hesitation, the Force will change you. It will transform you. Some fear this change. The teachings of the Jedi are focused on fighting and controlling this transformation. That is why those who serve the light are limited in what they can accomplish. True power can only come to those who embrace the transformation. There can be no compromise, mercy, loyalty, compassion. All these things will prevent you from claiming what is rightfully yours. Those who follow the dark side must cast aside these conceits. Those who do not, those who try to walk the path of moderation will fail, dragged down by their own weakness. Those who accept the power of the dark side must also accept the challenge of holding on to it. By its very nature, the dark side invites rivalry and strife. This is the greatest strength of the Sith. It culls the weak from our order. Yet this rivalry can also be our greatest weakness. The strong must be careful, lest they become overwhelmed by the ambitions of those beneath them, working in consort. Any master who instructs more than one apprentice in the ways of the dark side is a fool. In time, the apprentices will unite their strength and overthrow the master. It's inevitable, axiomatic. That is why each master must have only one student. This is also the reason there can only be one dark lord. The Sith must be ruled by a single leader, the very embodiment of the strength and the power of the dark side. If the leader grows weak, another must rise to seize the mantle. The strong rule, the weak are made to serve. This is the way it must be. My time here has ended. Take what I have taught you and use it well. Darth Revan, one of the only Sith Lords who came the closest to defeating the Republic, all of his knowledge and power now belonged to Bain. He spent the next few days carefully studying the Holocron and listening to the wisdom of the Gatekeeper. Through Revan, Bain had found the clarity he was searching for. The Sith must be ruled by a single leader. This was what Revan had said. Also, Revan had said each master must have one student. He remembered being passed around from class to class like a child on Korriban. Everything the Brotherhood had become was a great treason against the ancient Sith. The crystal that powered Revan's holocron was flawed. Because of this, its lifespan was fairly short. The moment it winked its last projection, Bane discarded it and crushed it using the power of the Force. He then meditated, seeking further enlightenment upon Revan's wisdom. Then, it came to him. It was his duty, no, his destiny, to destroy Lord Khan and his brotherhood and return the Sith to the path of vengeance. He would wash away the brotherhood like a dirty stain on the history of the Sith. 
Then, he would rebuild the Sith Order in his own image and one day bring vengeance upon the Jedi and ultimate victory for the Sith. Through Revan's holocron, Bane had learned many dark side rituals. He discovered a lethal and terrifying power known as the Thought Bomb. Using such a thing would result in the death of all nearby Force users. Using this weapon, Bane could eradicate the Brotherhood and make the Jedi think that the Sith were extinct. He could then rebuild in the shadows, creating a legacy that would endure through the centuries. At first he thought he could rule over the Sith by himself. One lone Sith master who embodied all the Sith and all the power, but he quickly dismissed that idea. Eventually, each master would die. It was inevitable. It was the way of the dark side. But if the Sith numbered exactly two, he could train a chosen apprentice and pass on all his knowledge. This in turn would strengthen the Sith as a whole, while at the same time ending the opportunity for Sith infighting. The rule of two, one to embody the power, the other crave it. This was the knowledge that would bring the Sith Order into a new age. The revelation that would change the galaxy forever. The old ways would be swept away. Khan and his brotherhood would be annihilated and Burn would be the one to do it. The only thing he wondered now is who could be his apprentice. Bane! I come with an invitation from Lord Khan. How did you find me? Lord Khan told me where you were. Once I arrived, I simply followed the beacon on your ship. Did Khan send you to kill me? If you do not join the Brotherhood, I will leave your corpse on this barren and forgotten world. Barren? How can you say that? The dark side is strong here, far stronger than it ever was on Korriban. This is where we will find the power to destroy the Jedi, not in Khan's Brotherhood. Korriban was once a place of great power too. Over the centuries, thousands of Sith have explored its secrets, and none of them ever discovered any great strategy to defeat our enemies. It is time to end this foolish quest, Bane. The old ways have failed, the Jedi defeated those who followed them, Exar Kun, Darth Revan. They all lost. We have to find a new philosophy if we want to defeat them. Khan understands this. That is why he created the Brotherhood. The Brotherhood is the future of the dark side. Khan is wrong. I will never follow him. I will never join the Brotherhood. <sighs> then your life ends here. <laughs> You're better than you were when we last fought. So are you. The Sith Lords begin their fight, former master and apprentice, now enemies. Kasim shows Bane the true speed and power of his own abilities. However, Darth Bane, with his most recent revelations, could feel the dark side coursing through his being like a raging inferno. He deflects Kasim's attacks and prepares his own assaults. However, just as Bane seems to take the advantage, the Blade Master twists the hilt of his double-bladed weapon, and it turns into two single-bladed weapons. Back at the Academy, Kasim had told the other students that this saber style was dangerous and flawed. Now, Bane understood the real truth. It was the Blade Master's secret weapon against his opponents. The unfamiliar style caught Bane completely off guard. Kasim was a perfect swordsman, he had spent his entire life perfecting the art of saber combat. Right now, he was proving his worth. They both fight until eventually Kasim uses the force to push Bane outside of the temple. Kasim approaches the steps and yells out to Darth Bane. You should have killed me when you had the chance. I will follow wherever you run. Wherever you go, I will eventually find you and kill you. Don't live your life in fear, Bane. Better to end it now. I agree.
Using the dark side energy that was boiling within, Darth Bane collapsed the Rakatan temple around Kasim and buried him in the dust and rubble. He was victorious over his former mentor. Darth Bane simply turned his back and walked away. When he returned to his starship on the beaches, he had thought up the next part of his plan. First, he would send a message drone to Lord Khan, explaining he is sorry for killing Kasim and hoping to join the Brotherhood. This was a lie, of course. Bane wanted the Brotherhood to think he was a friend. For now, in an effort to convince Khan of his friendship, Bane offers the knowledge of the Fort Bomb, something that will be important much later on for his plan to succeed. When Lord Khan received the message, he shared the news with Sith Lord Githany. When she heard the hollow message and saw the pathetic man that Bane was pretending to be, she offered to go meet with him and kill him. Githany uses the coordinates on the message drone and goes out to meet with Bane on the world of Ambria. Before she speaks with him, she coats her lips in poison that was intended for Bane. Githany. I was hoping Lord Khan would send you. He didn't send me. I asked to come. Did you see the message? I thought you were over this pain. Self-pity and regret are for the weak. You're right. You can't fool me, Bane. I think you're here for something else. Bane pulls Giffney in close and kisses her on the lips. <laughs> Magnificent. Through passions, we gain strength. I'm sorry for abandoning you. I was blinded by the dreams of past glory. Naga Sadao, Exar Kun, Darth Riven. I lusted after the power of the great lords of the past. We all crave power. That is the nature of the dark side. But there is power in brotherhood. Khan is on the verge of succeeding, where all of those before him have failed. We are winning on Rusan, Bane. Khan may be winning on Rusan. But his followers are losing everywhere else. His great Sith army has crumbled without its leaders. The Republic has driven them back and claimed most of the worlds we conquered. In a few more months, the rebellion will be crushed. None of that matters if we can wipe out the Jedi. The war has taken a heavy toll on the Republic. Once the Jedi are gone, we can easily rally our troops and turn the tide of war. All we have to do is wipe them out, and ultimately, victory will be ours. All we have to do is win on Rusan. There are other Jedi besides those on Rusan. A few, but they are scattered in ones and twos across the galaxy. If the Army of Light is destroyed, we can hunt them down at our leisure. Do you really believe Lord Khan will win? He has claimed imminent victory before and failed on his promise. For one who claims to want to join the Brotherhood, you don't seem particularly devoted to the cause. You were right when you said I came back for something else. The Brotherhood cannot fail. The Jedi are on the run, hiding and cowering in the forest. I just can't accept what Lord Khan preaches. He says we are all equals. But if all are equal, then none can be strong. Do not believe everything Khan says. Once the Jedi are destroyed, many of his followers will discover that some of us are more equal than others. Ben pulls Giffney in again and kisses her passionately. I guess you accept. You pack up your camp, I'll go ahead to let Khan know you're coming. I can't wait to see the look on his face when you tell him about this meeting. Neither can I. Neither can I. Giffany leaves believing she had fooled Darth Bane. He had tasted the poison on Giffany's lips. He had even recognized it as rockwort venom. Through the lessons of Revan's holocron, Bane had learned how to survive toxins and mild poisons. No mere rockwort venom was about to fell the giant Sith Lord. However, Giffany had also used a mixture of Sinox poison. Before Bane could sense the more lethal poison, it started to take effect. His throat dried out, and it was hard to breathe. No. Red foam spilled from his mouth while his gut was the victim of a stabbing sensation. Bane's body began to fail, slowly. He knew that his life was in danger, and acting fast was required if he wanted to survive. 
he limped onto a nearby land crawler. He thrust it into drive and let it take him forward until he eventually found a family in the distance. Father and his two sons were farming. Bane could sense their presence. One of the small boys found Bane's lightsaber as it fell to the floor. The father saw the weapon and fear struck his heart faster than lightning could find metal. Bane knew he could feed upon the deaths of those around him to help sustain his life force until he could find professional help. He activates his saber using the force and kills the first small boy in cold blood. Oh, oh, oh! The father weeps as he is forced to watch while Bane rises and plunges his saber through his second son's heart. Ah! Feeding on the immense horror, Bane regathers his strength and strikes down the helpless father. The weak must serve the strong. He said to himself, this is the way it must be. Using the land crawler, he continued on the plains of Ambria until he came across another, yet smaller camp. The homeowner was a local known as the healer Khalib. Bane approached a man, yet he had no will to speak. The poison's hold was strong and soon, probably tomorrow, Bane would die. The healer refused to help him. He chose no sides in the ongoing war and certainly wouldn't help a murderer. However, the healer had a weakness. A daughter. Ben found her hiding in one of the tents. Using the force, he grabs the small girl and hovers her over the boiling cooking pot on the fire. The healer had no choice but to comply. He helped to heal Ben and within the next day, he was back to his normal self. Ben leaves the healer's camp and returns to his starship, where he plots his next plan of action. The next step was to join the other Sith Lords on Rusan. However, Khan and Githany had already tried to kill him, so when he arrives, he would be needing to make it clear that he was taking over. Otherwise, the others might suspect that he is up to something. Ultimately, he wanted to safeguard the destruction of the Sith Brotherhood. If he attended Rusan now, he could make sure events unfold the way he wants them to. He would manipulate Khan into using the fort bomb and destroying himself and everyone else around him at the same time. Bane arrives on Rusan and wanders through a recent battlefield. He sees a former student of the academy laid dying on the floor. The Sith Lord laid with his head leant against a rock. <coughs> Lord, Lord Bane? Han told us you were dead. Missed the fight. The battle is glorious. <laughs> Glory means nothing for the dead. Help me, Lord Bane. My name is Darth Bane. <clears throat> Darth Bane killed the pathetic Sith Lord, crushing his skull against a rock with nothing but his boot. He then continued on to the main Sith encampment. Currently, a meeting was taking place in the strategy tent. Lord Khan could be heard talking loudly with the others. Bane approaches the tent and his shadows loom over the hollow table. What now, Darth Bane? We, we thought you were dead. How I'm did tired. You? Do you mind if I sit? Of course. Anything for a brother. Thank you, brother. Please, sir, continue with your strategy. As I was saying, the Jedi are hiding in the forest. We can flush them out if we split our numbers. If we deploy our flyers, we can flank their southern lines. <sighs> Deploying flyers and flanking armies. You're thinking like a dirt general, not a Sith Lord. How did you ever find the guts to try to poison me? I... I uh, that wasn't me. Don't apologize for cunning and trickery. I admire you for it. We are Sith, servants of the dark side. Now look at this map. Think like a Sith. Don't just fight in the forest. Destroy the forest. And just how do you propose we do that? <laughs> I can show you. That's the dark side! The dark side is one! 
Indivisible! Give yourself over to the dark side. Let it surround you, engulf you, devour you. Do you feel invincible? Invulnerable? Immortal? Can you feel it? Are you ready to destroy a world? Using another ritual he had learned from Revan's Holocron, Bain was able to join the minds of the Sith Lords on Rusan and create a divine storm of force lightning that ripped and tore through the forest. Trees were burnt to ash and boulders were sent flying across the landscape. The indigenous wildlife known as bouncers were also caught in the blast. The storm forces the Jedi to leave their shelter in the forests. In the end, there was no forest. However, the ritual came at a great cost. It abruptly ended when Khan used his own powers of Force Inspiration to gather the Sith Lords for an attack against the now fleeing Jedi. Bane was furious that they had disconnected rather than continuing the chaos. They could have wiped out their army with the storm. Regardless, Bane knew that despite their morale and bravado, the Brotherhood would not defeat the Jedi. The Jedi always remain united in their cause against the dark side. This is why they always win, because their unification against a common foe grants them power. It's inevitable. While the Brotherhood departed to engage the Jedi, Bane remained at the camp and walked towards Lord Khan's personal tent. As he approached, Lord Cordis landed nearby on a flyer and greeted Darth Bane. You'll have no need for your weapon, Bane. I have come with an offer. An offer? What could you possibly have to offer me? My allegiance. Why would you give your allegiance to me? Why should I even want it? I am not blind, Lord Bane. I see you speaking with Kitani. I see how you are undermining Khan. I know the reason you have come to Rusan. What exactly are you proposing? I know what happened to Kasim. He sided with Khan against you. He paid for that decision with his life. I am not so foolish. I know you are here to take over the Brotherhood. I believe you will succeed, and I want to help you. You want to help me take over the Brotherhood? <laughs> Replace one leader with another, and you and the rest of your Brotherhood continue as before. That's your brilliant plan. I can prove to be quite useful to you, Lord Bane. Many of the Brotherhood are former students of my academy. They still look to me for guidance and wisdom. Therein lies the problem. Your wisdom has destroyed our order. You have polluted the minds of your followers. You and Khan have led them down the path of ruin. <laughs> Understand. That has always been the problem. The Brotherhood must be purged. The Sith must be destroyed and rebuilt. You, Khan, and all the others must be wiped from the face of the galaxy. That's why I have returned. <laughs> Please! Not, not like this! Release me! Let me throw my lightsaber! Let us fight like Sith. Surely you know I can kill you just as easily with my lightsaber as I could with the Force. I know. More honor in death by combat. Honor is for the living. Dead is dead. Lord Cordis was a fool for thinking that Darth Bane would entertain any scenario where they would be allies. Bane killed Cordis easily tearing through his defenses and seizing him in the air with the almighty power of the dark side. He crushed his throat and left his lifeless corpse to rot in the nearby bushes. The next part of Bane's plan was to interfere more so with Lord Khan. He needed Khan to believe Bane was a threat to his authority. Bane enters Khan's personal tent and uses the computer to relay orders to their fleet that is currently blockading the planet. He tells the fleet to engage the Republic. This in turn would mean the Jedi could send reinforcements to the ground. This only worked against the Brotherhood. 300 or more Jedi descended to the planet to bolster General Hoff's army. Khan had no option but to retreat back to base camp and question what went wrong. Back so soon, Khan. 
What happened to your glorious battle? Reinforcements. Somehow Farfalla found a way through our blockade. I told your fleet to engage the Jedi. But... why? I wanted all the Jedi here on Rusan at the same time. You blasted fool! Victory was ours! We had Hoth beaten! That is your goal. Not mine. I'm after a prize far greater than the death of General Hoth. He is but one man. <laughs> we all know what prize you seek, Darth Bane. You're here to take over the Brotherhood. If you lead them against the Jedi, then you lead them to their slaughter. <laughs> How quickly you've fallen into despair, Khan. It seemed only hours ago you were certain of victory. That was before Farfalla and his reinforcements arrived. Back when we had the advantages of numbers and air superiority. All that is gone thanks to you. We can't possibly defeat them now. I can. I know many rituals. Many secrets. And I have the strength to use them. The Fort Bomb. Your leadership has failed. Now I will take the Brotherhood down the path to victory. And what of me? You can swear your loyalty to me with all the others. Or you can die in this tent. Do you believe the others will follow you? They are still wary of you after the last ritual. The Brotherhood is about equality, not servitude. Asking the others to bow down before you will only drive them away, or turn them against you. How do you think the others will react when I tell them how you orchestrated the arrival of the Jedi reinforcements? Killing me won't keep your secrets. The others know you weren't at the battle when Farfalla's ships arrived. More than a few of them probably already suspect you of betraying them. You may be the strongest among us, but you can't defeat us all. Not by yourself. You're right. You're right. There's still hope, though. Follow me, and I will keep the others from turning against you. Join us in the Brotherhood. What about the Jedi? What about their gunships? We can nullify their air superiority by retreating into the caves. I know General Hoth. He will follow us. And there we will unleash the Fort Bomb against them. I will do as you say, Lord Khan. Together. We will destroy the Jedi. Unfortunately, there are still complications. Complications? I can convince the rest of the Brotherhood to forgive your treasonous acts. But only after the Jedi are destroyed. Until then, you will have to remain hidden from the others. I will lead the Brotherhood to the caves. I am strong enough to join their minds and unleash the power of the Fort Bomb without your help. You stay here in the tent until nightfall, then sneak out of the camp. Stay safely out of view until the deed is done. His plan was working. He had successfully deceived Lord Khan into thinking he was in control of the situation. All he needed to do now was simply wait, while Khan led the Brotherhood to their deaths. Just as he said, the entirety of the Brotherhood united and retreated into the caves. 100 Jedi, led by General Hoff himself, followed them into the depths. No one came out alive. Welcome, Lord Hoff. From a far and safe distance, Bane stood and reached out with the Force. No Sith had survived the ritual, not even Githany. Once, Bane had wondered whether or not Githany could be his apprentice. That was now no longer possible. The Fort Bomb didn't kill every Force user on the planet. The blast seemed to be concentrated in the area of the caves and the surface above. Bane was alone now the only remaining Sith and the new ruler of the Order. The Jedi would believe the Sith died here on Rusan. In secret, Darth Bane would rebuild the Order, strengthen it from within. Bane knew that to defeat the Jedi, 
they would need to use the tools of the dark side. Cunning, secrecy, patience. It could take decades or even centuries. Ben knew that he might not even live to see the day of the Republic's defeat, but the Sith would grow stronger, all thanks to him. So this video covers Darth Bane's unique perspective of the book trilogy. To understand how Darth Bane takes Zana as his apprentice, please check out our Darth Zana Explained video, as that is also a feature length production worthy of your time. Darth Bane discovers his apprentice on the world of Rusan, Rain, a small human female, no older than 9 or 10. She had previously killed two Jedi in revenge of her dead bouncer friend. When Bane saw this, he knew the Force was offering him an apprentice to fulfil his vision. He seizes the opportunity to take Zana as his apprentice. While still on the world of Rusan, Bane and Zana discover an old manuscript that once belonged to Lord Cordis. Not only did it include valuable banking clan codes, but it also held the location of Frieden Nard's tomb. The tomb was located on Duxon, and Bane ventured there alone while he tasked Zana with making her own way to Onderon. Bane crash landed on Duxon and broke his arm. He used his legs to hold it steady while he forced the bone back into place. When he was ready, he ventured on the surface until he discovered the tomb. While inside, Bane found himself in a similar situation to the tombs of Corriban. Friedenard's resting place had already been ransacked. There was nothing here left of value. Except Bane noticed a strange, pure black door. The door was no ordinary entrance. It was more like an ancient spell was hiding its existence. However, the spell was now so old that it was beginning to wear off. Bane builds his power and throws the stone slab blocking his way into the wall at the other side of the room. When he entered the newly exposed room, he saw a podium and a small device placed atop, a holocron. As Bane looks up, he sees a colony of bug-like creatures that scuttled and shifted across the ceiling. The moment he steps into the room, one of the bugs wriggles free and lands with a thud on the ground. A second comes crashing down and almost lands on Bane, but he ignites his saber and bats the strange critter away. Immediately, Bane realises he is in danger. His lightsaber had not harmed the creature at all. Its shell was made of some kind of lightsaber resistant material. He lunges for the holocron in the middle of the room, while at the same time, all the creatures come hailing down. He uses his lightsaber to wax them away. He uses the power of the force to throw the rest. Before he could escape the room with his prize, a creature had latched onto his shoulder and another to his chest. The bug sent searing acid into Bane's bloodstream, causing him to scream in agony. He refits the stone slab to the entrance, blocking off any other creatures. As he lay there, he heard the voices of Khan and Cordis, laughing and mocking him, goading him for failing the Sith and now to be defeated here on Duxon. Bane refused to let this be true. He found the will to stand and yelled out down the empty corridors. Go away! As if he wished it to be, the voices departed his mind. Ben then studied the holocron to learn the secrets of Frieden Nard. Ben had learned that the creatures he encountered were named Orbalisks. They were organisms capable of attaching with a host and enhancing their power like a multiplier. It also had healing capabilities, the power to give you stamina and other great benefits such as lightsaber resistance. However, the armor came with its drawbacks. The creatures would grow and multiply across Bane's entire body, encasing him in a cocoon of armor. He needed to craft special headgear and gloves to prevent the obelisks growing over his hands and face. The creatures would also feed on your power while giving you more power in return. It was a mutually beneficial relationship, but it would keep the user in constant pain. Bane also found other useful wisdoms from the Holocron, such as guidance on how best to focus his apprentice's training. Using a series of tests created by Frieden Nard, Bane had discovered that Zana's abilities were that of Sith sorcery and spells. Over the next 20 years, 
half burned Tranzana to the best of his ability. He had hardwired the rule of two into her training, so he could rest easy knowing that the Sith would obey this new system. In time, he and Zana would fight for the rank of master, and only the strongest would survive that encounter. At one point in time, Darth Bane was failing to create his own Sith Holocron, a device that could be passed down to teach new apprentices the rule of two. When Bane failed for a third time to make his Holocron, he submitted himself to a rage that was fueled by the obelisk armor he wore. For a time, he wondered whether or not the obelisks were weakening him, causing his many attempts to fail. But eventually, his apprentice retrieves a data disk that holds the location of Belia Dazu's fortress. Belia Dazu was the last known Sith Lord to create a holocron, meaning her own personal holocron would be able to explain the secret that Bane was clearly missing. To obtain this knowledge, Dana had betrayed her master, once again submitting himself to another obelisk-fueled rage. He very nearly kills his own apprentice before she can reveal she had done this to help him so he could obtain the knowledge he needed. Once things had settled, it became slowly clear to Bane that he may need to remove his armor if he is to regain full control of his power. He couldn't risk the obelisks controlling his actions. If he was to accidentally kill his apprentice, it would mean he'd need to start all over again. After acquiring the knowledge of Belia Dazu, Bane discovers he was missing a crucial component, a capstone, a fitting that is meant to contain the power of the device, giving the creator enough time to finish the intricate adjustments before the power source explodes. The holo-projected avatar from Bane's holocron was the version of himself covered in obelisk armor. That way, if the Jedi ever found it, they would not be able to identify him. It also showed future, curious Sith Lords that a master must endure pain if they are to succeed. Belia Dazu's stronghold was on Typhon. Bane had sent Zana undercover at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant while he explored the fortress on Typhon. Dana's objective was to find information on how to remove the obelisks. Dana found what she needed, but when she meets with her master on Typhon, they quickly learn that she was followed by five Jedi, three of which were Jedi Masters. Together, Zana and Bane defeated the Jedi. However, Bane suffered great injury. While attempting to finish off their last opponent, Bane had unleashed a mighty storm of Force Lightning. However, one of the dying Jedi at his feet had projected a shield around them both, causing the lightning to ricochet and strike directly back at Bane himself. The attack left Bane a charred husk on the floor. Dana had to take desperate action to save his life, using the help of the healer Kaleeb on Ambria once again. When Bane was in his later years, his middle forties, he'd begun to wonder if Zana was taking too long to challenge him for the rank of master. Because of this, and his aging body, Bane decided it was best to seek out a new ability that could help him assure the Sith's survival. He had heard mention of a Sith Lord named Darth and Dedu. This ancient Sith was said to have known the secret of Essence Transfer, a secret that Bane desired. Following his leads, Bane risks a treacherous journey through hyperspace to arrive at the world of Pragath. Here, he would find a temple that housed many cult members, a cult that still worshipped Andedu. Sensing the people within, Bane knew no one there was a threat to him. When he landed on the temple roof, two dozen or more cultists came out to attack him. Bane simply projected a dark side aura, and as the enemy entered it, they would quickly turn to dust and burn, rapidly aging and decaying. This was just one of Bane's many talents. Storming the inside, Bane cut down any pathetic soul that dared to stop him. Inside the temple, he finds his prize, yet another holocron, the one created by Darth and Dedu. When Bane spoke with the gatekeeper of the holocron, it only spoke of basic lessons and trivial thought food that Bane had no time for. He already knew the ways of the Sith and seeked only the secret of Essence Transfer. Show me the ritual of Essence Transfer! The ritual is fraught with danger. Attempting it will cause the current vessel to be destroyed. 
your body will be consumed by the power of the dark side. Choose your new vessel carefully. If you select a living being, be warned that their own spirit will fight you as you try to possess their body. If their will is strong, you will fail and their consciousness will be cast into the void, doomed to an eternity of suffering and torment. I am not some student cowering in fear at the unimaginable power of the dark side. I am the Dark Lord of the Sith! Your title means nothing to me. I decide who is worthy to learn my secrets, and you are not yet ready. Perhaps you will never be. If you do not give me what I seek, then I will take it! <laughs> Using his own knowledge of how to construct a holocron, Bane was able to reach into the device's core and begin hacking the framework as if it was a computer terminal. However, this task was at least a million times more complicated. Carefully, he adjusted the interior patterns, spending hours focusing while he searches for the secret. Eventually, he finds what he's looking for, and Dedu's knowledge burns itself into his brain in just one second. The Dark Lord stumbled a little as he collects himself. His mind now overflowing with information, he spends the journey home deciphering the knowledge and allowing it to sink in. By the time he arrives home to his mansion on the world of Seutric, he had digested it all. However, as he entered his home, he sensed many intruders. Before he knew it, a couple of flashbangs went off and a dozen or more soldiers descended on him with nets and stun rifles. Bane could sense one individual who was somehow suppressing his power, but he quickly overcame it. Bane gives himself to the force and retaliates, striking some with lightning, breaking the necks of others. He leaps to the balcony and sees an Iktochi female opposing him. He was the one trying to suppress his power. She had a gift. Bane lunges after her, but she counters and kicks him back to the ground level. While he's on the floor and dazed, the Iktochi female jumps down and manages to cut Bane's arm just as he rolls away. Moments later, the poison that coated the blood, the Senflax, began to paralyze the Dark Lord, allowing the intruders to take him prisoner. By the time he awakens, he is suspended in a cell with many drugs keeping him in a dazed state. A woman from his past had orchestrated the entire thing. The small girl he once cast over a cooking pot, the daughter of the healer Kaleeb. To see how this story ends, now is the time to watch the next video, Darth Zana Explained. Thank you for watching this video. This was a huge project for us and we are incredibly pleased to share it with you now. A huge thank you to the voice actors Luke, Brett, Phil, Shana and the Goddess Demoness. I'm hoping that you all enjoyed the visuals we made using Blender. It took a long time to get them somewhat okay and presentable. Be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you want to see more projects like this one. Since we don't upload often, it's important you subscribe so you don't miss any new videos. Once again, thank you for watching, and may the Force be with you. I won't disappoint you, Master. Is that what I am? A Sith Sorcerer? Tell me what you told them! I had to bring them here, Master. How much of your power is wasted on these parasites infecting your body? Can you teach me to... be like you? Allowed. <laughs> you allowed yourself to be captured by those royalists. You dare to violate the rule of two. You dare to steal my ascension from me. My power far surpasses yours. I am the master. Today, your reign ends, Darth Bane. <laughs> Rain was a 10 year old female human. She was raised by her cousin Root on a world named Sermov Ritz. In roughly the year 1032 BBY, 
Rin had been recruited by a Jedi by the name of Master Tor. She, along with her cousins Tomcat and Bug, were to be taken together to be trained. In the current time, Jedi and Sith are at war. This story takes place 3,000 years after the era of Revan and 1,000 years before the era of Darth Vader. Currently, Lord Khan of the Dark Brotherhood is the leader of the Sith army. He, along with his proclaimed equal brothers, who were also Dark Lords, were battling the Jedi in what would likely be their final standoff on the planet Rusan. Rain and her cousins were brought to Rusan by the Jedi Master so they could be recruited and trained for the Army of Light. The Army of Light was a legion of Jedi who had banded together to face the rising Sith threat. They had made their play here on Rusan. Unfortunately, while Rain was being flown in to land on Rusan, their shuttle was shot down and destroyed. Fortunately though, Rain had survived. It could have been her hidden potential with the use of the force that saved her, or it could have just been the bouncer that caught her as she came plummeting from the sky. Bouncers were local creatures of Rusan, usually friendly. They were in touch with the force and were even able to commune telepathically using it. Rain was saved, but she was now stuck stranded, with nothing but the creature to keep her company. She had swiftly learned the creature could talk in her mind and they quickly became friends. The creature didn't have a name, so Rain gave one to it. She decided to name the bouncer La. It was possible that the bouncer felt some natural desire to care for the young child. What was more likely is that the bouncer was also a child and just wanted to be friends. La did have a tribe, but the war that was currently raging on Rusan had caused many of the wildlife to become collateral damage. La and Rain were alone. Eventually, La had tried to warn Rain that something was coming. The creature spoke in what seemed like riddles, using vague terms almost constantly. La told Rain that the bad dreams were coming. She wasn't sure what this meant, but she soon found out. A huge storm of lightning was about to wash over the entire forest that they currently found refuge in. Trees and land were being utterly decimated and scorched. If the sound of lethal weather and the sight of trees being thrown like twigs wasn't enough to scare the girl, then seeing the other wildlife and birds be disintegrated as the lightning approached while at the same time she could smell the burnt cinders of bones and flesh, that was enough to frighten her to death. Somehow, Rain was able to tap into the force to create a shield, likely amplified by the huge amounts of emotional distress that she was under. The shield was able to completely cover herself and La the Bouncer, effectively saving both their lives as the sudden and destructive wave of lightning breezed over them. Unknowingly to Rain, a Dark Lord of the Sith had used a powerful ritual to summon the lightning over the forest. This Dark Lord was none other than Darth Bane. The ritual and dark side powers at work had corrupted some of the wildlife of Rusan, including the bouncers. The corruption made them violent to outsiders. The Brotherhood and Jedi both were killing bouncers on site for this reason. Luckily, the bouncer with Rain was protected by her force shield. A few days later though, Rain and La had felt another occurrence happen far away, this time in the form of a ground quake. They were safe at this distance though. Unknowingly to them, this was the aftershocks of the incredibly lethal Fort Bomb Ritual. Not too long after, two Jedi from the Army of Light stumbled across Rain and La in the plains of Rusan. The Jedi saw the bouncer and assumed it would be hostile, so they gunned it down on sight. Looks like the bouncer is dead. These things are everywhere lately. Hey, you there. Are you okay? Rain had gone berserk. Her one and only friend, La, was just killed out of nowhere. She'd experienced so much loss recently, first her childhood friends and now La. She screamed as loud as she could and in doing so, she was able to reach out using the force to snap the neck of the Jedi in front of her. Before his comrade had any time to react, she had already turned and used the force to break his neck too. After the bodies fell to the floor, she stopped screaming. And then, she moulded herself around her fallen friend and began to cry. Darth Bane found her there. She didn't scarce or lash out against him. He stepped forward and it was clear he had already put together what happened. He could see she had killed two Jedi. 
likely in revenge of the dead bouncer she was huddled next to. The girl stood up and unknowingly approached the Dark Lord. He asked her a question. Who are you? My name is Rain. I, I mean, Xana. My cousins called me Rain, but they're dead now. Xana's my real name. Do you know who I am? You're a Sith. Are you afraid, child? No. I have killed many people. Men, women, even children. I am a killer now, too. Do you know the ways of the Force? No, but you could teach me. Zana had been found by a Sith Lord named Darth Bairn. The only thing she knew about the Sith is that they were the ones who were fighting the Jedi here on Rusan. She believed her cousins, Tomcat and Bug, were dead after the shuttle crashed. She was amazed to still be alive herself after all this time. When Bairn offered to take her on as an apprentice of the dark side, she jumped at the opportunity. Exactly why is hard to say. It might have been because she didn't want to be alone. Or perhaps she could sense the power in Darth Bane and wanted that for herself. Either way, she chose to follow him and become the heir to the entire Sith legacy. She followed her new master along the plains of Rusan. However, she was barely 10 years old and just simply couldn't keep up with the Dark Lord on foot as he marched ahead of her. Slow down. I can't keep up. You are strong in the Force. You must learn to use it, to call on its power, to bend it to your purpose, as you did when you killed the Jedi. I don't know how I did that. I didn't even mean to do it. It just sort of happened. Nothing just happens. You've already called upon the power of the Force. Think back to how you did it. Think back to how it happened. I don't want to. You feel sorry for those Jedi now? You feel regret, remorse, perhaps even pity. But these are worthless emotions. They mean nothing. What you need to feel is anger. The deaths were not an accident. What happened was not some mistake. <sighs> Think back to what you felt when you unleashed your power against them. Think of what you felt when the Jedi murdered your friend. They killed Lar. They deserved to die. Good. Feel the anger. Welcome it. Embrace it. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. Through passion, I gain strength. Through strength, I gain power. The Jedi died because they were weak. Only the strong survive, and the Force will make you stronger. Use it to keep up. If you fall behind again, I will leave you here on this world. But you still haven't told me what to do! <sighs> A Sith knows when to unleash the fury of the dark side and when to hold back. Patience can be used as a weapon of the dark side if you learn how to use it and your anger can fuel the dark side when you learn to control it. Where are we going? To the Sith camp. We'll require supplies for our journey. Are there other Sith here? The ones the Jedi were fighting? There are no other Sith. There never will be. Except for us. One master. And one apprentice. One to embody the power. The other to crave it. What happened to the others? I killed them. Then they were weak and deserved to die. Well said, my apprentice. Wait here. Zana followed her master across Rusan until eventually they had found the camp Darth Bane was talking about. Impressively, Zana was able to sense the scavengers ahead at the camp, but her master had already sensed them earlier. They stopped not too far away and Zana was instructed to wait. As soon as her master left, 
she followed him, disobeying his order. She wasn't sure how he might react, but Zana just wanted to see what her master was capable of. She had no chance of being able to keep up with Ben as he travelled full speed toward the camp. So in her own pace, she made her way there. By the time she had arrived, her master had already killed at least six scavengers who were sifting through the abandoned Sif remains in search of treasures and loot. Although she arrived late, she could see from the carnage around that Bain was indeed very powerful. He had charged into battle and slaughtered everyone around. Well, almost everyone. Zana could see that Bain had let two of the scavengers run free. You let them get away? I told you to wait for me. Why did you disobey? I wanted to see the true power of the dark side. Can you teach me to... be like you? You will learn. Prowess in combat is the simplest display of the dark side's power. Brutal and quick, it serves its purpose, and it is often less effective than subtlety and cunning. Ultimately, letting those mercenary scavengers live will prove far more useful than killing them. But they were weak. They deserved to die. Few beings in the galaxy ever get what they truly deserve. Our mission is not to bring death to all those who are unfit to live. We answer to a greater calling. All that I have done on Rusan and all that we will do from this day forward must serve our true purpose. The preservation of our order and the survival of the Sith. I'm sorry, Master. I still don't understand why you didn't just kill them. As servants of the dark side, we revel in the vanquishing of our enemies. We draw power from their suffering. But we must balance this against greater gains. We must recognize that killing for sadistic pleasure, however pleasant it may be, killing without reason, need or purpose, is the act of a fool. What purpose is there in letting scum like that live? The Jedi believe the Order of the Sith died here on Rusan. There are other followers of the Dark Side on many worlds. The Marauders of Hanugur and Gamur. The Shadow Assassins of Ryloth and Umbara. But those with the greatest power, all those individuals with the potential to become true Sith Masters, had gathered together in Khan's Brotherhood. As one, they followed him into this war. And as one, they followed him into death. But there will be those who doubt the totality of the Sith's extinction. There will always be whispers that the Sith survive. Hints and rumors that somewhere in the galaxy, a Dark Lord lives. And if the Jedi ever find proof of our existence, they will be relentless in hunting us down. We cannot live in isolation, cut off from the rest of the galaxy while cowering in fear. We must work. To grow our power, we will need to interact with many individuals from many species across many worlds. It is inevitable that someone will recognize us for what we are, no matter our disguise. Eventually, word of our existence will reach the ear of the Jedi. Since we cannot hide the fact of our survival, we must obscure it with half-truths. We must encourage the rumors, spreading them so thick they blind our enemies until they cannot separate the myth from the reality. A rumor is as reliable as its source. No one will believe what those scavengers will say. The survivors will spread the tale, but who will believe the likes of them? Everyone will know they are self-serving mercenaries who fled the final battle to save themselves, then came to loot the camp of their former allies. They will be spit upon as traitors and thieves. Nobody who hears their story will believe it, and the truth will be dismissed as any other worthless rumor. And if there are other witnesses to our presence on Rusan, their accounts are now less likely to be believed. They will be tainted by the similarities of the so-called lies spewing from the mouths of cowardly looters. No use or purpose in their deaths. Zana watches as her master scavenges through the Sith camp. In the corner of her eye, she sees a book of sorts laid nearby. She picks it up and inspects it, only to see a language she does not recognize. She asks her master what the item is, and he holds his hand out while she passes the item over. Her master glances over the book and his reaction told her that what she found was important. Unknowingly to Zana, she had uncovered a record from the former Sith master, Cordis. 
this record held valuable banking clan codes with access to the many of the Sith Empire's fortune. It also held the location of Frieden Nard's tomb. Her master didn't relay this information, Zana was only ever to be told what she needed to know, nothing more. After they were done gathering supplies at the camp, Darth Bane took Zana to the location of the Fort Bomb. The Fort Bomb was a devastatingly powerful dark side ritual. When conjured, it would create an exploding vortex that sucked in the life force of all force users around. The Fort Bomb was manipulated into existence through Bane's own cunning and secrecy. He had brought Zana here so she could acknowledge that they were the only two remaining Sith. Her master had killed all the others. He had done this to preserve the strength of the Sith. He was the strongest, so he took the title he deserved. Zana was eager to learn, probing her master with curious questions about the Force. However, as they were conversing, an old familiar face to Zana came running towards them both. Somehow, somewhere, Zana's cousin Tomcat had survived and was now before Zana. Her cousin recognised Bain as a Sith and immediately tried to lash out against him. However, Zana wanted the life that Bane offered her, to become the heir of the Dark Side's legacy. Before Bane was able to act, Zana had used the Force to completely explode the hand of her cousin. Tomcat had run at Darth Bane with a lightsaber in his hand, now the weapon was on the floor and her cousin was shrieking in pain. In time, her cousin would realise this was her final mercy. She destroyed his hand in an effort to keep Bane from lashing out which would have resulted in his death. Now, he gets to live, albeit with just one hand. Her master questioned the actions, but Zana simply explained that there was no use or purpose in his death, using the logic he had recently taught her against him. She was right too. The chances of anyone believing a Sith Lord and a small girl were seen together were incredibly unlikely. Bane approved of his new apprentice's behaviour, and the two carried on and left Tomcat alone, to suffer. While walking away with her new master, Zana didn't once look back. Next, they headed out for Darth Bane's personal starship. However, when they arrived... Oh, this is a nice ship. I never imagined I'd be riding in something like this off-world. You are not. We are not taking your ship? I am. You must make your own way off this world. I, I, I can't come with you? No. But why not? What did I do? Why are you leaving me? This is part of your training. To understand the dark side, you must experience hardship and struggle. You don't have to abandon me to make me suffer. The strength of the dark side lies with the individual. The force comes from within. You must learn to draw on it yourself. I will not always be there to teach you. But you said there was always two. One to embody the power, and the other to crave it. Why do you follow me? To unleash my full potential. To learn the ways of the dark side. And when I no longer have anything to teach you, what will happen then? I don't know. There will come a time when your training ends. There will come a day when you have learned all the lessons, when all my knowledge of the dark side will be yours. And on that day, you will challenge me for the title of master. And only one of us will survive that encounter. You have the potential to surpass me. If you achieve your potential, I will cease to be of use to you. You will need to find new sources of knowledge. You will have to find a new apprentice so that you may pass on the secrets of the Sith Order to another. When your power Eclipses mine. I will become expendable. I will be weak. And you know what we do with weakness. This is the rule of two. One master. One apprentice. When you are ready to claim the mantle of Dark Lord as your own, you must do so by eliminating me. The confrontation is inevitable. It is the only way the Sith can survive. It is the way of the dark side. Make your way to Onderon. I will meet you there in ten standard days. How am I supposed to get there? You are my chosen one, the anointed heir to the legacy of our order. You will find a way. And if I don't? Then you will have proven yourself unworthy of being my successor. 
and I will seek out another apprentice. Zana was left alone on the surface of Rusan. She did nothing but stand motionless and stare as her master flew his ship out of sight. Zana considered using the swoop bike to find people and then hopefully transport off world, but she was too small to operate the bike. She opted to use the lessons that Bane had recently taught her instead. Patience, along with being able to wield the force to propel herself forward on foot. She did this for as long as she could until her feet hurt. She was still new to adopting the power of the force, so she ended up fatiguing herself along the plains of Rusan. She didn't know how long or how far she had walked, but eventually she saw a shuttle and people nearby. There was an old man, a young woman and two boys who seemed to be stockpiling their ship. As she slowly stumbled her way to their location, the young woman saw Zana and had called out to her. The people could see that she was in need of help, and they decided to take her on board and speak with her inside of the cargo hold. Before they talked, they gave Zana some food and something to drink. Then they questioned her about who she was and where her parents were. However, Zana knew she had to choose her responses carefully. Bane had told her that the Sith Order must remain a secret. Therefore, she had to make sure she didn't do anything or say anything that would make them suspect who she really was. But what could she do? After all, she was just a little girl who had no home or no family to go to. The only thing she had now was her new master, Darth Bane. He had promised her that she would succeed him. When Zana was asked by her saviors what her name was, she told them her name was Rain. Traditionally, when you become Sith, you can choose to take on a new name. Zana had chosen to keep her real name. She told her saviors the name Rain, as this was her cover. It was the name her cousins used and one she knew growing up, a nickname. To give it up and use her real name was to let go of her childhood and innocence. It soon became apparent to these people that Rain was a war orphan. When asked if she wanted to go with her saviors, Rain told them she needed to go to Onderon. Knowing she couldn't tell them why, she offered a lie instead. She told them that she had family on Onderon. She just needed to find them. The older man, who spoke with calmness, explained to Rain that they would take her to the fleet in orbit, then decide what to do in the morning. He had also offered for her to come and live with him on Busan, just until they found her family at least. It had been so long that kindness made its way to Zana that her mouth dropped at the offer. She was left alone in the cargo hold to think about her options and eat. Rain was stunned that someone would just take her in like that. Bane had abandoned her. He said she was the heir to the Sith and she wasn't sure if that's what she wanted. Then she thought about what the old man had said, that she could stay with him and his boys. Why would she want to have a close connection to people she could not protect? Her bouncer friend La had died because she couldn't protect him. The old man was tempting Zana with a simple and easy life. Peace is a lie, she thought to herself, knowing that accepting a mediocre life would not allow her to embrace her full potential. Through her master, she would be able to gain power she could only dream of. She would no longer be a victim of this world. Through victory, my chains are broken. Zana had made up her mind. She had realized what she truly was. Sith. Zana took to searching through the cargo hold, hoping to find something she could use to help her escape, or even stop the shuttle from arriving on the fleet. Just as one of the boys entered the cargo hold, she found a blaster. Before she knew it, they were both wrestling for the weapon she had found and the blaster went off. Killing the young boy and his limp body slumped over Zana. The older man and father of the boy had ran in to see what the commotion was, and before he could reach his dead son Orzana, she fired the blaster, wounding and paralyzing the old man. She fired a second shot, while screaming in horror of what she was witnessing, the second shot killed the old man. On the ship intercom, she heard the young woman acknowledge the fired shots. Quickly, she made her way to the cockpit where the young woman and the other teenage boy currently were. Zana demanded that they plot a course for Onderon. After the woman complied, she tried to talk Zana down, asking what happened and trying to tell Zana she wasn't a killer, which was wrong. Already she had killed four people, including two Jedi, and she was just 10 years old. Zana squeezed the trigger, ending the woman's life. Then she turned towards the boy who begged for his life, which of course didn't work. Zana had accepted who she was now, she was Sith. 
She could feel the fear in the boy and the pull of the dark side responding to it. Zana pulled the trigger again and added another body to her death counts. Despite her small size, Zana was able to manage moving the bodies from the cockpit into the cargo hold with the others. She knew the ship was on autopilot and all she needed to do was just wait out the journey. Zana helped herself to the ration kits on board the ship. However, because they were adult sized portions, she couldn't ever finish a full serving. So she would throw the leftovers behind her out into the corridor past the cockpit. After a few days, she could smell the food going bad, but she welcomed the smell as it covered the even worse smell of decaying flesh coming from the cargo hold. To escape being bored while on her journey, she would try to imagine what her future will be like with Bane. The power and knowledge he promised her was something she really wanted. She didn't want to be a victim anymore. She wanted to be strong, but her mind kept forcing her to remember the people she had recently killed. She wondered what her master would say about such weakness. Just then, the autopilot beeped to alert her that she was going to be arriving in a few minutes. The Navi computer was requesting coordinates for landing. At this moment, she realized she had no idea how to land the ship. So far, she just assumed that the autopilot would just land on its own, but she didn't know any coordinates to put in the terminal. In a panic, she decided to press random buttons until something happened. Hopefully good. After a few tries, the Navi computer accepted a landing location. When she looked out the cockpit viewing window, all that could be seen was lots of green. She worried that the autopilot would fail and crash into the treetops below. Then the Navi computer beeped again to notify it had chosen itself another landing location that was more optimal. After a somewhat safe landing, Zana and the ship were unharmed. Zana was safe from injury inside the harness of the pilot's seat. She steadily makes her way off the shuttle. She could see that she had landed in a large circle clearing inside of a forest, some form of man-made landing area. There was a person in the distance waving Zana over. As she walked nearer, she could see that the person was a man, dressed in dirty and torn clothing. The man said to Zana that her pilot must not be very good for a landing like that. She explained she was the only person on board trying to hide the fact that there was bodies in the cargo hold. The man had told Zana that she had to pay for landing in their property. After she explained she had no money, the strange man declared he would take her ship as payment instead. Several other people made their way out of the tree line carrying weapons. She used her newfound power in the force to knock the man to the ground and then try to run back to the ship, but she knew it was futile to run after she saw a huge bird-like creature land in the clearing. These people were Onderon Beast Riders from the Zelda clan. The man began to tease Zana as she was clearly defenseless against them all and their winged beast. And in that moment, she sensed him, nearing closer and closer by the second. But it wasn't the strange man. It was Bane. As promised, he had arrived on Onderon to meet his new apprentice. Her master swept down on his own winged beast, a Drexel, much larger than any of the other flyers the beast handlers had with them. The creature grabbed the strange man in front of Zana and tossed him around like a limp ragdoll and then dropped him from a staggering 30 meter height to his death. Within a few moments, Bane had flown into the skies with the other beast riders who joined the fray. Zana watched the spectacle in amazement as she witnessed her master take the advantage. A few more moments later, she sees three flyers bundled together, all come crashing to the ground, leaving a huge mess of exploded flesh. Rising like a mountain from the wreckage, Bane walks towards Zana, appearing unscathed. Zana was amazed to see that her master survived the fall and seemingly without injury. She was filled with excitement to know that one day she could have this much power for herself. Zana was eager to learn. As her master grew closer, she saw a disgusting crustacean-like creature attached to his chest. They are called Orbalisks, creatures that feed on the dark side. Without them, I would not have survived what you just witnessed. They can sense your presence. They are reacting to your attunement of the dark side. How do you get them off? I don't. This armor will be permanent. Will I have to wear them too? The benefits of the armor. Healing and resistance to blaster fire and lightsabers. They come with a cost. The creatures must feed on my connection to the dark side. And in turn, they grant me more power. The process is painful. 
It will be too much for you to bear as a child. Perhaps too much for you to ever bear. I stole a ship. I, I had to kill the crew. You did what was required to accomplish your goal. You showed through strength and cunning that you have the will to destroy those in your way. You saw what you wanted, and you took it. This is the way of the dark side. You acted as a true Sith. What happens now, Master? Now, your real training begins. After such hardship and struggle in her life, Zana for the first time felt relief. She felt as though her life had purpose and that Ben was going to bring that vision to life. Zana was no longer afraid of her future. Under his teachings, she would become heir to the entire Sith legacy. Her training began with simple emotional lessons, as she was just a child still. Zana had to learn how to control her emotions and use them as fuel for the dark side. Eight days after leaving Onderon, they had made a camp on the planet Ambria, not too far from Lake Narth. Darth Bane had instructed Zana to lure one of the local critters back to him. She had to do this without injuring the critter, and it had to follow her of its own will. Knowing she couldn't set a trap, Zana tried to dominate the mind of a critter using the Force. However, the nearby Lake Nath, which was imbued with the power of the dark side, had mutated the critters to resist her attempts. Instead, she practiced meditating in the location of the critter's gathering spot. For the first week, the critters wouldn't come out of hiding, but as the next week passed, the critters began to return and become curious of Zana's peaceful presence. After the third week of meditating, one curious critter came close enough to feed by hand. After this became a pattern, Zana decided to move her meditation location closer to the camp each day. The critter would always come looking for her and take the food that she offered. And then one day, when she stood to return to camp, the critter began to follow her. Knowing that she was about to succeed in her task, she slowly made her way back to camp with the critter following along. Look, master, I did what you asked. <sighs> Good. Now toss it in the stew. I see you decided to teach me two lessons today, master. Zana had learned that the critter was to be used as a tool then simply thrown away. Her mistake was letting herself become attached to the critter. She saw what her master did as a warning that her allegiance belongs to only him. Almost three years later, Bane had begun instructing Zana in the art of lightsaber combat. While her master made her learn many drills and techniques, the Sarisu form was the form that he wanted her to adopt. For one entire year, she trained each day practicing the swings and routines, until eventually, when she was 14 years old. Darth Bane tasked her with constructing a lightsaber. The result was a twin-bladed lightsaber powered by two crystals. However, rather than the usual 1.5 meter blade length, Zana's was just under one meter at either end. This was to help her defend much more easily. Zana was average height for her age, but she wasn't an imposing figure. She would need to rely on her quickness and ability to outlast the opponent. The shorter blades would also allow her to move the weapon more freely so that she could maximize her agility in combat. Once she had her lightsaber, Darth Bane would spar with her to sharpen her technique. At this time, the obelisks that had only been on Bane's chest and shoulder years before had now spread to encase the majority of his person. With them being resistant to lightsabers, this gave Zana a unique training regime as she could score hits on her master and not have to worry about the consequences of a lightsaber strike. Zana knew that her master had uncovered new secrets from the holocron of Frieden Nard. However, he refused to share them with her. Instead, he explained only that he was testing her through a new method. After some time, Zana was beginning to think she had failed her master in some way because there was no news of the results. And then he explained, the dark side of the force is a relay in many directions. Some dark lords have the gift to move mountains with a mere thought or make a sun go supernova. Your talents as per these results would suggest that your own abilities lie within the direction of dark magics and spells. Is that what I am? A Sith sorcerer? With patience, you could be. 
Within Frieza Nat's holocron, I found and transcribed these spells. Your studies down this path will be relentless. You will have to do all of this on your own. I am not able to guide you in this direction. My own talents lie elsewhere. I won't disappoint you, master. Good. Should you ever attempt to use one of these spells upon me, I will destroy you. Over the next few years, Zana practiced her new dark side methods and became very adept in the ways of mind manipulation and being able to make people see their worst fears and nightmares, driving them to the point of insanity or even comatose. In her youth, Zana witnessed her master meet with immune from the banking clans. Using the codes that Zana found back on Rusan, her master was able to set up and access various well-funded accounts, accounts which he used to employ spies across the galaxy. This Mune had seen Bane's face and even Zana's. Although the Mune didn't know their real names or the fact that they were Sith, Zana wondered how her master would kill the Mune now that their business had concluded. However, her master had let the Mune leave the meeting without incident. There was no use or purpose in his death. Seeing who her master would kill and who he wouldn't kill became an important observation to Zana. It taught her how to identify a tool and store it for later use. Much like her story her master had told her about a healer he left alive back on Ambria. Zana was now 20 years old. Her master relied on Zana to be his eyes and ears throughout the galaxy. Due to his intimidating and hard to forget appearance via the obelisk armor that encased his entire persona, minus his hands, feet and head, Bane could no longer go out in public as this was too risky. He could easily be identified as an agent of the dark side. Therefore, he tasked Zana with infiltrating a rebel organization on the planet Serena. She didn't know exactly why she was doing this, but all she needed to do was obey her master. Zana spent several months gaining the trust of one of the rebel members, who was a male Twi'lek named Kaladin. She had told him that she works for the Republic Embassy here on Serena, that way he would be interested in her. However, Zana was a grown woman now. She had long luscious curly blonde hair and her facial features screamed beauty into the eyes of those who saw her. You could say she was somewhat irresistible to men, even women. Zana knew that Kaladin and the other rebels opposed the Republic and their new reformations. Bane instructed Zana to lure them into an idea. She needed to convince the rebel group to attack the former Supreme Chancellor when he arrived on Serena. She successfully infiltrated the group and became lovers with Kaladin. However, she had used the fake name Reyna as cover for her position. Reyna! Reyna! Keep your voice down. Everybody's staring at us. Let them stare. They are communists. Their opinion means nothing to me. You're late. I don't like to be kept waiting. I shouldn't even be doing this. I'm sorry. I was beginning to think you were with another lover. If I ever find you with another woman, I will cut out her heart. You are more than enough for any male. We don't have time for this. Your friends are waiting for us? You're all right. Let's go. Zana followed along and was taken inside a building which housed the other rebels. Some of them protested to her presence, but Kaladin vouched for her. She wouldn't be able to just blurt out her idea and ask them to do it. Instead, she had slowly told Kaladin her plan until he came up with it on his own and believed it was his idea. Kaladin told his plan to the other rebels and convinced them to go through with it. Knowing that her mission was now successful, she spent one more night with her lover before they went their separate ways. Kaladin and his band of rebels, who were actually working under a man named Hetan, went out on their mission to assault the former Chancellor. Zana had already learned the lesson of attachment. She didn't make that mistake again here. She returned to Darth Bane and the camp on Ambria and delivered the news of her success. She could also see from the state of the camp that her master had failed yet again to create a holocron. This was his third time trying to make the artifact. Her master had clearly entered a rage and destroyed the camp in his fury. Zana could still sense the power of his rage crackling in the air. She wondered to herself, had she been here when this happened? Would she have been able to prevent his rage? 
Would she have even been able to survive? The obelisks on his body gave him great power. This was undeniable. Yet Zana wondered whether this power was truly worth it. If her master was unable to control it, he had allowed the obelisks to fuel his rage and let it go unchecked. She was now almost certain that if he was ever to enter this rage fueled by the obelisks while she was around, she would probably die. Attempting to convince her master to remove the obelisks might be necessary for her own survival, yet she had to be careful how she decided to manipulate her master with words. If he was to notice that she seeked to weaken him, his reaction could be life-threatening. Zana could see her master on the outskirts of the camp, seated and meditating. She approached him, and he rose to greet her. It's done. When the former counselor Valorum lands, Kel and the others will be waiting for him. You have done well. Are they going to succeed their mission? No. Then what purpose do they serve? I don't understand why you would send me on a mission like this. Why spend this time and effort knowing they are going to fail? They do not need to succeed to be of value to us. The Separatists are only a distraction. They draw the attention of the Senate and blind the eyes of the Jedi Council. Blind them? What do you mean? The Jedi have surrendered themselves to the will of the Senate. The Jedi have sank into the cesspool of politics and bureaucracy. Because the Senate believe the Sith threat to be eradicated through our own manipulation and deceit. The Jedi have become weaker. The Senate no longer believes in the need for a Jedi army, of even Jedi leaders now. With the Sith presumably gone, they live in a safe bubble that no longer needs protecting. They believe they live in safety, believing that people are safe and no longer require the Jedi's protection. The Senate has redirected the Jedi to dealing with matters such as these Separatist threats, therefore wasting resources and time on scenarios that we organize for them. The time they spend quarreling these uprisings and essentially fighting amongst themselves, we also spend becoming stronger while shielded from the eyes and attention of the Jedi Council. But why must the Separatists always fail? We could help them succeed without risking showing ourselves. If they succeed, their power and influence will grow as they become larger in number and more powerful as an individual body. That harder it will be to control them. We must safeguard who we allow to rise to power and who we do not. In 20 years time, they could be the authority that stands against us. We must not organize our own demise. We must exploit them, play them off each other while we stay hidden and grow strong. One day, the Republic will fall and the Jedi will be wiped out. But it will not happen until we are ready to seize that power for ourselves. You have never questioned your missions before. Even if I don't understand my mission sometimes, I never had reason to doubt your wisdom, Master. Yet you doubt me now. I've never seen you lose control of your power like this before. I feared the Orbalisks could be influencing your judgment. I feared they might have driven you mad. How much of your power is wasted on these parasites infecting your body? I control the Orbalisks. They do not control me. Clean up the camp, then return to Sereno. We need more supplies. Although there was truth in her words, attempting to manipulate her master this way was very risky. Despite Bane's reaction, she could tell that her seed of doubt was planted successfully. If Zana could somehow convince Bane that the obelisk posed a risk to her own safety, or even were somehow weakening him, he might find a way to take them off. She also knew that her final confrontation with him would be much more survivable if her master had no armor. Zana returned to Sereno after clearing the camp. She was tasked with collecting more supplies, seeing as Ben destroyed the last batch. While on her travels, she bumped into two of the other rebel separatists, ones that she had met back at the meeting with Kaladin. Their mission had gone horribly wrong, and they knew Zana had something to do with it. They followed her into an alley and cornered her. They still believed her name to be Reyna. One of them said they were going to take her to see Hetan, the leader of the organization. When she heard that, she decided to play along with being kidnapped. She could have just killed them both then and there, 
but she wanted to meet Hetton. The two kidnappers confiscated her lightsaber and accused her of stealing it from a Jedi. They intended to give it to Hetton as a treasure. The three of them got into a vehicle and made their way to Hetton's stronghold. As it turned out, the leader of the Separatist was a noble house on Onderon. After being taken inside, Zana was introduced to Hetton, who was a small, skinny old man. Zana was surprised when she was able to sense the power of the dark side within him. It was clear to her that he had been somewhat trained. However, weighing his power against her own, she knew that she could easily kill everyone in this room. Zana was the superior here. The two Separatist kidnappers received a scolding from Hetton about the failed mission. They presented him with the lightsaber and told him Reyna or Zana had it with her. One of the two kidnappers spoke up and said that she could get Zana to talk within just five minutes of being alone with her. At this point, Zana had enough of the charade. She twisted and curled her fingers in intricate patterns, all within the fraction of one second. The kidnapper who spoke up was suddenly tormented with images of their nightmares made reality. Everyone else in the room, including the other kidnapper, could only watch in horror as they had no idea what was happening. Then, Zana pushed the spell even further, and forced images of herself sleeping with this person's lover, which drove them to scream and cry. Creeping slowly into madness, they began to claw and gouge out their own eyes, and then Zana let their mind slip into the void. They wasn't dead, but whatever was left of them wished they were dead. The second kidnapper accused Zana of the situation and ran toward her with a vibra blade. Zana pulled her own lightsaber back to her hand using the force and toyed with the man as he failed time and time to land a blow. When he threw his weapon down and pulled out a blaster, Zana deflected his shots, sending the second blast into his face at point-blank range, leaving behind no recognisable facial features. Hetton, who witnessed the entire thing, approached Zana and kneels down. He says he's been waiting to find someone who can teach him and finish his training. Hetton pledged himself to Zana so long as she would teach him the ways of the dark side. Zana was reluctant to agree, however, Hetton had many resources to offer. He had a personal guard made up of a dozen Umbaran assassins, trained in stealth. He also had a vast amount of dark side artifacts and records. Among them was a data disc that he offered to Zana as a gift. It was a record of an ancient Sith Lord named Belia Dazu. Hetton said that this Sith Lord would be of interest to Zana considering her own gifts, and that also Belia Dazu was the last Sith to successfully create a holocron. When Zana heard those words, she instantly knew her master required this knowledge. She began to think up a plan. Hetton was offering his entire resources to be able to train under Zana. However, in accordance with the rule of two, there can be only two Sith. This was hardwired into Zana's teachings. She explained this to Hetton and even told him about her master, Darth Bane. Hetton had suggested that together they could kill her master and then they would only be the two remaining Sith. Zana knew she was no match for her master, but with Hetton and his Umbaran assassins, she was curious to see what would happen. She organized with Hetton a plan to attack Darth Bane. Back at the camp on Ambria, Zana, Hetton, and the Umbaran assassins began their assault. Bane was meditating, as he was when Zana had left the previous day. The Umbaran assassins went in first, using their stealth methods to gain the upper hand. However, Bane had sensed a mute sound and recognised an ambush taking place. He sprang to action and a battle ensued. Zana and Hetton stood off to the side to simply observe for now. However, very quickly, they began to realise that the Umbaran assassins were being overpowered. Easily. Their Electro Staffs had proven useless against Bane's armour and caused no harm to him. Within moments, three of the assassins were already dead, hewed in half at grotesque angles. Zana witnessed the remaining five assassins strike at once against Bane with their Electro Pikes. The Obelisk armour filtered majority of the Zap but enough made it through to shock Bane head to toe. The assassins could have finished him off, however all of them were stunned that someone just survived that attack. Bane quickly regained his footing and began to take the advantage. Bane sees Zana stood with Hetton 
and easily calculates what has happened. She betrayed him. Hetton, the old man, tried to send a beam of force lightning at Bain, which he easily deflects. He then jumps to Hetton's location and runs him through with his saber. Zana looked around and saw that Bain had killed everyone. It didn't even take long. However, Bain was once again consumed by fury and anger and strikes out against his apprentice. You betrayed me! No, Master, I was- Ugh. Did you really think those pathetic assassins could kill me? Master, please, I did this for you! Ah! I had to bring them here, Master. I brought you this. It has the secret to making a Sith holocron. You... did this for me? Yes, Master. Hatton was the Separatist leader. They kidnapped me back on Rusan. I learned Hatton knew the ways of the dark side and has many records in his possession. I had to bring them, Master, I'm sorry. It was the only way to get this data disk. And what would you have done if they had killed me? Then you would have been weak, unworthy of being the Dark Lord, and you would deserve to die. Zana successfully convinced her master that she had acted on his behalf. In truth, she wanted to see her master in combat, and seeing how the assassins exposed a weakness in his armor with large electrical bursts, the entire situation had been worth it. Now, Zana knew how to fight against him when the time comes. Bane spent some time studying the data disk and uncovered that Beliadazu's tomb was located on an ancient Jedi homeworld Typhon. The coordinates were also within the data disk, and Bane declared that he would be going alone, in search of the knowledge to make a Sith holocron. But her master did have a mission for Zana. Her seed of doubts had finally paid off. Bane was somewhat considering the possibility that the obelisks were affecting his ability to make a Sith holocron, along with sending him into sometimes uncontrollable rage. However, Zana's master knew what to do. He tasked Zana with learning a new spell, the spell of projecting a light side aura. He would be using this spell to go undercover at the Jedi Temple on Coruscant. At first, Zana thought the idea was mad, but her master had put the pieces together so intricately she was convinced it would work. Using their connections with spies, they were able to copy the identity of a Jedi Padawan who was not currently on Coruscant. Zana would use this identity to infiltrate the temple and then the Jedi Archive. The Archives would surely have the information on the obelisks and how to remove them. So this was Zana's mission. Her master set out on his journey to Typhon and Zana began her preparations for the mission. She started by dyeing her hair a dark colour to match that of the Padawan's identity they were using. She then practiced her ability to mask herself in a light side aura. At the same time, she had to hide her dark side aura. This was the first time she had faced such a mentally draining challenge, but she welcomed it. So far, she was able to keep her darkness hidden for long periods of time. However, eventually she would lose concentration and her real self would show through before she can recompose. For now, she had to hope that this would be enough to see her through the mission. Zana used Hetton's personal starship to make the trip to Coruscant. She was dressed in her disguise as the Padawan, Nalia Adolu. When she arrived on Coruscant with no issues, she made her way casually to the Jedi Temple and then toward the location of Jedi Master Bala. Zana had preemptively researched the Jedi for her mission. She knew who was the lead archivist, Master Bara, and where to find him. She would be needing his permission to browse the library's archives. She would be requesting to see something that wouldn't draw suspicion, when in reality, she would search for the obelisks. When she makes it to the Jedi Master, the true test of her light side disguise begins. Oh, Padawan Nalia. We haven't seen you in quite some time. It must be nice getting away from Polis. Yes, Master Barra. Getting away from the cold is nice. <laughs> I bet Master Arno would disagree. He always did enjoy the climate, Polis. Of course. My master sends his regards. Will you be visiting him anytime soon? I'm afraid not. The Jedi Archives require my constant attention and supervision. My master said you would say that. 
He said you would say anything to get out of visiting Polis again. I have reviewed the request for the archives, and I believe we can accommodate you. Thank you, Master Barra. Zana was successful. She had made her way into the temple and now had access to the Jedi Library. She knew that if she could fool a Jedi Master, who stood mere feet away, she could fool anyone. Zana proceeded to sit down in a quiet area and search for the information she needed. Filtering through page after page, Zana could barely hold in her disguise any longer from the frustration of coming up short on the search. It wasn't that she couldn't find anything about the obelisks, it's that the search came up with thousands of results. Zana needed only know how to remove them from the host, and finding that specifically was proving to be difficult amongst the data. Eventually, she stumbled across the research of one Dr. Hozof Humud. His data had uncovered that a male from the species of Nikdo had once removed his obelisks because they disfigured him so much he could not find a mate. As Zana read on, she saw that the research included the entire process of how to remove the obelisks. She had finally found what she was looking for. As she celebrated, her mask of the light side vanished for a moment. In fear, she exposed herself. Zana quickly looked around and saw that no one was looking her way, but then she heard a voice from behind her. Brain? What are you doing here? Tomcat? It's Daravit now, but sometimes I think I like Tomcat better. You're a Jedi now? No, I stayed on Rusan. After... after my hand. I became a healer. What are you doing here? I came to... Rain, we have to get out of here. The Jedi are looking for you. Tomcat, what are you talking about? A Jedi came to Rusan. I told them about you and Bane. That's why they brought me here. How much have you told them? Tell me what you told them! There isn't any time. I was waiting here for them to come get me. You have to leave, or they will find you. Zana's cousin from her youth had suddenly returned to her life. He admitted to exposing her and Darth Bane, and that the Jedi were after them. Without hesitating, Zana copies the data she needs about the obelisks and quickly runs a search for the Typhon coordinates. She then grabs her cousin and makes their way back to Zana's ship. She told Daravit that he was coming along because she couldn't leave him with the Jedi to expose her further. He also said he was a healer, so she intended on employing his services as to perform the procedure on her master to remove the obelisks. When they were both safe and secure back on the ship, Zana punched in the coordinates for Typhon, warning her master was now the top priority. Zana was committed to her future with Bane. She knew the entire Sith's legacy would one day be hers, and she needed Bane to keep teaching her the ways of the dark side until she was ready. During the journey, her cousin insisted on calling Zana by her childhood name, Rain. Zana counter-insisted and expressed her loyalty to Darth Bane, her loyalty to the Sith, it was clear that her cousin was trying to find the light inside of her, but it was gone, extinguished by the burning passion of the dark side. Zana force chokes her cousin and demands that he remain silent for the rest of the journey, or she will kill him. Zana was disgusted by her Padawan disguise, so now that they were in hyperspace, she washed out her hair dye and changed her clothes. By the time they entered orbit and approached Darth Bane's location, her master had already sensed her arrival and came to meet her at the entrance of Belia Dazu's stronghold. When she stepped off the ship, her master immediately questioned her about Daravit, also known as Tomcat. He saw the stump on his arm and recognised who he was in an instant. She offered the explanation that they needed him to perform the procedure to remove the obelisks. However, their conversation was interrupted when Zana swings her head around to face the skies. She had a concerned expression slowly growing over her face. Master? What's going on? We were followed. It seems we have some friends. The Jedi have found us. Zana was followed on her way to meet Bane. Several Jedi were making their way toward their location. There was no time to board a ship and take off, so Bane instructed they all get inside. Within a room, they could fortify and defend themselves against the Jedi. Bane directed them towards a room with just one opening. Bane stashes his treasure from the tomb inside an old storage room. Daravit, also known as Tomcat, also hid inside here for the duration. 
Not too long after, the one and only entrance to the room explodes. Four Jedi, all with their lightsabers ignited, charge into the room and towards the Sith Lords. The Jedi split into two groups of two as to outnumber each opponent. Zana saw her master charge the Jedi head on, like a banther. Quickly turning her attention to her own two opponents, Zana took a different approach and backpedaled into a corner. This way, she could defend against two assailants without worrying about needing to cover her flanks. Opposing her was two Jedi Knights, one wielded a single green blade, while the other wielded a much larger, blue, double-bladed lightsaber. After their fight began, Zana observed that the man with the single blade was indirectly helping her defend against the second Jedi. The first Jedi was slow and clumsy, he had no rhythm with his Jedi comrade. At one point, she saw an opportunity to kill him, but resisted. Keeping him alive was helping her more than killing him would right now. She needed to wear down the second Jedi much more, as he was clearly the real threat. Zana noticed that a fifth Jedi entered the room, an Ephorian, who began meditating by the door. She knew this was likely battle meditation, and the Jedi they were fighting were being enhanced by this technique. Then, one of the Jedi who was fighting her master called over for reinforcements. So the Jedi with the green saber retreated from Zana to help fight Darth Bane. The second Jedi, who Zana now realized was much larger and more imposing than even Bane, was now on the full offensive. She was able to keep up and defend against his blows, but he had her matched maybe even outmatched in terms of lightsaber combat. Then, Zana felt the battle meditation the Jedi were using suddenly stop. The big man she was fighting realized too, and it caused him to hesitate and look back at the Ephorian who had been sent careering across the room by someone else's force push. But Zana didn't know who did it. That didn't matter. Within a fraction of a second, Zana twisted and curled her fingers to conduct her dark sorcery. She drove the Jedi mad with visions of his greatest fears. The Jedi was unable to resist, and Zana simply cut him down as he flailed around like a helpless child. When Zana looks across the room, she can see her master holding his own against three Jedis, at least two of which were Jedi masters. Zana cloaked herself and hid her presence. She then snuck up to the female Ichani Jedi and stabbed her in the back. The other two Jedi, who were also fighting Bane, stopped and looked in horror as their comrade fell to the ground. Bane seized his opportunity and cut off the saber hand of the Jedi with the green weapon. Bane then turned and hewed off the head of the other Jedi opposing him. Before Zana could react, Bane had then leaped across the room and landed next to the Ephorian and slicing his multiple throats in one sweep. Her master turned around to finish off their last opponent, the now one-handed Jedi. As he unleashed his furious force lightning, the mortally wounded Ephorian wrapped his hand around Bane's ankle and projected a shield around them both. The lightning that was intended to strike the one-handed Jedi had instead reflected inside the shield and continuously bounced around. The lightning that Bane produced enveloped himself as he screamed in pain. He did pack quite the punch. The shimmering glow caused Zana to look away. When the shield expired, her master hit the floor, smirking and charred. Before she ran to him, she saw the last Jedi scrambling towards his lightsaber. Zana looked down upon him with a hateful and sinister stare. He looked back at her with innocent, pleading eyes, but she responded by bringing her saber down and ending his life. All five Jedi that followed them to Typhon were now dead. Zana ran to her master, hoping he was still alive. She still had so much to learn from him, she wasn't ready to be alone just yet. She saw that several of the obelisks hadn't survived. On his chest were melted shells that were visibly charred and deformed. Other obelisks on his body had survived, but they were damaged so badly they were causing them to feast on his power much more furiously than they would normally, which was draining his life force. Zana knew that removing them now was the top priority. She could sense that her master still lived. He wasn't dead yet. Zana's cousin Daravith came out of hiding and saw the conclusion of the battle. He asked Zana if Bane was dead, but she explained. Zana then told Daravith that he would need to perform the procedure on Bane. Daravith protested that he did not have the knowledge nor the equipment to do such a thing. 
Remembering a story her master once told her, Zana decides to take Bain back to Ambria, where they would find the healer Kaleeb. This healer had helped Bain once before. Only after he threatened the life of his daughter, however, she knew that Kaleeb was probably Bane's only hope of survival right now. Zana carried her master using the force back to the ship and positioned him in the medical bay. She instructed Daravit to keep him alive at all costs. Zana then punches in the coordinates for Ambria. Her master survived the journey there. His will was strong and clearly his power in the dark side was the only thing helping him cling to life right now. If he died, Zana wasn't sure she would be able to pick up where he left off. She still didn't know how to contact his spy network. She still didn't fully understand how to operate in the shadows as a visionary, like Bane. For the sake of the future of the Sith, she had to keep her master alive so he could finish training her. It was the only way forward. When the trio arrived at the healer's camp on Ambria, Zana began to recall the story her master once told her. This healer Kaleeb once cured Bane of poisoning. At first he refused to help the Dark Lord, but in the end he got his way. Zana searched the healer's camp to find no one home. What was more strange is that she couldn't find any supplies, medical equipment or anything that signalled a healer would live here. Then she searches one of the tents again, convinced that the healer and his daughter are hiding somewhere. She throws up the sleeping rug using the force and reveals a small hatch. Inside was the healer Kaleeb. Get out. No. I know who you are. Good. Then you know why I'm here. You helped my master before, and now you will help again. No. Do you have any idea what I could do to you? It doesn't matter. I've known about you and your master ever since you first set up camp. I knew one day he would return for my help. You can no longer threaten me. My daughter has moved away and I know not where she went, or what name she uses now. If you don't help my master, I will hunt your daughter down and make you watch as I skin her alive. But before, I will force her to watch as I torture her own loved ones and kill them one by one. Then go. Leave me here in peace. We both know you'll never find her. You will surrender to me. You know how to make this end. Say you will help my master. Rain, stop! What are you doing? You're killing him. Put him down! Zana attempted to force the healer into submission, but she knew it wouldn't work. Back when Bane first tried to intimidate the healer, he had thrown his own hand into the boiling pot of water to prove to Bane that he could not make him succumb through physical pain. The healer was touched by the force, however, he leaned not towards the light or dark, but towards nature itself. Zana walked away from the camp to gather her thoughts and try to think up a new plan. She couldn't threaten the healer's daughter, she was nowhere in reach. Daravit came across to Zana and explained he had convinced the healer to help. Zana was of course very sceptical of this and wanted to know how he managed to do it. Daravid explains that Zana must send a message back to the Jedi Council, declaring their surrender so they can come be arrested. If she did this, the healer would agree to heal her master. Daravid also tried to tell Zana that it might be possible she would be forgiven by the Jedi. She had been forced into this life by Darth Bane. She didn't know anything else now. The Jedi would understand this and maybe want to help redeem her. After all, the Jedi believe in the power of redemption. But for her master, it would be too late. There was no doubt that he would be arrested, and then maybe even executed by the Senate. Zana considers her options. She did of course not agree with Daravid's plan. She was in fact quite angry that he had even tried to make the deal. But the answer hit Zana. This was the only way forward. She agrees to the plan, and sends out the beacon carrying a message for the Jedi Order. A Sith Lord still lives. He killed five Jedi on Typhon. He is now on Ambria, under the care of a healer named Kaleeb. He is badly injured and helpless. This was the message that Zana sent. She then goes to check on her master and see how his recovery is going. As promised, the healer was able to nurse Bane back to somewhat good health. His skin had been near fully restored. 
yet it would still be many weeks before he was fit to get out of bed. When her master finally came back to reality and woke up, she spoke with him. What happened? We had to remove the Orbalisks. They were killing you. I brought you to the healer you told me about, but... What is it? Spit it out. The only way we would agree was if I sent a message back to the Jedi, letting them know you are here. They're coming for you. You have exposed me. You betrayed me. It was the only way we could heal you, Master. You still have so much to teach me. And how can that happen now? The Jedi are on their way. Darth Zana, you are my chosen. The heir to the legacy of the Sith. You can still claim your rightful place as their master. Strike me down. Take my place. Kill the others here and leave this world. Seek out a new apprentice and keep the Order alive. Our ship is disabled and the Jedi will be here in a few hours. Kill me now. Deny the Jedi their so-called justice. A Sith never surrenders, Master. You taught me that. The Jedi will be here soon. Act now, my apprentice. Before it's too late, strike me down. As her master fell back into a weakened state of slumber, the dark side gathered within Darfzan, Lord of the Sith. She ignites her weapon and strolls back towards Kaleeb and Daravit. With a flash flood of rage, Zana lashes out against the healer and hews off his hands and feet at the joints. While the healer flailed around like a helpless child in agony, she swipes again and hews off his legs at the knees and his arms at the elbow. Daravit was next. While Kaleeb slowly suffered on the ground, Zana penetrates her cousin's mind and plummets it into darkness, drying out his worst fears and nightmares reducing him to nothing but a blubbering fool. Zana then used her saber to cut up the healer into even more tiny pieces. She relished in the gore. Her cousin had earlier tried to convince Zana that this life was forced upon her. Daravich did not realize that Zana chose to be Sith. She chose to seize her power and never become a victim again. She would never feel pain again, only inflict it upon others. Her loyalty to Bane and the survival of the Sith was the only thing that mattered. The Jedi were nearing Zana to act quick. She hid herself, along with her master, underneath the trap door where she previously found the healer. Not too long after, 14 Jedi showed up to the camp. Clearly, they got the message. The Jedi team searched the camp and found only bits and pieces of the healer. His head was the only whole piece rested atop a cooking pot. When the Jedi grew closer to their tent, Daravit shot out. Still influenced by Zana's dark sorcery, Daravit attacked the Jedi and they responded by killing him. The Jedi, in all their great wisdom, assumed that Daravit was the Dark Lord Bane and that he had killed the healer after he was restored. When in reality, Zana and her master were safely hidden away and concealed with her cloaking spell, the same one she fooled the Jedi with before, back in the archives. The Jedi cleared the camp and returned to Coruscant, while Zana and Darth Bane safely came out of hiding. Once again, the Jedi believed the Sith to be truly gone. The Jedi believed Darth Bane was dead. Zana was learning. She used the tools her master showed her, cunning and secrecy. Where are the Jedi? They went back to Coruscant. Explain. The Jedi arrived, and now they think you're dead, so they left. The healer? He's dead. Your cousin? Also dead. The Jedi killed him. Ah, good. I underestimated you, my apprentice. Had I known your plans, I would not have asked you to kill me. I swear this to you, my master. One day I will surpass you. One day you will no longer be of any use to me. And on that day, I will kill you, Lord Bane. But that day is not today. 
Over the next 10 years, Zana continues to study under Byrne, learning the words of the Sith. Her master is now in his mid-40s, while Zana recently turned 30. Her master, Darth Byrne, had clearly suffered physically due to the dark side. His appearance was rapidly aged, yet Zana was still the definition of beauty. Whether her power in Sith sorcery gave her some unique ability to stay looking this way, or she just simply had yet to see this corruption happen, was unclear. Over the past many years, Darth Zana had become so powerful and full of knowledge that she began to contemplate more and more her final confrontation with Bane. Recently, her master had been displaying a tremor in his left hand. Zana wasn't sure if this was a sign of his decaying old weak body, or just simply a test. She didn't know if her master was wanting to see if she would attack or not. This was the only thing that made her hesitate on striking out. Zana and Bane now lived on the world of Seutric 4. Here they posed as wealthy collectors and entrepreneurs. They had a large mansion to the east of the spaceport. This mansion also held the treasury of Darth Bane. However, Zana hadn't been granted access. She figured that if she wanted the knowledge inside, she'd probably have to take it by force. Darth Bane had sent word for Zana. He likely had a mission for her. As she entered the room, she once again noticed the tremor in her master's left hand. She pretends she didn't see it happen, and her master quickly pulls his arm under the table out of sight. Master, you sent for me? Yes, I need you to investigate something. In the outer rim is a ward named Dawn. A Jedi was killed here, three standard days ago. If someone killed a Jedi, then that's worthy of our attention. Do we know who did it? That is something you will need to find out. What was a Jedi doing on Dawn? That place has no use to the Council. That is also something you will need to discover for yourself. Jedi are likely sending their own to investigate this matter too. Not right away. The Royal House of Dawn is instead sending a political ambassador to Coruscant. They've done this intentionally to delay the investigation. They must be very rich to pull something like that off. Those type of favors don't come cheap. A planet in the outer rim with no real bearing on the galaxy. Yet, it has great riches, viable resources, mining. Correct. The planet no longer has much surface left for people to live on. I'll leave tonight. When Zana left, she once again considered the tremor she saw in her master's hand. She was still unsure whether or not this was some test. So far, she was convinced it was a test of patience to some degree. However, she decided that this was the last time she took orders from Darth Bane. She vowed to herself that the next time they meet, she would initiate her challenge for the rank of Master. For now, she would continue on this mission to Doan. A Jedi was killed on Doan, and Bane wanted to know why. So did Zana. It's not often a Jedi is killed, and if whoever killed them claimed to be followers of the Dark, it was their responsibility to eliminate them. This was the rule of two. There can be only one Master and one Apprentice. Zana began to wonder if she would perhaps find her own new apprentice on Doan. Perhaps whoever killed the Jedi would be a worthy candidate. She had been searching before now, but she never found anybody who was worthy enough to become her apprentice. Zana also wondered if Darth Bane had already thought of all this. What if he knew that Zana would search for a new apprentice on Doan? What if... Darth Bane no longer thought she was worthy and seeked to replace her. If that's your plan, Master, then you're gonna be in for a big surprise. Underestimate me at your own peril. When Zana arrives on Dern, she begins her investigation by questioning locals about the recent events with a Jedi. Although she needed to operate in secrecy, the death of a Jedi is news not many can keep hidden. The locals were sure to know something about what happened. Zana discovered that someone else had already been here, asking the same questions. She was told someone who seemed like a Jedi, who had silver hair, was asking the same questions a few days before. Zana decides it's best to trail this person in question, follow the lead of who he asked questions to. What Zana also discovered 
is that the miners of this world had uncovered a valuable find. The Jedi that was originally killed here was sent to recover the treasures. This meant that whatever was found was likely an artifact of the Force, so she now knew that whoever was asking questions before her was likely searching for this treasure, if it was still here of course. Eventually, Zana uncovered that the person asking questions was not a Jedi. The locals told her that this person was using physical force and torture to get answers, traits that are not typically found in a Jedi. Zana had used similar methods to acquire information here on Dun. The trail she followed ended at a cantina. Despite the sign saying closed, she made her way inside. She discovered a few bodies inside. None of them matched the description of the man she was following. She also knew to look for the cantina owner who was a Rodian. He didn't seem to be amongst the dead. At that moment, a person entered the cantina, but it was too dark to see. She revealed them with the light of her glow stick, and she saw a Rodian stood frozen in fear. She assumed that this was the cantina owner. Who are you? Did you steal Kwano's booze? I stole nothing. I came to ask you questions. Kwano, I presume. More questions? You a Jedi too? Like the other one? A Jedi? Do you mean the one who was killed? No, no. The other one. The human. Tall, with silver hair. I'm looking for him. But why do you think he's a Jedi? He has a lightsaber. He used it to give Kwano the scar. He tortured you? You poor thing. He wanted information. I'm sorry, Kwano. But I need information too. I need to know what you told him. Zana learned from the Rodian that this mysterious man with a lightsaber had come to Dern in search of artifacts that were dug up. The man found them, killed the miners and then took his reward. This happened two days ago. Zana had a new lead and now intended to follow it. She knew this man had the final answers she seeks and not only that, he could be a potential apprentice. From what she had learned, she had deduced that he was likely to be a Dark Jedi an enemy she would not underestimate. The Dark Jedi were indirectly more dangerous than even the Sith. A rogue Jedi only cares about themselves. They are driven by selfish actions that benefit only them. The Sith, on the other hand, are more calculated and far less reckless. The Rodian Quanah tells Zana that he knows someone at the spaceport who might be able to help find out where the man went. She was then introduced to someone at the spaceport who claimed to be able to find out the docking details. This person was also a friend of Quana, and they both saw an opportunity to make some credits out of Zana. A man with long silver hair came through here. Did you see him? Ah, oh, yeah. They had a real nice ship, state of the art, had a real nice interior, even nicer than yours. How would you know what the interior of my ship looks like? <laughs> He's a smuggler. Not exactly. Just a little side hustle I got going. Gotta pay the bills, you know? No, I don't know. Why don't you tell me? Oh, we have a fiery doll here, don't we? Let me break it down for you. I'm the only one who works here at night. The only point for a thousand K. I can pretty much do anything I want, including break into someone's shuttle. It's one of my many talents. If you're lucky, I'll show you my other talents later on. So, you break into people's ships and then steal from them? Nah, that'd be stupid. Too easy to be caught. So what do you do? I sneak inside, download the docking data, find out which worlds they're going to and from. I have a guy on Castle who sends me a shipment of Glimmer Stem each month. Whenever one of my contacts needs a spice delivered, I sneak into the ship, lose all the risk of smuggling myself. The owner is none the wiser, I get paid my credits. Spice smuggling is a capital crime on many worlds. Exactly. The owner of the ship gets in trouble if they decide to search it. So, when the man with the silver hair left, you snuck onto his ship and downloaded his docking data. Got it right here on my data pad. So you know his name? Where is he from? Yes, I do. But it's gonna cost you. Of course. Name your price. Go big! Go big! Remember, Guano get half. Uh, f 400 credits. Deal. Start talking. The person Zana dealed with at the spaceport told her that the man had come from Nal Hutter. 
Despite the name not matching his species, the dock worker insisted that the nav data was accurate. Out of curiosity, did you put a shipment on this man's ship? No, I don't deal in business of now, Hutter. They don't like small time interference. What about my ship? Nah, you're the first person ever came here from Zero Trek. <laughs> Zana responded by igniting her dual server. Immediately, she slices a gash through the dock worker's chest, while her second blood simultaneously removed the head of the Rodian Quana. The two dirtbags secured their deaths the moment the dock worker revealed he knew where Zana came from. Now knowing where the mysterious man went, Nal Hutter, along with having his ship's registration, she went after him. Using the vast network of spies, she and Bane now managed. Zana was able to use her own contacts to pinpoint the location of this mysterious man on Nal Hutter. She learned that his real name was Set Half, and that there were many rumours of him once being a Jedi. She also learned he was very wealthy. Zana could tell that this person was clearly vain and arrogant. When she arrived on Nal Hutter, she intended to break into Set's mansion while he was away at a party. She explores his home and sees that the man has a taste for expensive things. Art, rugs, sculptures could be found throughout. After a thorough search, Zana came across many Sith artifacts that Set had accumulated over time, majority of which were of little consequence, but the collection still appealed to Zana. It was impressive Set could obtain anything at all. Then, Zana sensed that Set had returned. She didn't mask her presence in the mansion. She wanted to know if he could sense her presence, as she could him. When she looks over the balcony rail, she sees that Set is simply seated and drinking wine. Zana was disappointed to see her potentially new apprentice be so contempt. She jumps over the railing and lands in the room where he is seated. Greetings. I don't believe I have had the pleasure. My name is... Set Harf? I know who you are. Why don't you make yourself comfortable? Plenty of room for both of us. I'd rather stand. Follow me home from the party, did you? Normally I wouldn't forget such a pretty face. Before she could respond, Set had summoned his lightsaber and had thrown it across the room at Zana. At first, she thought she had made a mistake by coming here and finding only a womanizing fool. But when the attack came, she realised that he had known he was in danger and needed to catch her off guard. Obviously, Zana was able to evade this pitiful attack. The man tried to use his power in the force to push Zana across the room, but it failed. Zana was trained by the Dark Lord of the Sith and such basic attacks were something she mastered as a teenager. Blocking the man's push was an easy task. You're a Jedi? A Sith. I thought the Sith were all gone. Not yet. Let me see if I can fix that. Only now did Zana ignite her saber. The two engage and their battle begins. Set's first assault had him try to sweep Zana at the legs and to throw objects at her using the force. Zana outmaneuvered everything. She wanted to see what this former Jedi's potential was, so instead of using her full power, she merely taunted the man by countering his attacks with light blows intended to frustrate him. After a short amount of time, it was clear to Zana that she had her opponent significantly outmatched. Zana was proficient in recognising and defending against many forms of saber styles. Her own personal expertise, however, came in the form of Sorisu defence. Using this, she could more than easily defend against Set's weak attacks and still stay strong and full of stamina. She was essentially the master of wearing down an opponent. During their fight, Zana saw more than a dozen opportunities to kill and finish her opponent off. But she had come here in search of a new apprentice, and killing was not the intention. Now that she had seen proof he had potential to be trained, she was satisfied in her choice of apprentice. Despite not being able to beat Zana, she wasn't expecting him to. Now, she had one thing left to do. She could just simply force Set into being her apprentice, however this would eventually prove foolish. She had the obligation to make her apprentice want to train under her. She had to show Set that she was so superior in the power of the dark side that he would have no choice but to want to learn from her, eager to learn her secrets. 
Zana lashed out and kicked Set hard in the chin. She called out and said, do you yield? However, the rogue Jedi lashed out once more, and in response, Zana reached out to his mind and initiated her sorcery. Zana shredded through his defenses and wrapped his mind around the void. His body falls to the floor as he slips into a comatose state. This was his final test. If he was weak-minded, then the spell would leave him in despair and fear, forever a husk. If his will proved strong, however, he would awaken. With her task of obtaining an apprentice complete, Zana decides it's time to return to Seutric 4 and confront her master, Darth Bane. On the return journey to Seutric 4, Zana's new apprentice had awoken from his final test. Zana's plan had worked and Set was now willing to become her apprentice. She informed Set of the situation and where they were going. She also explained her master and how she was about to challenge him. At first, Set thought Zana wanted him to help her defeat Bain, but Zana clarified that she would be facing Bain alone. Attacking the master in numbers was the old way of the Sith. Now, only the rule of two applied. The apprentice must earn the title of Dark Lord by killing their master. This was the only way to keep the Sith strong. It ensures each master is stronger than the one who came before. Together, they both arrive on Seutric 4. One of Zana's personal contacts at the spaceport reached out to her to inform her that someone had recently landed near their mansion. Before they touched down, Zana had also sensed a disturbance, so now she started to think that something had happened. Her contact also said that her brother, who was actually Darth Bane however, they just posed as siblings for cover here on Seutric 4. The contact said her brother had recently returned only a few hours before the foreign shuttle landed outside the spaceport to the east. Zana and her new apprentice jump into a speeder and head toward the mansion. Zana knew that her master was up to something. He never leaves Seutric 4, so whatever the reason he left, she knew it wasn't in her favour. However, when she grew closer to the mansion, she realised she could not sense her master's presence at all. Upon entering, she discovered the front door was already open and that the foyer looked like it had been in a battle. Furniture was turned over and smashed and scorch marks riddled the woodwork. Someone had captured her master. She didn't know how or why or even who did it, but she could sense that her master had been taken prisoner. This kind of changed her plans. She originally intended to come back here and confront Bane in her final lesson. However, if his kidnappers were to kill her master, then she would be robbed of her ascension to the Dark Lord of the Sith. She had no choice but to find her master so she could initiate the final battle and rightfully claim her place in destiny. So far, Zana's new apprentice was starting to seem more and more unkeen of being her apprentice. She senses doubt and hesitation in his mind. However, after Set discovered a small badge bearing the insignia of the Royal Dern House, they both figured out where the captors had taken her master Darth Bane. Zana was obliged to obey the rule of two and seek her master out to destroy him. If she allowed him to be a prisoner, he might escape and then hunt her down. She couldn't allow this. Zana sends Set on a mission to recover more information about Dern. In the meantime, she went to visit a contact of Darth Bane's. She wanted to know why he had left the planet. When she met with a man named Agul Ten, she learned that her undercover brother, Darth Bane, had been asking questions about a Darth and Dedu. Zana didn't recognise the name and wasn't able to cross-reference it with anything she already had. However, when she mumbled the name to her apprentice, he latched on and explained that he knew who Darth and Dedu was. He was said to be the immortal god king of Pragath. Through Set, Zana learned that Darth and Dedu were said to have discovered the secret to immortality. A realization came crashing down on Zana. Her master had distracted her so he could seek out this secret of eternal life. From Zana's point of view, this was in direct violation of the rule of two. She wondered if her master was trying to circumvent the rule of two by making himself immortal. She knew now, more than ever, that now was the time to strike. With her new apprentice in tow, they both take off for the planet Dern. As it would turn out, 
Darth Bane had apparently been kidnapped by someone inside of the royal house. He was currently being held at the heart of an old maximum security facility. Bane was the only occupant. When Zana and Set arrive, she instructs her apprentice to wait with the ship until she has returned. The fight with Bane is hers alone. Zana rushes into the prison and disguises herself in the shadows. Her movement noise was mute and she moved too fast to see without visible light. Eventually, Zana senses the growing power of her master and then suddenly, the alarms of the prison start to go off. She feels a disturbance in the force and knows that this was her master escaping. Probably by now, he was able to sense her presence too. So she forgets about stealth and moves into a much faster stride to hunt down her master. Hunt, her master. This was it. He had proven himself unworthy of being the master by trying to circumvent the rules. Trying to steal her place as the rightful Dark Lord. She ignites her saber and moves faster than she ever moved before. Then, she sees him, simply stood down the corridor, talking with a female human. His guard was totally dropped. He was talking to someone from his past, Zana was able to tell. Bane was just talking with her like some casual affair on the sidewalks of Coruscant. Zana builds her power and unleashes it with a mighty force push that sends her master reeling. She caught both of them off guard. However, Bane was able to shield himself just in time and dampen the push. The female he was talking with could not say the same. She was sent careering down the corridor, flipping and smashing into walls. The first blow had been dealt. The confrontation had begun. You dare to violate the rule of two. You dare to steal my ascension from me. Ugh, what are you talking about, you fool? I know you went to Pregov. I know you seek the secret of immortality. I have lived by the rule of two ever since I brought it into existence. Yet, you intend to make yourself immortal. You seek to be the master for all time. You are unworthy of being my apprentice. You wanted to wait until I became old and weak. No, you will not turn this on me. You promised me I would become the Dark Lord. Now you want to take that away from me. The title of Dark Lord must be earned. Seized from the all-powerful grasp of the master. That is why I am here. Do you really think you can defeat me, Apprentice? <laughs> you allowed yourself to be captured by those royalists. You even allowed yourself to be caught alone without your lightsaber. Bane was near helpless. He hadn't recovered fully, and right now he didn't have his weapon with him. Zana danced and flourished around her master, teasing him into a pathetic death. However, Darth Bane was not so easily subdued. He was able to jump and twist and maneuver out of every advantage she had on him, until eventually their bout was cut short when her master's lightning attack sets off one of the hidden charges in the walls. Debris and rocks fall to separate them both. The exchange was short, yet Zana had learned a lot. She realized that she allowed Bane to lure her in, coaxing her into a dance routine. If Zana had gathered her power and used her Sith sorcery, the fight would have taken a different turn. Zana returns to her ship only to realize that her new apprentice, the rogue Jedi Set, was not there. She had sensed his hesitation before, but she wasn't so sure he would do a runner that fast. But that is what happened. Set had taken off, and now Zana was all alone. No master, and no apprentice. Zana takes her ship into the vast nothingness of space and decides to think, meditate, then, she gets a message from Darth Bane. Her master wanted to meet on Ambria. Zana couldn't help but find the choice of location somewhat funny. Bane had already nearly died twice now on Ambria, knowing that it is her destiny to seize the mantle of Dark Lord away from Bane. She immediately makes her way for Ambria. Bane was waiting for her there, near the old healer's camp. To Zana's surprise, Bane had a new apprentice at his side an Iktochi female named Darth Cognus. This Iktochi had vowed to pledge allegiance to the warrior, to the winner of Bane and Zana's duel. These terms were acceptable to her. She was in need of a new apprentice anyways. 
Darth Zana approaches her old master. Today, your reign ends, Darth Bane. Come, Zana. Your final lesson awaits. My power far surpasses yours now. I am the master. Then prove it. Darth Cogner simply stood by and watched the duel. What she was witnessing was the future of the Sith, and quite possibly, even the galaxy. In utter awe, she could not take her eyes away from the fight. Darth Bane had charged and gone on the offensive. Zana simply blocked, parried, and deflected each one of his attacks. Both were skilled with their respective weapons, but when two powerhouses like this meet, it is not your weapon skill that decides the fight, but that of your ability to draw on the dark side of the Force. As Sith, both were accustomed to feeding off of their enemy's fear, but right now, only the burning flames of anger, passion, and strength were roaring. Doom Mock was not possible here. However, Zana trips on a recently dug grave and stumbles to the floor. Bane was on her in a fraction of a second, kicking her hard in the ribs and fracturing at least one. Zana managed to roll away and escape in killing blow. Knowing that now was the time to show her master just how powerful she had become. Within one second, Zana dominates her master's mind, using her Sith sorcery. She drags out his worst fears and nightmares, bringing them to life before his eyes. For a moment, she thought she had won. Bane was flailing around and screaming. Then the scream got louder and louder, until eventually a cloud of dark side energy bursts. Zana senses that her master had broken free of her magics. His will was incredibly strong. Bane lunged at her, looking to land a finishing blow, but Zana was too quick. She had already gathered her power and released it in the form of dark smoke that crept across the land. This forced Bane to stop and think about his next move. Then, the smoke materializes huge and long tendrils and they lash out at Bane. He was able to dodge the first flurry but then he was struck on the shoulder by one of the tendrils. The location it hit was completely burned away, like it just cut out a piece of flesh. The pain Darth Bane felt could only be compared to the nothingness of the void. His lightsaber and force attacks were doing no harm to Zana's sorcery, and he knew he was about to lose. In a last desperate attempt, Bane lunges again and flips and dives through the tendrils until he reaches Zana. Then, he kicks her legs out from under her, sending her crashing to the ground. Ben swings to remove her head, except the tendrils behind had caught up and latched onto Ben's saber arm and whipped through it. Darth Ben's arm fell away from his body, including his weapon. Now, both of them are on the ground. Ben grabs Zana by the ankle and then he's gone. A flash of light and her master disappeared, except... He was still here. She could feel him, sense him. She was him, or oh, he was her. Somehow, Bane had thrown his essence into Zana's body. Two wills stand off internally, neither side willing to budge an inch and surrender to the other, and then it was over. Darth Zana, successor of Darth Bane, and the new Dark Lord of the Sith, rises to claim victory. The ascension she was once promised had not been given to her, but she had taken it. Zana claims Cognus as her new apprentice, and her rule began. Despite winning the Battle of Wills against her master, she would forever be scarred with the same tremor rumbling through her left hand. Valkorion has given me free reign over his child. Death is the only line I am forbidden to cross. But the last subject I brought to the chamber went mad and clawed his own eyes out. I must recalibrate the machines before I use them on Valen. She must learn that defiance has consequences. Isolation, fear, pain. I thought Valen would scream or cry. Maybe even beg for mercy. But when the pain from the machines became too much to bear, she started laughing. A hideous, high-pitched cackle. The glorious sound of her spirit breaking. Sanity is a prison. Let madness release you.
Dragon of the Cold. Did you think I lost your way to punish you? No. You had to learn. You had to be... conditioned. Kneel before the Dragon of Zakul! I will not die here, no! Not in this place! If you fight, you will die. Some time after Revan faced the Emperor on Dromund Cars, or perhaps even before that, the Sith Emperor had travelled into wild space and discovered new worlds and new superweapons. Using the technology of Iokath and the mysterious Eternal Fleet which laid in slumber, the Sith Emperor was able to establish a new civilization on the world of Zakul. Here he built his new society in secret, where for centuries he would be revered as their immortal emperor. For many centuries, the emperor managed both the empire and Zakul with great efficiency. It wasn't until the birth of his children when he became distracted with a new experiment, a family. It's a well-known fact that after the Treaty of Coruscant, the Emperor went silent. This is very likely the time the Emperor decided to abandon his empire and focus his efforts on Zakul. Valkorion had married one of his knights who once stood guard for him. This was Senya Tyrell. Together they had three children, two twin sons and one daughter, Valen. We do not know the exact date of birth for Valen, but we can assume her rough age as she is young throughout the story. In the beginning, Valkorion had sensed that his daughter Valen had great potential with the Force. She was a well waiting to be tapped. However, as Valen grew older, her emotions and tantrums became harder to control. She once killed a Zakulan knight in reaction to a dispute over a small playing ball. As we know from the CGI trailer, Valen had another incident involving Zakul knights, which ultimately led to Valkorion intervening with her power. In reality, her father had seen himself in Valen, young, teeming with power and ambitious. It frightened him. He knew where this path would lead and steps had to be taken to prevent Valen from challenging his power. Valen had actually inherited many of her father's force abilities, a fact she would later discover. However, it's more than likely that Valkorion sensed she had this deep connection. He knew how much to fear her and how to move forward. Her mother, Senya, had spent Valen's younger years trying to teach her control and peace. When Valkorion took over with her training, she thought that things would get better. However, Valkorion took Valen to the world of Nathema, the same world he consumed a millennia ago. On this world, Valen wouldn't be able to draw on the Force, and her mind would be attacked from the presence of the Void. Of course, her father shielded her and his minions from this, yet the longer-lasting effects would inevitably draw near. To explain, Valen basically grew from a young girl to a grown woman while being on Nathema. This alone would be enough to send the most powerful of the Force users into madness. This absolutely contributed to her personality festering with madness. Her mother Senya did once attempt to rescue Valen from her incarceration, but she ultimately failed. Furthermore, it was already too late. Valen had already grown to despise her mother for abandoning her the first time, despite her mother not knowing the full truth behind the facility on Nathema. The reality was, Valen was subjected to cruel and vile experiments by the keepers of the facility. Many journals and hollow recordings explain some of her time there. Valkorion has given me free reign over his child. Death is the only line I am forbidden to cross. Fortunately, he has provided numerous subjects to test my more radical experiments on first. The beasts ripped a young man apart. He died screaming in front of Valen, but she made no move to help. Things are progressing well. 
My late Valen observed our dissections today. Showed her each twisted, broken corpse from every failed experiment. I let her see the damage caused by the implants and chemicals. Now she knows what lies ahead. Valen killed another keeper today. She must learn that defiance has consequences. Isolation, fear, pain. Sometimes the simplest tools are the most effective. Conventional methods only go so far. But the last subject I brought to the chamber went mad and clawed his own eyes out. I must recalibrate the machines before I use them on Valen. Valen went from a luxury skyscraper home with a beautiful garden to suddenly living in a small cage protected by a shield. A torture chair led not even 20 feet away from her room. There was often people observing her while she slept or just played with hand-carved toys. Part of her punishment for lashing out against the keepers was isolation. She had no social interaction other than the scientists and guides that came to poke and prod at her. She lived a truly sad life. Valkorion had over time managed to condition Valen's mind and locking away a good portion of her power, meaning she would now always have a ceiling limit that couldn't be broken. Even with this conditioning in place, Valen was very powerful still and had to remain on Nathema to undergo strict discipline routines until she came of age. On rare occasion, her brother Fexen would come to visit her on Nathema. However, when the time came for her to return home, Valkorion sent her brother Arkan to retrieve her rather than Fexen. We do not know why. When Valen returns to Zakul for the first time in years, she kneels before her father and swears loyalty to him. However, her true ambitions lied in that of revenge. Revenge against her mother for leaving her and against her father for mistreating her. For now, she would bide her time and allow her power to grow. She even went on to form a stronger bond with her brothers. Eventually, the eternal raids take place, and the story of the Knights of the Fallen Empire begin. Valen is roughly 21 at the start of this. However, there is a 5 year time skip during the game, which means she is actually 26 for most of the story now. During Knights of the Fallen Empire, Valen takes the position of High Justice. This was right after the Outlander, or Arkan, destroys Valkorion's body near the throne. While her brother assumed the mantle of Emperor, Valen led the charge with the Horizon Guards section of the military. This was due mostly to the fact that she very much disliked the Zakulan knights and didn't want to work with them. In fact, she would often be seen abusing the knights yet again and killing them on a whim. Knowing that her father's body was destroyed now, Valen focused her efforts on revenge against her mother. Eventually, the two of them get to face off on the hideout known as Asylum. <laughs> I don't want to hurt you. I liked you better when you were dead. <laughs> Despite being less powerful in the force, Senya was able to overwhelm Valen with her experience in combat. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was always Valen's weakness, but she would always attempt it anyways. If she used her power in the force to attack instead, it would have been different. For now, Senya escapes and Valen loses this round. Over the next year, the Outlander faces Arkan on his flagship and defeats him. Valen tried to intercept Senya once again here, however, her brother Arkan had defended Senya. Why? Why? Phelan, there's hope for you. For both of you. Come with me.
This outraged Valen and caused her to now hate her brother for switching his loyalties and betraying her revenge. Senya and Arkin both escaped, but Valen wasn't far behind them. The Scions of Zakul had reached out to Senya and told her to go to Ord Mantell, which is where she would find allies. However, Valen managed to get there first and slaughter everyone loyal to Senya before she arrived. In the CGI trailer for Betrayed, we see Senya walking over the bodies and then Valen throws the hand-carved toy into a nearby puddle of starship fuel. After the trailer ends, the fight actually continues. You can check out this video for a full rundown of the aftermath here. The fight was cut short when Valen threw Senya's lightsaber pike into a hyperdrive engine and it exploded. Valen actually shielded Senya from the blast and allowed her to live but Valen herself was wounded and retreated to heal. With Arkan and her father now gone, Valen was now Empress of Zakul and ruler of the Eternal Fleet. At the time, she was aided by the Gemini droid Scorpio, who helped command the fleet with her superior technology. Valen later used the might of the Eternal Fleet to cause chaos across the galaxy, as she continued her hunt for the Outlander and her mother. She also knew she needed a way to rid her father's spirit forever. By now she thought she would be powerful enough to face him, but she would soon learn this was not the case yet. During Valen and the Outlander's meeting on the gravestone some time later, Valkorion appears and demonstrates Valen's conditioning. Along with sealing some of her power away, Falcorion was able to subjugate her mind with the mere mention of a phrase. Kneel before the dragon of the cool. No! Oh, that's not! Did you think I locked you away to punish you? No. You had to learn. You had to be conditioned. Kneel before the dragon of the cool. What did you do to me? If you fight, you will die. This conditioning caused Valen to feel immeasurable pain. The more she fought it, the more it would hurt, and it would even kill her if she resisted too much. She was forced to flee the battle. Of course, Valen was not happy about the revelation of her conditioning. With her new command as Empress, she was able to revisit the Nathema Keepers and instruct them to undo whatever her father had done. They had told her it was possible, but the process could kill her. Eventually, the machinery and other necessary preparations had been made. Valen had to interact with a grand force imbued machine that would remove her mental barrier and allow her to tap into all the power she had stored within. The process became dangerous and Valen was shrieking in pain. She even calls out for help. realizes only she can get herself out of this and is then able to take control of her power. Valen's power boils over and explodes in waves throughout the facility. Her chains were broken. Once she was safe aboard her ship, she used her new strength to force the facility to explode from within, leaving nothing but ashes, a destructive end for the location that caused her so much suffering. Valen goes on to rampage across the world of Odessan, which is also the location of her final stand against the Outlander. I have no more power over Valen. Only you are strong enough to stop this. The Eternal Throne is mine! Forget the throne. 
Forget everything. Despite breaking her chains and becoming more powerful, Valen was not able to defeat the Outlander, and she falls in battle. Her essence explodes and her spirit is consumed, along with her power, into Valkorion. The truth of the matter is, Valkorion intended on using Valen's power to help him conquer the Outlander's mind. When Valkorion's final face-off happens from within the Holocron, all his children and even Senya show up to finish him off. Valen even had the chance to cite her conditioning phrase to her father. Look at your father, Valen, trapped in the cage he built for you. Kneel, father! Kneel before the dragon of Zakol! After Valkorion's defeat here, Valen's spirit is not destroyed. In fact, she is able to once again materialize within the mind of Satil Shan so she may help defeat her father's true identity, Tenebrae. While she does aid in his ultimate defeat, Valen actually escaped the mind realm by invading the body of a nearby Padawan. Thanks for watching this video, be sure to check out my explained playlist and may the force be with you. <laughs>Alec was forced to flee his homeworld and find refuge within the Republic's safety net. It didn't take too long after that for the Jedi to sense that Alec was Force sensitive. Given the fact that he needed a new home, and he had potential with the Force, the Jedi Order decided to take him in and train him. This was still before the Mandalorian Wars had reached the Core Worlds. For now, everyone was safe. Alec spent most of his time being trained on Coruscant, along with his fellow Padawans. Among them, he met a human male named Revan. Quickly, they both became friends and were almost always seen together. Alec had surely felt so alone during his time of training. He was so far from home and didn't really know anyone, but meeting Revan had given him a reason to keep moving forward. As we all know, Revan himself inspired loyalty in those around him. He was a natural born leader. Alec was probably drawn to this and wanted to cling to it, as it was something he did not have himself. He was inspired by Revan. All of this helped them both form a strong bond as not only friends, but partners. During this era, it was not uncommon for Padawans to be taught or seek out knowledge from multiple Jedi Masters. Alec followed where Revan led, so Alec was also trained to some extent by all those who trained Revan, despite what might appear as rivalry to others, was in fact an equal brotherly bond. However, eventually the Mandalorian Wars moved closer and closer to the Core Worlds. The Republic was now forced to get involved, yet the Jedi Council refused to aid them. Because of this, a faction of Jedi led by Revan and Alec had decided to disobey the Jedi Council and instead help the Republic in its time of need. When the Council discovered these actions, an arrest warrant was issued for the rogue Jedi. This is likely why Revan started wearing a mask, and why Alec 
changed his name to Malak. To avoid obvious detection from authorities, I also wonder if Malak tattoos his head at this point too as another identity blur, but it's quite possible he had them from a child as per some tradition on his homeworld. Revan and Malak had successfully created a faction of Jedi that wanted to help the Republic win the war. It was even Malak who recruited Mitra Surik, later known as the Exile, to the cause. As we know from here, Revan, Malak and Mitra were able to help the Republic claim victory against the Mandalorians, but this came at a great cost. Mitra had activated the Mass Shadow Generator, a super weapon that would surely guarantee exile for anyone involved. Malak knew what he was getting into, but he followed Revan. He trusted him. Together, Revan and Malak had discovered a sinister plot, but clues still needed to be revealed. When Revan defeated Mandalore in one versus one combat, Mandalore had confessed that the Sith provoked the war. Rather than returning to Coruscant and the Jedi Council after winning the war, Malak and Revan went in search of more clues to the mysterious Sith threat. The reason they took this so seriously is because the Sith were meant to be extinct at this point in time. To think one existed somewhere was a dangerous line of thought, one that had to be discerned. Malak and Revan were led to the planet Rekiad, where they discovered an ancient Sith tomb which housed a Sith Lord's remains. What they found inside this tomb led them to the world of Nafima. When the two Jedi Knights stood on the surface of this planet, they knew they had to take this threat more seriously than anything before. Someone had completely devoured the presence of the Force here. After investigating the planet further, they discovered more clues, which led them to another world. Dromund Kars, a storm-covered planet hidden deep within the Outer Rim. The dark side was powerful here, very powerful. Revan and Malak had discovered the hidden Sith Empire. They were both in complete shock but they needed to take action. Returning to the council would be futile. They would simply be exiled and no one would listen. They had to do this on their own. Over time, they were both able to pose as mercenaries. Using this cover, they obtained as much information on the Sith Empire as they could. What they found out was unsettling. The Empire had been in hiding for over a thousand years, led by an emperor who was just as old. Allegedly, there is a whole skew of politics, including even a dark council and several spheres of influence. They also found out it was the Sith Emperor that devoured the previous world they searched. Knowing that Mandalore confessed to Sith influence, Revan and Malak knew it would be best to confront and defeat the Sith Emperor without anyone knowing they had even been there. Hopefully, that would be enough to stop any kind of attack. Using their skills and persuasion, they were able to gain a contact from within the Emperor's Citadel. A Citadel guard so happened to be on Revan and Malak's side. This guard knew the Emperor was an evil person and needed to be dealt with. However, they were betrayed by the guard, who was in fact under the Emperor's control the entire time. Malak and Revan thought they were sneaking up on the Emperor, but he had actually outplayed them. While they were within his presence, their minds became corrupted. Knowing only the dogmatic teachings of the Jedi meant that they had no defense against this. The Emperor subdued their minds with ease and bent them to his will. The Emperor had his own plan for these two, new Dark Lords. He told his own Dark Council that he killed Malak and Revan. What he actually did was far worse. He forced Revan and Malak to return to the Republic as his Dark Lords, as his vanguard of invasion. Revan and Malak were instructed to find the Starforge and use it to crush the Republic's defences. But there was a fatal flaw in the Emperor's plan. He had severely underestimated Malak and Revan. When they returned, their minds were once again sent into Haywire. The new dark side presence had tainted their thoughts. Somehow, they were able to twist and contort the Emperor's instructions until they truly believed it was their own idea. Somehow, their minds removed all memory of the Emperor and the Sith Empire they discovered. I have reason to believe that the Emperor actually did this intentionally. He wired Revan and Malak to turn on the Republic. Whether or not they did this under his banner didn't really matter, but that would contradict the Emperor wanting them to return word of their success. Anyways, moving forward, Revan and Malak were still corrupted to the dark side. However, they were under no direct influence from the Emperor anymore. With them falling to the dark side, they did of course take the Darth title. Malak was now Darth Malak. However, Darth Malak and Darth Revan's relationship 
completely changed. They were once close friends and partners. Now, they were both fallen Jedi claiming to be Dark Lords. The dynamic of the relationship needed to change with them. Revan believed he was the more powerful Sith, so he proclaimed himself the new Dark Lord. Malak had likely disagreed in some way. This will be how Malak lost his jaw in a fight between Revan to decide who is a master and who is an apprentice. According to Revan's code, there cannot be two Dark Lords. The power should be embodied within a single leader. This means Revan chose to no longer see Malak as his equal. He was less than. Accepting this truth was hard for Malak. It would forever cast a shadow over him that he was not good enough to be the Dark Lord. In my own opinion, Malak's fall to the dark side is cemented when he realises he lost his friend Revan. He would no longer be seen in the same way again. He would be expected to kneel, say yes my lord, thank you my lord, what is thy bidding my lord? The thought probably made him sick to the stomach. This would eat at him, along with his injury being a constant reminder of being weak. He would decide to bide his time for his revenge. While Revan would dance around the Republic and seek out new knowledge, Malak would spearhead the domination of the galaxy, being relentless with his assaults. Eventually, as we know from the Kurtor game, a Jedi strike team was able to infiltrate Revan's flagship and confront him on the bridge. In this moment, Malak saw his opportunity to fire on his master and take his place. A cowardly and cheap way to defeat Revan, perhaps, but effective nonetheless. And since when was the dark side about being chivalrous? Malak had turned on Revan and fired on his ship. You cannot win, Revan. Assuming he had killed Revan, Malak takes his place as the Dark Lord and continues his domination of the entire galaxy. Malak moved forward unfazed at the loss of his former friend, ever proving that he has grown to hate Revan, to despise him. Revan was everything that Malak was not, or perhaps that was just what he told himself. Malak knew that the only real threat to him now was the Jedi prodigy Basta Lashan, who was the most powerful force user of battle meditation in the galaxy. Malak spent his time and resources pursuing this Jedi across the galaxy, resulting in the bombardment of Taris, which was meant to draw her out of hiding. Resume the bombardment, Commander. Wipe this pathetic planet from the face of the galaxy. Then later, Malak sends Kalo Nord, the bounty hunter, however, that was also when Darth Malak discovered something incredible. Kalo Nord had told Darth Malak that Revan was with Bastila Lashan. Malak could not believe what he was hearing. It didn't make sense. How could he be alive? Then it all started to come together. Malak had discerned that the Jedi Council had wiped Revan's mind and were once again trying to teach him to be a Jedi. Malak found the entire thing to be a comedic charade, so much so that he allowed it to continue while he pursued Bastila. Not much later, Malak and Revan met once again and the revelation comes full circle. The Jedi do not believe in killing their prisoners. No one deserves execution, no matter what their crimes. The Council would not normally accept an adult for training. But this is a special case. They say the Force can do terrible things to a mind. It can wipe away your memories and destroy your very identity. Tatooine. Kashyyyk. Manan. Korriban. Revan visited each of these worlds searching for clues to reveal the hidden location of the Starforge. The lure of the dark side is difficult to resist. I fear this quest to find the Starforge could lead you down an all too familiar path. 
What greater weapon is there than to turn an enemy to your cause? To use their own knowledge against them. Malak tells Revan what happened to him, but it's hard for him to accept, and he remained with the light side. Master Lashan intervenes with this confrontation, while Revan and his friends escape. Malak was able to finally capture Master Lashan, and he successfully turned her to the dark side. <laughs> you are strong, child. But I will break you. I'll never fall to the dark side. You think torture will turn me, Malik? You are a fool. Torture? No, dear Bastula. You misunderstand. This is but a taste of the dark side to whet your appetite. When you finally swear loyalty to me, it will be willingly. Never. <laughs> Such resolve in your words, but I see the truth in your heart. The dark side calls to you, Bastula. You hunger to taste it. Become my apprentice, and all its power can be yours. <laughs> <laughs> She would be brought back to the light later on by Revan of course. With the help of the Republic Armada, Revan was able to confront Malak for the final time on board the Starforge space station. In this final fight, Malak is very powerful. He was able to drain the life of those around him and even had great mastery over Force Lightning and Stasis. However, the Jedi hero Revan had overcome Malak's strength. Darth Malak refused to turn back to the light he continued the fight until his last breath, and only in his final moments did he see clearly for the first time. The reason I believe this is a tragic tale is because we start out with two very good friends who were then later forced into a hateful relationship with such horrible terms that no friendship could ever survive. The dark side inspires rivalry and strife. After all, Malak and Revan face death together they travelled the entire galaxy and even confronted the Sith Emperor. All of this was lost, but never forgotten. If you enjoyed this video, please subscribe to the channel as more is always coming. Thank you for watching, and may the Force be with you. I suppose you speak the truth. I alone must accept responsibility for my fate. I wanted to be master of the Sith and ruler of the galaxy. But that destiny was not mine, Revan. <coughs> it might have been yours, perhaps, but never mine. And in the end, as the darkness takes me, I am nothing. That lump in your throat, it's panic. Long ago, you sought to free us from Belsar's prison. Since then, you have grown. In mind and body. In skill and in spirit. Meanwhile, we have tasted death. First, the pupils dilate. Muscles tighten. Hysteria replaces rationality. And then, the mind shatters. The dark side is strong with you, but you are in the presence of true power now. You only delay what must be. Drawman Kars, Nar Shaddaa, and Coruscant, 
Populations will be infected, and planets overgrown. Mothers will kill daughters as soldiers weep in terror. All you love for the prize will fall. You will try to stop our ships and fail. Then you will be ready to join us. Hundreds of years before the Sith Empire returned from hiding, there were six powerful Sith Lords, each with a name that inspired fear into the hearts of those who heard them. Brontes, Styrak, Calphius, Tyrans, Bestia, and Raptus. This group of human lords were famous within the Sith Empire as established advisors and researchers under direct order of the Emperor himself. Over time, this group began to realise that working in unison, becoming whole together, would exponentially increase their power capacity. With this realisation came a new doctrine for the group. With Raptus as their unofficial leader of sorts, he directed them to mostly meditation and research on the Sith capital, Drummond Cars. The Emperor had constructed three devices imbued with powerful ancient dark side magics named the Phobis device. The purpose of this creation was to inspire fear and insanity in one's mind. However, the power held within was far too strong for any mere Sith to manage, barring the Emperor himself. So, at his orders, the core device was placed within the Dark Temple on Drummond Cars, where to this day, it still sends the minds of those who come wandering completely insane. Raptus and the other Sith Lords were so intrigued by these creations that they personally requested to be able to study one of the devices so that they may unlock the secret to inflicting terror and madness. Knowing that the Sith Lords had a profound reputation when working together, along with his favoritism towards them, the Emperor allowed their request. When he saw that they were able to contain the device's power and understand how to harness it, the Emperor allowed the group to transport thousands of slaves to a secret moon named Oricon so that they may construct a facility to conduct their new paramount research. All of this was done in secrecy from the overall Sith Empire, even the Dark Council. This was the Emperor's personal project now. The result was the construction of the Dread Palace on Oricon, along with the group's ascension into new roles, the Dread Masters. The group was able to fully harness the power of fear, terror, death and dread. However, Controlling this power could only be done with all six of them working in perfect unison. They relied on one another to hold each other up. Any other Sith Lord who attempted this before had fallen into madness and despair, yet the Dreadmasters were able to control this power while still maintaining control of their own minds. With their newfound power, the Emperor unleashed the Dreadmasters against the Republic after they returned to onslaught the galaxy in 28 BTC. Together, the Dreadmasters were able to conduct a powerful form of dark side battle meditation. However, this battle meditation would not increase the reflexes of their own starship pilots, nor would it enhance the strength of those battling on the ground. No. The Dreadmaster's meditation would send entire Republic armies into madness, striking at the enemy from within. The Dreadmasters alone were able to single-handedly incapacitate an entire army from a Dreadnought in space. This Dreadnought was kept constantly moving so the Republic could not intervene. But the Republic's patience with the Masters was wearing thin. They deployed Jedi Master Jarek Caden to infiltrate the Dreadnoughts and stop the Dreadmasters. This Jedi in particular was said to be a living weapon of the Force, a truly formidable opponent for any Sith. Against all odds, the Dreadmasters were captured and then imprisoned in secret on the world of Belsavis. The Republic wanted the galaxy to believe the Dreadmasters were dead, so they announced that publicly. Yet the truth was much worse. They had decided to keep them prisoner. 
within a top secret prison that used old Rakatan technology, a testament to the power it takes to hold the masters. Many years later, after the Treaty of Coruscant and during the timeline of Star Wars The Old Republic, an agent of the Emperor was sent to Belsavis in order to recruit a notorious individual who could help free the Dreadmasters from the Belsavis prison. The Emperor wanted his most valuable assets back in his collection. The person recruited to free the Masters is the player character of the game. In an unusual turn of events, a native species of Belsavis that were kept dormant, named Eshkar, had escaped their own type of prison and began wreaking havoc for the Empire and Republic alike. This series of events would see a group of Force-using Eshgar attempt to use the power of the Dreadmasters to escape their enemies and leave the world. However, this plan proves flawed when the player character walks in and slays all of the Eshgar, leading to the Dreadmasters being freed from their Force-imbued cages. With the Dreadmasters free, the Emperor was pleased. This was just another event that adds to the notice the Emperor takes in you much later on. To learn more about the Emperor or any other Old Republic character, be sure to check out my Explained playlist and subscribe, as more is always coming. Once again, this mission with the Dreadmasters was top secret, and their overall existence was still uncertain to most of the Sith Empire. Centuries had passed, and this group became private after their first discoveries with the Phobis device. The Dreadmasters returned to their secret palace on Oricon, where they would continue to aid the Emperor in his designs. However, soon after their release, the Emperor is rumoured to have been confronted by a Jedi on Dromund Kars, and had been killed. This news travelled fast within the Empire, and once the Dreadmasters discovered this, or even probably sensed it, they decided to reject the Dark Council and create their own new Sith Empire, and appointing themselves the Dread Council. As their presence was essentially new to the galaxy again, and their history shrouded in secrecy, the Masters decided to hire a Trandosian warrior by the name of Kethis, who could act as a face for their conquest of the galaxy. They sent Kethis to claim the world Dinerva in their name. However, these efforts were thwarted and the Empire and Republic began to stumble down the path of discovery for the Dreadmasters. With the failure on Dinerva, the group moved on to another project that saw the summoning of a great creature known as the Terror from Beyond. The Dreadmasters had also healed and rebuilt their warlord Kethis. However, both Kephis and the Great Beast were defeated and driven back. At this point, the Empire and Republic recognised the Dreadmasters as a new adversary in the war between factions. Later on, the Masters once again attempted another strike by trying to steal a weapon from Ilum, yet once again their efforts were stopped. With patience wearing thin, one of the Dreadmasters decided to take action on their own. This was Dreadmaster Styrak. Styrak went to the world of Darvanus, where he would attempt to assemble a powerful army created of advanced droids and heavy weaponry, and even the support of the Hutt Cartel, along with their mercenary guilds. When the Republic and Sith Empire gained enough intel to formulate their own counter-strike, they were able to completely dismantle Styrak's efforts, and even slay the Master himself. With the death of one, however, came a great cost. The Dreadmasters were capable of their power because they worked in unison as six. Now that one had been removed, the Dreadmasters began to sink into madness. This caused them to retaliate in a ferocious manner. Despite being killed, the Masters were able to take Styrak's spirit and bind it to his throne within the palace on Oricon. Oricon then became known to the wider galaxy as the Dreadmasters strike out at Republic and Imperial fleets. Darth Maul instructs the Sith who freed the Masters to bring about their downfall, which means the player character was sent to Oricon. Multiple strike teams were already deployed, however many soldiers and force users were unable to shield their minds from the Dreadmasters' presence on the world. Simply being on the surface was enough to send Jedi and Sith alike into madness, causing them to turn on one another and do the Masters' bidding. The Dreadmasters attempt to lure the player character into joining them, explaining that without a sixth, they are falling into madness. The Master's plan was to send ships to capital worlds throughout the galaxy, all of which had seeds of dread on board. 
which when planted would cause a world to become driven into madness and over time, depravity. Eventually, an operations group is formed and storms the Dread Fortress. Along the way, many challenges were faced including defeating mutated creatures and advanced hunter killer droids. At the end of the fortress, Dreadmaster Brontes was waiting. She alone fought the operation group as a test. Despite failing to stop them and being killed, the Masters once again were able to take Bronte's spirit and bind it to her throne within the Dread Palace, further on. Eventually, each Master faces the group in a trial of combat or some other convoluted point that the Masters wanted to prove. With Raptors being last to face them alone, the group had proved its prowess and moved on to its final challenge, like a game. The entirety of the Dread Council, including the spirit of Styrak, and Bronzes collectively attacked and defended against the Operations Group. After a gruelling battle, the Masters were defeated and their grip on madness and terror slowly lost its grasp, while the galaxy took in a deep breath of fresh air. Be sure to check out my other videos as we cover a lot of the Old Republic lore. Please consider supporting us on Patreon. May the Force be with you. Lord Scourge was born in the same era like characters such as Revan and Malak. He was a male Sith pureblood who had been trained on Dromund cars from a young age. We don't know of Scourge's parents, but he also never speaks of them so we can assume he broke those chains long ago. His birth name is also unknown and he only ever refers to himself as Scourge which is his chosen Sith name. After completing his training at the Academy and being named a Lord of the Sith, Scourge was sent to a recently conquered planet within the Outer Rim. After assisting in quelling some uprisings on the planet, Scourge was then sent back to Dromund Kars to meet with a member of the Sith Dark Council. When Scourge arrived on the Sith capital, he was escorted to Darth Nyrus, the council member he was due to speak with. Before arriving, Scourge and his escort were ambushed by mercenaries. Despite the mercenaries' hard work, Scourge was a Sith Lord and was in no mood for games. He quickly dispatches the threats and almost interrogates a name out of the enemy as to who hired them. After dealing with the threat, Scourge was escorted inside. The reason Scourge was sent to Drummond Cars was to investigate assassination attempts on Darth Nyrus. However, while speaking with Nyrus, Scourge learns that it wasn't her personally who requested his presence. It was the Emperor. You see, Darth Nyrus was making no progress on exposing whoever was behind the assassination attempts. The Emperor suggested she should bring in outside help, seeing as her own team wasn't getting the job done. A suggestion from the Emperor was basically a divine command. Scourge also learned that Nyrus herself hired the mercenaries to ambush Lord Scourge on his way here. She confessed if the mercenaries killed him then he was too weak to serve her and if he killed the mercenaries they proved to be a waste of resources. The politics of Sith didn't come easily to Scourge, in fact he hated politics but perhaps that was a weakness. After all, in the current era Sith gained rank and prestige by manipulating politics. Before the conversation with Nyrus began, Scourge was already suspecting members of her own team. Scourge realised he was still out of his depth when it came to the machinations of Sith manipulation and deceit. After the introductions, Scourge is placed on Nyrus' team to start helping with her own personal missions. You could call Scourge the paranoid type. He always questions the motives of those around him, especially those who worked under Nyrus. While on a mission with the team, new information was uncovered that finally gave a lead as to who is behind the attacks. However, Scourge had noticed that the team he was with seemed to show little regard for his life, which led Scourge to suspect them even more. While on the mission, Scourge suffered multiple injuries including broken ribs from having to defend himself against security droids, the same security droids Setchel was meant to have shut down. Setchel was the personal lackey of Nyrus, personal assistant if you will. He was Scourge's personal annoyance. Scourge knew he couldn't convince Nyrus of foul play, so he decided to just keep a close eye on Setchel and the others from now on. Darth Nyrus summoned Lord Scourge to her presence, and once he arrived, 
Nyrus lectured Lord Scourge about struggling against some security droids, but also she teaches him a new lesson. Nyrus explains to Scourge that he has a special gift. When a dark side user fights an enemy of flesh and blood, they feed off of their fear to fuel their own power and hatred. However, Scourge was able to amplify this much more than an ordinary Sith, but when Scourge fought the droid, he couldn't feed off of any fear from the droid, hence he forgot his training when facing such an opponent. Scourge didn't like being told what to do, but Nyrus had a point, so he heeded the lesson carefully and understood what it meant. Nyrus now had a new mission for Scourge and the team, including Setchel. The data that was recovered recently revealed that a rebel house on an imperial planet orchestrated the attacks on Nyrus in their efforts of freeing the people from tyranny and the Sith Empire. When Lord Scourge and the team arrived at the location, pure-blooded Sith ordered the team to stay behind while he takes out the cameras and guards. Scourge laid waste to more than 20 poorly trained soldiers who now rested in different shapes and sizes around the room. Scourge's team had disobeyed the order to wait and had gone inside to retrieve potentially important data. Scourge was furious that his orders had been disobeyed, especially by Setchel. He was ready to punish them for their insubordination when Setchel revealed that a Dark Council member had actually had a hand in the attacks. In fact, Setchel had uncovered that it was Darth Zedrix, the Dark Council's longest serving member who assisted the Rebel House. A holocall recording was found of Darth Zedric speaking of defying the Emperor and stopping his plans. A revelation like this was big news. Scourge needed to report back to Darth Nyrus. When Darth Nyrus heard the news of Darth Zedric's betrayal, she told Scourge that they would not report this to the Emperor. This made Scourge feel very uneasy. Defying the Emperor was not something anyone would recommend, but Nyrus wanted to deal with the situation quietly. She also didn't want to risk the Emperor murdering them all in an effort to save time. Seeing an opportunity to take out a rival Dark Council member was quite striking to Nyrus, but an assault on his stronghold would be too public. It would run the risk of people finding out about the feud, which could lead to the Emperor intervening. This needed to be dealt with quietly. Setchel suggested an ambush. He could duplicate the same signal used for his holo call to transmit a message for a private meeting. If Cedric took the bait, they could do to him what he was trying to do with Nyrus, assassinate him. Nyrus looks in the direction of Scourge and asks him if he's up to the task. While still being uneasy about the situation, Scourge accepted the mission. The chance to fight and kill a Dark Council member would be a great achievement for Scourge, and since Zedrix was a traitor to the Emperor, he would potentially be praised for doing it. After meticulously planning the ambush, Darth Zedrix takes the bait and arrives at the meeting location, but it was Lord Scourge that was there waiting for him. As expected, the Dark Council member had not come alone. He was escorted by two human Sith acolytes. Scourge waited by his hiding spot for the traitor to walk by. Then, he lunged out and almost killed the Dark Council member with one blow. At the very last second, Zedrix had activated his lightsaber and parried the attack. The element of surprise was over. The Dark Council member backed away and his two acolytes pressed forward towards Scourge. Both acolytes came at Scourge with a roar fury of anger. Feeling their dark side energy rise, Lord Scourge manipulates the force to feed off of the Acolyte's hatred and use it against them. While they fought well, Scourge would be the victor here. His power in the use of the seventh lightsaber form, Juya, was just too much for the Acolytes to handle. Darth Zedrix addressed Scourge, saying he knew he works in Nyrus. Scourge stated that it was his honor and duty to kill him, for betraying the will of the Emperor. Zedric attempted to convince Scourge that Nyrus was playing him for a fool, manipulating him. Then suddenly, the pure-blooded Sith realized Zedric was stalling so he could channel his own power, letting it swell inside so he could unleash a mighty arc of force lightning at Scourge, who was engulfed in lightning, feeling a searing pain he had never experienced before. This was the power of a Dark Council member. Perhaps he was wrong to come here. Darth Zedrix explained to Scourge that Nyrus had sent him here to die, that he was a message. He could never defeat a Dark Council member who was being used for a game that went way over his head. Lord Scourge 
despite the pain, was able to stand once again and face his enemy in the eye. Considering some of Scourge's own suspicions, what Zedrix had said made him stop and think for a moment. Scourge decided to probe his enemy with the Force to try and sense something underneath. He was confused by the news of Naris's potential betrayal, so he wanted to see if the council member was trying to lie. When peering underneath, Scourge sensed fear, desperation and weakness, confirming that Darth Zedrix, as powerful as he was, was actually unable to deal a lethal blow to Scourge. The burst of lightning he displayed was the only reserve of power he had. Now, he was left with nothing. He was an old man, expiring. Scourge stepped forward, telling the old man he knows he's bluffing. Zedrix extended his lightsaber to defend himself, but Scourge simply smacks it away with his own, sending the Dark Council member's weapon flying across the floor. Zedrix stumbled backwards to the floor, begging Scourge not to kill him, offering him anything he wants, even power. Scourge told Zedrix he could not give what he does not have. Scourge sliced his opponent in the chest and watched his body become limp on the ground. Darth Nyrus would want proof of his death, so Scourge knelt down, took a grasp of her, and then severed the former council member's head with his lightsaber. Lord Scourge was expected to report back to Nyrus straight after the kill, but much of what Zedric said had Scourge thinking. He was more than likely lying about Darth Nyrus, but the best lies are based on small truths. He wanted to question Setchel first, so he could determine whether or not he was being played by the Sith who rank higher than him. The pure-blooded Sith sneaks his way into Setchel's room in the middle of the night and grabs Setchel out of his bed while sleeping. The snivelling worm that Setchel was saw him screaming while Scourge loomed over him. He told him that if he cries out for help, he's dead. Now was the time for clear answers. Scourge interrogated Setchel about Nyrus. He even cut off two of his face tendrils to force him to answer quickly, as to not have time to think up a lie. After Setchel confesses that Zedrix wasn't behind the attacks, and that instead, Nyrus had orchestrated the entire thing to draw attention away from herself. Before Scourge could press for more answers, the door of the bedroom flew open. Darth Nyrus stood at the other side. He told Lord Scourge that all his questions would be answered, but if he should hurt Setchel again, she would end him. The two of them held a private conversation where Darth Nyrus explains to Scourge that she is part of a very secret cult within the Sith, who are set on bringing down the Emperor. Shocked at the revelation, Scourge didn't know how to react. He'd been played for a fool. Darth Nyrus further explained that the Emperor would soon attempt to start a war against the Republican Jedi. In this current era, Sith and Jedi have not fought each other for nearly 1,000 years. The last war was the Great Hyperspace War, which the Republican Jedi won. The Sith were pushed back to the Outer Rim. Going back for another war would just end in the same result. Besides, after their defeat at the hands of the Republic, the Sith were thought to be gone. Technically, they were all in hiding. Nyrus also told Scourge that the Emperor had long ago consumed the Force energy from hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people, and that he would likely do the same thing again. The harsh weather and climate on Drummond Cars was the result of dark side practices by the Emperor, so the notion he could do something so drastic wasn't a crazy thought. However, Scourge was loyal to the Emperor and would need more convincing. Darth Nyrus agrees to take Lord Scourge to the planet where the Emperor consumed the Force, so he could see for himself what the Emperor had in store for his allies in the future. After a short hyperspace flight, Darth Nyrus and Lord Scourge enter wild space on the Outer Rim, the sector of the galaxy that housed the Emperor's former home world, Nathema. Upon entering the system, Scourge could only sense the faintest whisper of the Force. When they both landed on the surface of the planet, Scourge saw the truth behind Nyrus's words. The world was completely barren. There was no immediate sign of life in any direction, and when trying to reach out to the Force, all Scourge could sense was the void. Not being able to feel the Force, translated into a feeling of discomfort and mental agony. The longer Scourge stood on the surface, the harsher the pain would become. Having no sense of the Force was like taking oxygen away, 
The force was meant to be everywhere, part of everything, yet here, there was nothing. The realization of the Emperor's true power level came crashing down on Scourge like a small pelka bug in the blistering rain. The running theory was, the Emperor consumed all life on this planet to fuel his own immortality. After all, he had already lived for over 1000 years, and that was just what they knew of. What Nyrus was originally explaining was now clear to Scourge. The Emperor was a madman, addicted to power. If he could do this much damage to a whole planet on his own, Scourge didn't want to think about what the Emperor might do to him if he were to be caught as a traitor. Scourge told Nyrus that he'd seen enough. After bearing witness to the Emperor's destructive powers and listening to Nyrus's long story about the Emperor's history, Scourge agrees and joins Nyrus in finding a way to stop the Emperor. Just before leaving the system, Darth Nyrus spots another ship that just dropped out of hyperspace. Nyrus scanned the ship, which didn't show up as anything she recognised. Without too much hesitation, Nyrus fired on the ship immediately with her ion cannons. The shot was a direct hit, fries the systems of the ship which results in it crashing downwards into the gravity pull of Nafima. Scourge and Nyrus follow the downed ship to where it crash landed. Scourge made his way carefully onto the ship and navigated the layout. He came across an unconscious human male in the cockpit. He had been knocked out on the crash landing. Scourge had no idea who the man was. He wore simple brown robes and had shoulder length brown hair with a black stubble on his cheeks. Then he sees the lightsaber on his hip. Lord Scourge takes the lightsaber and places it on his own belt, then he picks the man up and throws him over his shoulder, carrying him to Nyrus's ship. When he gets there, Scourge drops the man's body with no grace at all onto the floor of the ship. Before the pure-blooded Sith could tell Nyrus about the lightsaber he found, she spoke and said she knew this man. She said his name was Revan, that he is a Jedi and a Republic spy. Five years ago, Revan and another Jedi named Malak accidentally discovered Drummond cars. Before they could escape with the knowledge that the Sith Empire survives, they were executed by the Emperor. Scourge was confused as to how a Jedi executed by the Emperor could have survived or somehow escaped. Nyrus suggests that it stands to reason the Emperor allowed him to live and is possibly working with him right now. Based on this theory, they decide to take the Jedi Revan with them as a prisoner and to interrogate him on what he knows of the Emperor. Scourge was very much looking forward to his first time interrogating a Jedi. They tied Revan to a chair and drugged him with specific chemicals that wouldn't only make him feel drowsy, but also limit his capability of connecting to the Force. The drugs wouldn't cancel out any pain though. During the first session of interrogation, they only learned that the Jedi had lost a lot of his memories, so he wouldn't be much help in terms of new information, but he did share that he killed his friend Malak for reasons that are complicated. Darth Nyrus wanted answers to the important questions. How did Revan escape the dungeons and being executed? What was his relationship to the Emperor? And why was he on Nathema the same time they were there? The interrogations were not going well. As skilled as Scourge was with the art, the Jedi Revan was simply not breaking. Even though he was drugged, he could still call on the Force to help him resist the torture. Scourge knew interrogation could work, but he also knew if he pushed any harder, he risked killing the Jedi. Failed attempt after failed attempt led Scourge to tell Nyrus that Revan simply did not know the answers. His mind had been wiped somehow. Nyrus knew how. She knew that the Emperor was able to indoctrinate people, force them to be loyal, the Emperor was powerful enough to do this. It was possible that he lied about executing Revan and that he possibly enslaved Revan's mind and sent him back to the Republic as a spy of some kind. Nyrus was now mostly interested in finding out how Revan was able to free his mind of the Emperor. They could sense he was not indoctrinated. Gage warned Nyrus that it could take years to learn what happened to Revan, to study him. Yet she had patience, just like the Emperor. The fact that the Emperor did this means there was credit to the story about the Emperor wanting to attack the Republic and Jedi again. This was something that was still off the table for the Sith right now. They just wasn't in a strong enough position to fight them in a full-scale war. And the last time they fought, the Republic thought they drove us to extinction. It was imperative that their existence was kept silent so that they had time to build their strength. This all gave vindication to Scourge. He knew he was going to do the right thing and stop. 
the Emperor. Over the next few years, Lord Scourge stays within the service of Nyrus and is usually the only person to visit Revan. In fact, he became somewhat obsessed with the Jedi. However, the relationship between them had somewhat changed. They still kept Revan drugged, so he couldn't escape but it was possible to have a conversation with him at the right time, which Scourge and Revan did quite a lot over the years. Scourge never revealed his name to Revan, didn't want him to think they were friends. He was still his prisoner. Scourge couldn't help but be in awe of Revan. He could sense his power in the Force. It was strong indeed, yet Scourge still managed to obtain some information from Revan. It wasn't much, but he learned that the Jedi Order had wiped his mind, and that Revan came to Nathima, on a journey to discover his past and lost memories. What Scourge also discovered about Revan is that he was incredibly powerful. Even while drugged, he could sense his huge connection to the Force. Unlike the Sith or practical Jedi, Revan had experienced both sides of the Force, which Scourge thought made him more powerful. In some way, Scourge was no fool. He knew that if the Jedi had more warriors like Revan, then it was no wonder they lost the war against them nearly 1,000 years ago. It wasn't fear for the Jedi. It was respect. Knowing how strong your enemy was and knowing when to attack was all key to victory. Blindly attacking the Republic, Scourge's eyes, would lead to another overwhelming loss. He had to be on the side of preservation, a side that would have the Sith Empire survive. The Emperor had become a madman and needed a way to stop him. Darth Nyrus had previously suggested that they could infiltrate an elite organization within the Sith Citadel, servants or slaves that obey his every order without fail. Nyrus wants to find a way to break his hold of the Royal Guards so they could be convinced to help. Scourge didn't have much faith in that plan, but time would tell. What time told Scourge was that Nyrus was complacent in their ultimate goal. Over the last few years, she had lost interest in Revan and seemingly forgotten about stopping the Emperor. When Scourge next visited Revan, the topic of defeating the Emperor was on the lips of each. Revan attempted to suggest that they could work together to take down the Emperor as allies with a mutual enemy. Scourge thought the idea to be a tragic attempt at gaining his own freedom, but Revan had also said that it didn't matter if Scourge wasn't convinced. Soon, he would understand. Pure-blooded Sith had no patience for Revan's game. He tried to tell Scourge that the Force had shown him a vision of sorts that showed Revan his freedom. As a dark side user, Scourge did not have access to such powers, at least not in the same way Revan did. Seeing visions of the future was a more light-attuned force power. Scourge told Revan that it was said Naga Sedao had visions of the Sith winning the Great Hyperspace War, but that didn't work out now, did it? Unconvinced, Lord Scourge ended Revan's social call early and carries on with his next task. Shortly after, the lackey of Darth Nyrus, Setchel, contacted Scourge to let him know that someone was trying to contact him and arrange a meeting. Setchel couldn't offer any more details other than the person who wanted to meet him wanted to meet alone. Lord Scourge was of course very skeptical of this and questioned Setchel further, but he had nothing more to tell. Even after Scourge gave his throat a quick squeeze through the force, the pure-blooded Sith accepted the invitation for a meeting but he wouldn't be going alone. Scourge arrived first at the meeting location, brought along Nyrus's best security team, led by a human named Murtog. It didn't take long for Scourge to sense the arriving presence of his mysterious contact. The pure-blooded Sith had set up a trap inside a cave with a dead end. When the stranger advanced through the cave, Murtog's team yelled some words, and suddenly, a little astromech droid accompanying the stranger lit up the room with a bright light. Scourge could hear a lightsaber and shots being fired. When the light finally dimmed, Scourge laid eyes on a human female holding a blue, double-bladed lightsaber. She was a Jedi, but why was a Jedi here in the Sith capital homeworld? The revelation shook Scourge to the core. She must have been here to rescue Revan. That was the only thing he could think of. Was Revan telling the truth after all? Had what he said about his vision been a warning to Scourge about this Jedi coming to free him? Or maybe it was more than that. Maybe she could also help defeat the Emperor. By the time Scourge put all this together, the Jedi had dispatched Mertog on his team. They both then engaged in a heated conversation about Revan. 
Mitra confirmed that she was here to rescue him, if necessary. After explaining the situation to the Jedi, including the whereabouts of Revan and the task of defeating the Emperor, they both decided to join a temporary alliance, but she wanted proof of his commitment to the cause. Of taking down the Emperor and freeing Revan, they both agreed to a new meeting place so Scourge had time to collect the evidence. He did so by visiting Setchel, inside one of the clubs within Kars City. Zetchel wasn't expecting to find Scourge ringing his buzzer at the club's private room, but when he opened the door, Scourge charged in and grabbed the pathetic redskin by the throat. He told him, Make any sound louder than a whisper, and your life will end in unbearable agony. Scourge had to find out how long it would take Nyris to find out Mertog is dead. If Scourge was to follow through with the plan, it would mean betraying Nyra, so he had to figure out a time frame of when she would become wise to something going on. Setchel told Scourge he had about three days at best for Nyris to notice the absence of Mertog. That means Scourge had to work fast. With just three days to get a plan in motion, the stakes were high. What Scourge had really come for was incriminating files about Darth Nyrus and the other Dark Council members who planned to betray the Emperor. He knew Setchel kept a record. It was a smart move to have a collection to use as leverage one day. Scourge was right, Setchel had the files he needed, but he warned Scourge about Nyrus having his head. But that wouldn't matter because the moment Scourge had the files, he grappled the tiny pureblood and snapped his neck while suspended mid-air. Scourge left the club while Setchel's warm corpse was still twitching on the floor. After his meeting with Setchel, Lord Scourge moved on to meet the Jedi once again. The next meeting location was in a similar place. When he arrived, he showed the data he stole from Setchel to the Jedi. I have what you need. The data would prove he was in fact working to stop the Emperor, and so were many other Sith within the Empire. However, Scourge and Revan seem to be the only ones actually willing to do it so far. While the little astromech droid and the accompanied Jedi went through the data, Scourge told the Jedi they had roughly two days before the window of opportunity closes to rescue Revan, that they needed to work fast. Once Nyris found out what happened with Mertog and Setchel, she'll come looking for Scourge and it will all be over before it even begins. They're finally convincing the Jedi to essentially team up. The two decide to exchange names. The female Jedi was named Mitra. The pair begin to discuss their options of what to do next. The Jedi Mitra suggested that Scourge simply take her to Revan, then she would handle the escape. Scourge obviously found the idea amusing, considering the hundreds of acolytes and guards within Nyrus' stronghold. Scourge had suggested that they would need a distraction so they could rescue Revan while the guards are busy. The Jedi asked Scourge if he had a plan, and he responded with, I'm going to get the Emperor to help us. Scourge's plan was risky. He was going to personally request an audience with the Emperor and expose Nyrus and the other members of their secret cult. The Emperor had a strong enough will to take action against the traitors straight away, causing a great enough distraction for him and the Jedi to rescue Revan. However, that was if the plan actually worked. Convincing the Emperor of Nyrus's betrayal would be easy enough with the files he acquired from Setchel, but convincing the Emperor of his own innocence in this affair was truly the risky task. This meant Scourge had to lie in the presence of the Emperor. His life would be forfeit if he sensed any deceit at all from him. But this was the only way to get things done quickly. They needed to bust Revan out, so Scourge went ahead with the plan. Pure-blooded Sith made his way into the Emperor's citadel. He was stopped by two guards who further directed him to a royal captain inside. Scourge had requested to see the Emperor, yet this wasn't allowed, except for Dark Council members, so the captain declared he must speak with a royal advisor instead. The pure-blooded Sith expressed the urgency of the situation and demanded an audience with the Emperor. The captain warned Scourge that if he was wasting their time, he would be punished. Scourge pressed on, and the captain relented. The royal captain then escorted Scourge down the halls to the Emperor's throne room. The pure-blooded Sith made sure to take a mental note of the pathway they took, as he may need to refer to it later when they eventually make their own assault on the Emperor. Scourge entered the throne room and walked slowly down its centre pathway. For a moment, he worried that the Emperor would be able to sense the truth of his thoughts, but he reminded himself the Emperor is not all-seeing. If he had been, 
he would have already known of Nyrus' betrayal. As he walked, Scourge saw the Emperor's throne at the far end of the room. As he grew closer, the throne swiveled around to face him, and for the first time in his life, Lord Scourge laid eyes upon the Emperor. He saw an unremarkable figure clad in dark robes. The Emperor rose to his feet as Scourge arrived at the throne. He kneeled before his Emperor as he stood and said to Scourge, Rise, Lord Scourge. Scourge quickly explained to the Emperor the plot against him and exposed all of those involved, including Darth Nyrus. One of the Emperor's servants were summoned to retrieve the data disks that Scourge brought with him, and they were also going to place him into custody until the matter was dealt with. But Scourge couldn't be locked up and waiting around. He told the Emperor that if he didn't return to Nyrus, then she would grow suspicious and potentially escape. The pure-blooded Sith was playing a dangerous game. He was attempting to manipulate the Emperor, Fortunately for Scourge, this time it worked. The Emperor told Scourge he was brave to speak to him in this way and that he would reward the initiative. He declared Lord Scourge next in line for Nyrus' seat on the Dark Council, which the pure-blooded Sith gracefully thanked the Emperor and bowed before him. The Emperor then spoke and said, If your information proves false, however, you will suffer a fate more terrible than anything you can imagine. For a brief moment, as Scourge looked into the Emperor's eyes, the Emperor showed him a glimpse of his true self, touching him slightly with the Force. The sensation that hit Scourge was like a horrific agony. He fell to the floor, shaking and murmuring like a child, his mind rapidly experiencing horrors Scourge had never imagined. And then the moment ended as he regained his footing. He saw the Emperor had already returned to his throne, and the royal captain escorted Scourge to the foot of the citadel. Before leaving, Scourge confirmed with the royal captain that Nyrus and her staff would all be purged by the Imperial Guard for treason. This was going to serve as the distraction they needed. The captain added that the attack would be soon, and that Scourge should stay out of the way, but for now, return to Nyrus. The next phase of the plan was to get the Jedi Mitra inside Nyrus' stronghold to help rescue Revan when the time was right, but they pretend that she was a new slave for Scourge to get her inside. The plan in disguise was enough to get past the front guard back at Nyrus' stronghold, but the guard had told Scourge Nyrus was asking about him. This was bad news. This meant she was getting suspicious about Setchel and Murtaugh going missing when they were actually both dead. The Jedi Mitra exclaimed to just take her to Revan already, but Scourge knew that was too risky right now. As the two were talking about what to do, several loud explosions went off around the stronghold. The Emperor's guard had already mobilized and started their assault on Nyrus. They were using artillery to break down the outer walls. This was the moment they were waiting for. This was the plan. They both moved into action and headed towards Revan's prison cell. When they got to the cell, in the dungeons, they saw Revan had already somehow convinced the guards to let him out so he could help escape in the attack. Now that they were finally reunited, Revan learned Scourge's name and made a joke about not being surprised why he didn't tell him in the first place. It was a terrible name. Before leaving the dungeon, Scourge stabbed Revan with a drug that would help him wake up, so to speak. The female Jedi Mitra also gave him something. It was his mask. When Revan held it, he fell unconscious to the floor. At the same time, Darth Nyrus showed up down the hall. She saw Scourge helping Revan, and she saw the female Jedi, quickly putting together the fact it was Scourge that betrayed her. She began attacking them with a shower of purple lightning. Despite their combined efforts, the Jedi and Scourge could not overpower Darth Nyrus. She was old but that didn't stop her. Just as Nyrus was about to land a killing blow against Scourge and the others, Revan jumped into the chaos, wearing his robes and mask. He told Nyrus, I am Revan Reborn, and before me, you are nothing. Revan was able to completely redirect Nyrus's Force Lightning attack, which returned to her and completely overwhelmed her, until she was nothing more but charred ash, smoldering on the permacrete floor. Scourge rose to his feet after the battle ended. He couldn't determine if Revan looked more intimidating and powerful, now he wore a faceless mask. Perhaps that was just because he witnessed Revan, single-handedly overpowered Darth Nyrus. The reason didn't matter to Scourge, 
but he was more confident than ever that Revan would be the one to help him stop the Emperor. Scourge gave Revan his green lightsaber back, and Scourge continued to get both of them out of the stronghold. Together, the three returned to the last cave used as a meeting place. Scourge didn't immediately go inside with them though. He decided to go to Kars city instead so he could retrieve supplies also possibly find out if the Emperor stretched his military too thin. Right now it could be the best time to strike while his Imperial Guard are deployed. After learning what he could and getting the supplies they needed, he headed back to the cave. When Scourge arrived, he saw Revan and Mitra watching a hollow of it, but Revan didn't seem too keen to discuss the details around who was in the hollow of it. Scourge knew they were allies and not friends, so he pressed the matter no further. Besides, Friends were a liability to Scourge, he was a Sith Lord. He explained to the two Jedi that the Emperor had not only killed the five Dark Council members involved in the betrayal, but in fact, he had killed all 12 members of the Dark Council to send a message to the Empire. Within one day, the Emperor had assaulted three strongholds, including Darth Nyrus's, and then summoned the remaining nine for an audience at the Citadel, none of them left alive. The news went further than this though, because of the sudden loss of the Dark Council. The Empire moved into chaos with people scared for their lives. The Emperor had imposed a curfew and sanctioned armed platoons to roam their capital. The planet was effectively under martial law. No communication from Offworld and no ships were permitted to land or leave. Together, the three of them discussed various things including Revan's past, since he now somehow remembered everything since he touched the mask. Revan had confirmed that he saw inside the Emperor's mind. He saw that invading the Republic was the first step of his plan. He wanted to consume all life in the galaxy. His end goal was to eliminate everything so it couldn't threaten his power. Scourge also confirmed this when he mentioned the Emperor touched his mind too when he was in the throne room. During the discussion, it was mentioned that the Republic was currently vulnerable. This had been a few weeks ago. Scourge might have changed sides straight away if he thought the Emperor could actually win in an invasion against the Republic. But things had changed in a few weeks. Scourge knew that defeating the Emperor had to be done urging his entire Dark Council and consuming the entire Sith Armada on Nathema was sign enough of the Emperor's insane conviction. The pure-blooded Sith remained committed to the cause. The next plan of action would be to wait until the next day. While the female Jedi lay asleep and Revan was distracted watching the hollow of it again in the cave, Scourge was restless and decides to take the time to meditate. While connecting to the Force, Scourge suddenly saw Revan and Mitra laying lifeless on the floor of the Emperor's throne room. Scourge was there too, with broken and mangled limbs crawling towards the throne room door. The Emperor approaches him and covers his forehead with his hand. The pure-blooded Sith snaps back to reality, with sweat dripping from his head. At first, Scourge thought this could have been a dream or nightmare, but it was too vivid. The Force had given Scourge a vision of his own death, along with Revan. Mitra. It showed him the mission they so desperately needed to succeed end in failure. Scourge wanted to warn the Jedi about this, but he dismissed the thought of telling them something they might not believe. He struggled with what he had seen, but he knew the best way to understand it was to question Revan about the Force. Scourge asked Revan about the vision he had while in Nyrus's dungeons. Revan actually confessed he was bluffing and trying to somehow manipulate Scourge into believing they would work together. Despite that, Scourge learned from Revan that visions are intense and usually the details don't fade. This basically confirmed for Scourge that what he saw really was a vision. But Revan had also told him that the Force only shows you one of many possible futures. They come to you to help guide you toward the right path. Scourge took from this lesson that the vision he saw was not absolute. The next day, the three leave the cave together to embark on their ultimate goal defeat the Emperor. They could not use a speeder to directly approach the Citadel, so they had to make their way partly on foot, which was no problem since the streets were mostly empty due to curfew. When they arrive at the entrance to the Emperor's Citadel, the door bursts open and the Royal Guard surrounds the trio. Scourge quickly took action and told the guards, My name is Lord Scourge, and I demand a meeting with the Emperor. 
After convincing the guards he needed an audience with the Emperor, they partly agreed and escorted them to the throne room entrance where the royal captain would decide if they could really enter. Unfortunately, the trio had run out of luck. A smooth entrance was about to become a messy one. The royal captain recognises Revan from his previous visits to Drummond Cars and immediately connects the dots as to what is happening. With their cover blown, Revan began to fight by kicking one of the guards clear of the throne room entrance. All three assault the royal guards together, which of course were formidable and are not killed so easily. After killing a few of the guards, the trio back up into the throne room and slam the door shut. The Emperor watched them as they fight with the remaining few guards that followed them in. Scourge was fighting with the royal captain, who had managed to land a blow to Scourge's right shoulder with an Electra staff, forcing the pure-blooded Sith to use his left hand for the duration. Scourge was distracted in the moment by the vision he had of them all lying within death's reach in the throne room. He came to his senses and knocked the captain to her back. When she crawled over to her weapon, Scourge met her there and slammed his boot down onto her hand. He drinks in the fear of his victim and then decapitates her. Mitra had called to Scourge that they needed to help Revan, who had already charged the Emperor. Scourge could see the Emperor stood over Revan as he was about to swipe at him and end his life. Mitra intervened by hailing her lightsaber at the Emperor's weapon. The pure-blooded Sith realised that if she aimed for the Emperor rather than his saber, she could have landed a killing blow as he was caught completely off guard. Regardless, Scourge pressed forward and together the three of them stood before and to oppose the Emperor. I expected better from you, Lord Scourge. Right now, Scourge knew he was part of a pivotal moment in time. The next few moments would sway events in the galaxy for centuries. When suddenly the Force washed over Scourge, and the universe stopped moving, the Force rushed through his mind and showed him millions of possible futures. Futures where they win in the throne room and futures where they lose. Then Scourge snaps out of it, lost and confused in the moment. Scourge sees Revan and Mitra moving to engage the Emperor. He had to decide quickly on his next move. Then once again, the Force glazes his mind, showing him a powerful Jedi in the future that wasn't Revan or Mitra. The powerful Jedi was stood over the Emperor's lifeless body, and Scourge knew what he had to do. As time began to move normally again, he places his saber behind the female Jedi Mitra and ignites the blade. Mitra was dead instantly. A quick, clean death was the most mercy he could offer the Jedi right now. The Emperor seized the moment and attacked Revan with a storm of lightning. Lord Scourge kneeled before the Emperor as he said, Explain yourself. Scourge desperately attempted to convince the Emperor that the Jedi was working with Darth Nyrus and that he had to infiltrate their duo so he could bring them before the Emperor to face justice. In reality, Scourge had seen a new vision, one that would guide him down the path to the Emperor's destruction. If he was to convince the Emperor what he says is true, the Emperor suggested to Scourge that he perform the killing blow against Revan. The pure-blooded Sith approached Revan's unconscious body. He rips away his mask and sees the burnt and scarred skin underneath. He then raises his lightsaber and brings it down for the finishing blow. However, Scourge's blade was stopped by the power of the Emperor. The fact he was about to do it was enough vindication for the Emperor. He also had other plans for Revan over the next few centuries. He was placed into a prison that even Scourge didn't know was located. In fact, the whole charade was enough to force the Emperor into reconsidering his invasion of the Republic, which was a small victory Scourge was willing to accept for now, seeing as Scourge had convinced the Emperor of his innocence. As a reward, so to speak, the Emperor brought Scourge into his personal research facility, where he would perform a dark side ritual to grant Lord Scourge immortality. This was Scourge's reward for being loyal to the Emperor, which was actually the complete opposite of what he really was. The mighty Emperor bestowed upon Scourge the position of the Emperor's Wrath, a role and title that would carry the full weight of the Emperor's might. He would be sent to destroy those who would dare oppose the Emperor's designs. The immortality granted to Lord Scourge came with a heavy price. After the ritual was complete, he could feel his insides set ablaze. He couldn't help but weep in agony. Scourge looked at the Emperor and asked him when the pain would stop. 
As time passes, you will learn to accept and endure your suffering. He cried out only a question. Why? The Emperor told the pure-blooded Sith that everything has a cost, and this is the price of immortality. Lord Scourge would spend the next 300 years learning the strengths and weaknesses of the Emperor, all while awaiting his prophesied champion to make an appearance. In this time, Scourge had also become much more powerful and more wise, but still retained his threatening demeanour. His actual existence became a legend over the years, as his and the Emperor's appearances were not often. Scourge was mostly sent to discreetly handle specific tasks set out by the Emperor. Only Lord Scourge and a few others even had access to the Emperor's fortress, which would be heavily guarded and usually move around within Imperial space. The Dark Council of the current era had no direct contact with Scourge, in fact, even they were not sure of his existence. The most recent task set before Scourge was to eliminate a Dark Council traitor on Quesh. However, when he arrived, he unexpectedly ran into the Jedi he so long ago saw a vision of defeating the Emperor. Convinced immediately that the time was drawing near to the Emperor's demise, Scourge departed the planet Quesh and made his master, the Emperor, aware of the new powerful Jedi's presence. While committed to the cause of defeating the Emperor, Scourge had to be careful and update the Emperor in small doses about this new threat. This would secure Scourge's position next to the Emperor no matter what, which was key to getting the new Jedi where they needed to be in the future. Eventually, the new Jedi hero proved their worth when they assaulted the Emperor's personal fortress along with a few Jedi Masters. However, the assault ended in failure and the Jedi were killed or mind dominated. The new Jedi hero was one of the few who were turned to the dark side. After a week or so of indoctrination, the Jedi managed to break free from the Emperor's control and fight their way to freedom. Before escaping the fortress, Scourge confronted the Jedi and explained the entire story to them about defeating the Emperor. He then pledged his alliance to them and asked to visit their Jedi Council so he could give them an information on how to defeat Darth Vishu. Scourge explained to the current Jedi Council that the Emperor had dominated the minds of some Jedi Masters that were part of the previous strike team. He would use them against the Republic in the current war that was raging on. While the Jedi hero went on missions to free the Jedi and aid the Republic in war, Lord Scourge was making preparations for the Jedi to be able to face the Emperor. When the time was right, he would personally escort them there. Once the Jedi hero was ready, they met with Lord Scourge on the planet Drummond Cars. Scourge had arranged safe passage for them and coordinates to a safe landing area. Currently, the Emperor resided in his dark throne room, which was different to the one from many years ago. The Jedi hero and Scourge battled their way to the Emperor. However, Scourge was separated from the group and the Jedi had to go on alone to face the Emperor. The next communication Scourge received was the Emperor had been defeated and that he was dead. However, Scourge could sense that he wasn't truly gone. Scourge had a bond with the Emperor, and he did not feel that bond break. The Emperor still lived, but how and where was a mystery. For a time, the galaxy would know peace from the Emperor's reign, as whispers and rumours make their way around that he was killed by a Jedi. Lord Scourge would often reflect on his past, thoughts of things he can no longer enjoy in life. The cost immortality demanded caused searing pain within Scourge, but he became numb to that a long time ago. Now he has no taste, no smell, and he even suggests he could be colorblind, all of which added to the final cost. A few years later, the Emperor returned in glorious fashion under the guise of Valkorion. However, Lord Scourge and the Jedi Kira Carson went missing after their appearance into the galaxy. What actually happened to them was that they tried to help from behind the scenes. They spent their time opposing the Emperor's ultimate true goal. Scourge knew that he had more backups in place. Contingency plan, if you will. While the Jedi hero defeated Valkorion and his relentless children, Scourge and Kira were able to find the original body of Tenebra. That was the Emperor's true name. Lord Scourge and Kira together were able to locate this body by following the guidance of Revan who had materialised in this realm as a force ghost, as he had unfinished business to complete. When they found Tenebrae's body, the location of which wasn't revealed, together, 
they destroyed it to assure the emperor would never regain consciousness in that form. However, the body had a ritual inscribed on the flesh, and when destroyed, it activated, sending out force waves to dominate the minds of others around. Scourge and Kira were actually immune to such techniques due to previous encounters with the power. However, the Grand Master Satil Shan and some of her Jedi followers had joined Scourge and Kira to assist them, but they lacked the proper training to resist the Emperor's mind domination that burst out of his destroyed corpse. All of the Jedi fell victim to the inscribed ritual. Tenebrae's original consciousness began to regain itself, using the Jedi's minds as vessels. Slowly, he attempted to take them over until he could once again roam the galaxy. The Jedi hero, Revan, Mitra, Lord Scourge, and many others all joined forces against Tenebrae this time. Lord Scourge and the others defeat Tenebrae, once and for all. Lord Scourge had achieved his ultimate goal of defeating the Emperor and preserving not only the Sith Empire, but the whole galaxy. Across his entire journey, Scourge didn't once betray his dark side origin, who was a Sith at heart, and a Sith in spirit, but he didn't let that stop him from growing as a person in a big universe. He battled alongside many, and also against many. Last we heard, Scourge still travels as a companion with the Jedi hero, awaiting his next great mission, or possibly just enjoying the only kind of peace he will ever tolerate. Peace from the Emperor. Thank you very much for listening to my Lord Scourge Explained video. This one took a really long time to put together, so I would appreciate if you would consider subscribing and liking the video. Let me know what you want to see next. Peace.